Hey, Corey. Almost here? Check, 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 check. Yeah. Are we good with the Larry's gonna be back next
I have 105 and I'm calling this meeting to order. Um, I'm going to invite Mr. Trey Affel to come and call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Augusto. Present. Mr. Alexander has an excused absence. Mr. Allison. Present. Mr. Almanzan. Mr. Baruch. Present. Ms. Bem. Present. Ms. Brooker. Here. Mr. Cavillo. He is on his way. Mr. Carlos Cardenas. Present. Mr. Luis Cardenas. Present. Mr. Cook. Here. Ms. Cordova. Present. Mr. Crane on is on his way. Ms. Davis. Mr. Dawson, Present. Ms. Hernandez Ferrier, Ms. Barunda Firth, Present. Mr. Fisher, Here. Mr. Flores has an excused absence, Ms. Forbes, Here. Mr. Ginn, Here. Ms. Goldsberry, Here. Mr. Gravely, Present. Mr. Harris, Here. Ms. Harrison, Here. Judge Hatch, Here. Ms. Hoggard has an excused absence, Ms. Humphrey, Here. Mr. Hurst, Mr. Kolodowski, Justice Learman, Ms. Cortez Matas, Mr. McDougal, here. Ms. Cara Miller, here. Ms. Emily Miller, here. Judge Morales, here. Ms. Mount, here. Ms. Murphy, here. Mr. Naylor, here. Ms. Rispoli, here. Ms. Rowe has an excused absence, Mr. Schrammick, here. Ms. Scott, Mr. Sergi, Here. Mr. Sims, Here. Mr. Jason Smith, Here. Mr. Michael Smith, Here. Mr. Todd Smith, Here. Mr. Sorrells, Here. Ms. St. Ives, Here. Mr. Tolchin, Here. Mr. Vargas, Here. Mr. Vasquez, Here. Ms. Welburn, Here. Mr. Wester, Here. Ms. Pack Wilson, Here. Judge Yeary has an excused absence. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. I would ask my friend, uh, Director Catherine Murphy, to please come and lead us in our invocation. While she's coming up here, it sure is good to see everybody. Thank you all for being here. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together today to do the business of the State Bar of Texas. We are grateful to be together again in good health after this extended time apart. We invite you to preside over this meeting. We pray for your wisdom, strength, and guidance in the decisions that we make today. We ask that you show us how to conduct our work with a spirit of joy and enthusiasm. We pray we are all patient and courteous in our discussions. We pray for the ability to do our work professionally and listen politely and respectfully to one another, even though we may have a different viewpoint. We pray that we work together on our shared mission of the State Bar of Texas and making the State Bar the best it can be. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to do this important work today, and please help us appreciate the honor it is to serve our members. We pray that we conduct ourselves in a way that glorifies you. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Catherine. Now I'd ask my friend, Director Christina Davis, to please come and lead us in the pledges. Whichever one you want. I think that's a good one. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I pledge to the flag, I allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Christina. Uh, we would like to welcome any members of the public who are present. Any member of the public who wishes to speak should sign the blue sign-in card that's located near the entrance. If there's a specific discussion or topic item on the agenda that you want to speak on, please list that on the card. I know we have one member. We might have more. Do we have any members of the public that want to speak? Is there anyone here other than Rudy that wants to speak? 
All right. Rudy, do you want the microphone? You can come up here and use it on, on one of these guys if you'd like. <laughs> Rudy, you've got three minutes. I don't see Ray with the cards, so Ray, do you have cards today? It's okay if you don't. Okay. Rudy, give it your best estimate of three minutes. <laughs> I'm going to look at my watch. If at some point you feel a pin hitting you, that's me telling me your time's up. Floor's yours. I was waiting for you to get the cane or something like that organized from that. But, um, and we used to have this in the back, so it's much easier than you know, just the same thing in church. Honestly, I came here to say thank you to each and every one of you. I know that it's been a rough year for a variety of different purposes and concerns for all of us, but each and every one of you have persevered. It's made a discernible difference and people like myself's lives to see the impact that you're making, the conversations that you're having, the debate that you're doing, respectively of one another, on issues that effectuate not just the bar, not just the state, but this country. You know, I'll be frank. You know, one of the things that we often talk about when we're directors is, okay, what do we actually do? And how do we think about doing something that actually does make a big impact? Are we making a difference? And I'm saying each and every one of you no matter a variety of different viewpoints, are making a difference because you're having a conversation, a conversation that's needed to have for a long, long time now. Many of you have heard the story that I told about what my parents told me many years ago in 1989, that not since all in the family with Archie Bunker has this country actually had a conversation, a serious conversation about race and issues, concerns that go down, gender equality, issues that actually effectuate us in a manner. It's because too often or not, we judge each other on what we're saying as opposed to truly listening to one another. We all have different stories. We all have different viewpoints. We all have our own truths. And it's in those truths, in those viewpoints, the notions that we bring together, that's what we need to respect with one another. That's what we need to understand. That's where we need to meet each other on these discussions. I was quite proud and thank the governor today for setting that commission on anti-Semitism. And looking at these issues and trying to see how we can actually, as a state, go ahead and effectuate change and attack those things. Because to be frank, I've been on the board for the Anti-Defamation League for the last five years, and I have many people, particularly people of color, who give me a little cross eye and they're saying, so why are you there? And what does that have to do with you? Are you Jewish? Do you have anyone in your family Jewish? Whatsoever. And my same conversation is the same thing I'm having with you guys. What affects the Jewish community affects all communities. And if we don't understand and try to stand up for the various communities and issues that come up, then what are we doing? By definition, as lawyers, we're leaders in our communities. By definition, you being on this August board is a leader of this state. So what you say and what you do makes a difference, has a ripple effect in the many, many lives of people behind you. We recently did some scholarship interviews for various students who are coming up from us behind us. These students are coming into college this year, and what was very interesting about these discussions was hearing from the students how they perceive these things that are going on in this country, how the murder of George Floyd effectuated things. What do they believe regarding Black Lives Matter? What do they think about all these different issues? And so, make no mistake, the people who are coming behind us have a viewpoint have ideas and have concerns that they want to address. And they're much more about change and equality and the things that, honestly, I feel like in a lot of ways, people like myself have failed to go ahead and effectuate better with that. So thank you for what you're having the discussion. Thank you for what you're doing. When we're talking about DEI, we're talking about these things, it's going to make a big difference. And I just want to continue and thank you guys for having that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. For those that don't know, Rudy has served on this board before, and so I know he knows the, the hard work that you've done this year. And Rudy, we appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with us today. Are there any other members of the public that are here that have escaped my attention that I've missed? Anybody at all? All right, I'm not seeing any hands or indication otherwise. Um, so we're going to move to the report from chair of the board. We're going to start with the consent agenda. Uh, we need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? All right, Director Michael Hirsch has got our motion. Do I have a second? All right, Director Wendy Adele Humphrey is our second. 
All those in favor to uh, pass our consent agenda, please respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. With that, I'll recognize President Larry McDougall for the presentation of resolutions. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Who's on that? Oh, uh, actually, Jim's got Jim's it. Jim's got it. All right. So, yeah, you're right out there. Like I can squeeze through that. <laughs> been kind of busy as a board or as the bar with resolutions here lately and on June 1st I was invited to Galveston County Bar Association to present a resolution on behalf of the board and this resolution recognized the 175th anniversary of the federal district of federal courts in Texas in December 1940, 1845 Congress created a US district court for the district of Texas in Galveston and the first federal court for our new state this court was called to order on June 1st, 1846, with John, uh, John Charles Waltrus presiding. The resolution states, if you'll bear with me while I read it, Judge Waltrus, by then the judge of Eastern District of Texas, and Judge Thomas Howard Duvall, judge of the Western District of Texas, were the only two federal judges in Texas when it succeeded from the Union in 1861. These Texas judges were also the only two federal judges of any Confederate state to remain loyal to the Union and return to their post after the Civil War. Today, Texas is one of only two states to be served by four federal judicial districts, and our state is one of the largest and most respected judicial, federal judiciaries in the country. We are happy to celebrate this milestone. I had the pleasure of presenting this resolution to the Galveston County Bar Association. They had a pretty good turnout. This was one of the first basically live meetings that we've had uh, without everybody really social distancing. And they were very appreciative of our resolution and very appreciative that we took the time to come honor their city and the federal courts. Next, I want to honor two Texas legal legends, both former presidents of the state bar who recently passed away. The first one is Lloyd Lockridge, who passed away at the age of 103 on April 13th. I had the pleasure of meeting Judge Lockridge back when I was campaigning and found that even though at that time he was 100 or 101, he was still sharp as a tack. And uh, he was a real pleasure to sit down and visit with. Mr. Lockridge served as our state bar president from 74 to 75, during which time the Texas Law Center was financed and built. The client security fund was adopted and the bar implemented a statewide program of law-focused education in the public schools, which we still have those today. Mr. Lockridge, Lockridge, one of the things that I really enjoyed talking to him about was he was a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy during World War II. And he retired from the Navy as a full commander and started practicing law in Mission, Texas in 1945 to 1959, before moving to Austin where he became a partner in McGinnis Lockridge in that firm. He stayed with the firm for the rest of his career, becoming a leader and a mentor to countless attorneys. During his past Past his 100th birthday, he was still in the office most days, remaining active, promoting the ethical practice of law, pro bono work, and volunteer leadership. And that's where I actually ran across him, got to sit down and visit with him in his office for quite a while one day. In his addition to his service to the state bar, he was past president of the Hidalgo County Bar Association, past president of the Travis County Bar, and a member and delegate of the American Bar Association, among many other leadership roles. He received many honors over his lengthy career, including being inducted as a Texas legal legend by the State Bar of Texas litigation section. It is our distinct honor as the State Bar of Texas to recognize the life and legacy of Lloyd Lockridge. In accepting the resolutions will be his daughter, Hope Lockridge, and granddaughter, Molly Powers. On behalf of the State Bar. Put it for the baby. Hi there. There you go. Thank you. If I could just take a, a moment for a point of personal privilege. So Hope was the State Bar's first director of law related education and she hired our current Jan Miller. And Molly now is our uh, CAP Client Attorney Assistance Program Director. She hired on, I guess, a couple of years ago. 
course, when she did, you would have thought she would have said something about being a relative of Lloyd Lockridge, right? She didn't. And I didn't even know that until a, a few short weeks ago. Uh, and, Molly, and, and as I understand it, the discussion between Hope and Molly was, well, did you say anything about it? And Molly said, no, I did not want that to influence the decision. Well, she, it would have been wonderful to know, but Molly didn't need Lloyd's help. She has been a wonderful uh, employee. She has uh, been helping the public and the lawyers of Texas for several years, and we're proud to have her. Congratulations. Thank you. I know she looks familiar. <laughs> the next one's going to be past president Brodus Spivey. This resolution honors Brodus, who passed away at the age of 84 on May 8th. Mr. Spivey served as state bar president in 2001 to 2002, during which he established his three priorities. One, completing a middle school student mediation project, improving the state bar's website, and assisting in the implementation of the newly created Texas Access to Justice Commission. He's a former president of Texas Trial Lawyers Association, Capital Area Trial Lawyers Association, International Academy of Trial Lawyers, and served on the American Association of Trial Lawyers Board of Governors and the Trial Lawyers for Public Justice Board of Directors. Brodus was a member of numerous legal organizations, including a Life Fellow of the Texas Bar Foundation, a Fellow of the International Society of Barristers, and the American College of Trial Lawyers. He received many honors over his lengthy career, including a State Bar of Texas Presidents Award, a trial, Texas Trial Lawyers Association Lifetime Achievement Award, American Bar Association Pursuit of Justice Award, and induction, induction as a Texas legal legend by the State Bar Litigation Section. It is our distinct honor to recognize the life and leg legacy of Broda Spivey. Here to accept the resolution are his wife, Ruth Ann, and daughter, Marcy. Thank you to everyone. Broadus would be very honored to be in the company of Lloyd Lockridge. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the families of Mr. Spivey and Lockridge. Um, they were Texas legends, and we've all benefited by their practice and by their example. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's time, I guess, from the report from the board, and let me get my notes here. I had some things I wanted to say, and I promise I'll be as brief as I can, but I wanted to say thank you. And I'm not an emotional person usually, but if I get that way now, I want you all to bear with me. We had a, a difficult year, and it was a good year, and when you stepped down into the lunch earlier today, there was an energy there. There was an energy of family, and it felt that way to me because of you all every director, every officer in this room. I've heard it said that this meeting today is about awards and patting each other on the back, and we're gonna give some awards and we're gonna say thank you, but it's an illustration though too of the work that you have done all year long. Those work, that, those work, the work that you have done didn't happen at four or five or six board meetings. It happened in the days and the weeks, in the committee meetings, in the phone calls, and in the relationships that you built. To our incoming directors, what I would tell you is, is, is this is every bit important as your practice. It's protecting our practice. And this year's board bought into that, and they bought into it when we couldn't meet in person. They didn't have the benefit of breaking bread together, but they, they focused on each other and they focused on the work, and for that I honor you, and I thank you. It mattered. It matters very much. Um, to the third year directors, this is the first and only time we're gonna get to meet this year. Some of you were saying hello and goodbye. Uh, do I have any Hamilton fans out there? I feel like Christina Davis might be a Hamilton fan. You know, they, they talk about, you know, teach them how to say goodbye. I don't, I don't wanna say goodbye um, to you all. It's been a wonderful three years. Um, 
I wish I could honor every single one of you with a plaque. Um, you all were warriors, and I, I just thank you so much. With that, though, before I talk about the rest of the third years and the rest of our first and second years from this past year, I want to hand out a couple of awards and acknowledge a few people, if that's all right. Uh, the first is the presentation of the Outstanding Third Year Director Award. This year there's two. Uh, one of these directors has been invaluable in her role as chair of the Legislative Committee, as the section rep, as the member of the Executive Committee. Her expertise and guidance this year during this legislative year was so crucial. The other director served as chair of the Disciplinary Committee during the referendum. The DCAP Committee has worked on important issues, including the Rules Vote Amendment. He served with excellent and numerous other capacities this year, including a member of the Executive Committee and the Client Security Fund Subcommittee. I would invite directors Emily Miller and Steve Naylor to please join me at the podium. got two more uh, quick awards I want to hand out. The next is the presentation of the Public Member Award. Board policy states that from time to time the chair may make special awards to public members for outstanding service. This public member provided sound leadership as the board worked through a lot of important issues this year. He could always be counted on to give wise counsel. Let me say that again because if I were to think of one word about this man it would be this, wise counsel. He drew that from his rich well of management and local government practice. As a director and as the board advisor to the African American Lawyer Section, this director was instrumental in the board's efforts to advance diversity and inclusion this year. Additionally, this director served ably as chair of the Affordable Legal Services Subcommittee, vice chair of the Policy Manual Committee, and a member of the Budget and Finance Committee. Director Alan Sims, we are so grateful to you. There is one more award that I want to mention um, before I wrap up my comments. Um, this award has been given five times um, since its uh, start. It, um, it is the Michael J. Crowley Award. It recognizes meritorious service by a current member of the State Bar of Texas Board of Directors who exemplifies selfless dedication of time and talent to the legal profession. The award is named in honor of the late Michael Crowley an Austin lawyer and the chair of the State Bar of Texas Board of Directors in 1994 and 1995 who led a distinguished professional life. The board policy specifies that the Crowley Award should not be given in just any year. Only in a year that meritorious service of a board of director is extraordinary and benefits more than a specific segment of the legal community or public. This is only the fifth time the Crowley Award has been granted since its creation in 2002. This director has provided outstanding leadership on numerous fronts, including chair of the Litigation and Contracts Subcommittee, chair of the Client Security Fund Subcommittee, member of the Executive Committee and Legislative Policy Subcommittee, alternate advisor to the African American Lawyers Section, and advisor to the Diversity and the Profession Committee. Rob Crane, would you please join me? <laughs>
when I started my service to you, I promised that we would build relationships, and I hope that we have. Um, I feel that we have. Um, our third-year directors, I don't, I don't know, and I'm sure that everybody feels this way about their class, I don't know that we have a finer group of directors. Um, thank you for your friendship over the last three years. Um, if you are a third-year director or a section rep or this is your third year on the board, I'd ask you to please stand and be honored, if that's all right. With that, I'll wrap up, except just to say that I know this has been a trying year and I appreciate your friendship. I would encourage you all, especially those that are remaining on the board, to continue to pour into each other, to continue to build the relationships and continue to serve because that's, that's what made this year, in my opinion, successful. We're going to hear reports. We're going to have disagreements the rest of the day, just like we have all year, and that's okay. We're going to do this because our hearts are here to serve the board and the bar and the state and the public. Um, I know that to be true because that's what you've done all year. Um, I want to thank our staff. Our staff is the greatest staff in the world. It starts with our executive director, Trey Apfel, John Sermon, Kay Lynn, Ray, Shauna, Susan, Amy, Craig, Paul, Lowell, and last but certainly not least, Jennifer. They have created a year for us that we have, were allowed to continue to meet when otherwise there were obstacles to do that. They have run this state bar in such a way that is to be commended, and we, we need to show them how much we appreciate them. So if you'd give them one round of applause, I would just be so appreciative. <laughs> Finally, uh, Victor Flores is not here. Jerry Alexander is not here. Um, we're going to miss them. We do miss them. I can't think of two people that probably deserve to be here more than Victor and Jerry. Uh, you know, I don't know that I know two more cheerful people. Um, we're going to miss them. Uh, Miss Laura Gibson was the chair when I started. She's here. She's our new president-elect, uh, and I'm excited to serve and see her leadership. Laura, thank you for your service. Uh, Randy, thank you for your leadership over the last three years. Um, you have been steady and consistent and someone that we count on and we appreciate and honor you. Sylvia, we are so excited for your year. We know your leadership is gonna be wonderful and we can't wait. Larry, you keep showing up and I think that's incredible. You have been a great leader. Your task forces have done great work this year. We're gonna hear those reports. You have, you have done what you said you would do and I wanna thank you for that. Thank you for your presidency this year. Thank you for the time. With that, um, I think, let's see, go back to my script here. With that, I'll turn it over to our executive director, Mr. Trey Apple. Good afternoon again. And wow, what a difference a year makes, right? Uh, this time last year, uh, we were just a few months into a shutdown <clears throat> and uh, preparing for a summer upswing in COVID-19 cases. Uh, this year, millions of Americans uh, have been vaccinated, restrictions are loosening, and the future is looking much brighter, and the masks are coming off. Uh, I'm proud to report that the State Bar of Texas remained fully functional and operational during uh, the last several months that the country was shut down. Uh, we're grateful to the Supreme Court, particularly our liaison, Justice Deborah Learman. She was a constant uh, source and resource of uh, confidence and support and she was always there and she was just that 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 person that uh, I could call when we needed to in order to uh, cover the business of the day so to speak we also want to thank our court of criminal appeals liaison uh, judge Kevin Urey who was not able to make it today uh, as well as the Office of Court Administration for their superb leadership and assistance. The Supreme Court has issued 38 emergency orders, providing instructions on everything from in-person and virtual court hearings to eviction rights and responsibilities to document service and a host of other issues facing lawyers. While 2020 
and 2021 came with incredible challenges. The State Bar not only met them head on, but also continued to innovate and expand services for Texas lawyers in line with the Bar's statutory purposes. Some examples. In light of the pandemic's financial impacts, the membership department worked with the Supreme Court to give lawyers two extra months to pay their dues, while the MCLE department continues to extend deadlines to help lawyers comply with MCLE requirements. All departments, programs, and committees turn their in-person events virtual. Texas Bar CLE increased its free offerings, providing $5 million worth of CLE to Texas lawyers and offered an additional $150,000 in scholarships to Texas lawyers. The Texas Lawyers Assistance Program continued its around the clock, I'll say that again, around the clock, assistance to Texas lawyers, judges, and law students, struggling with increased stress and anxiety due to the pandemic. TLAP developed monthly webinars on crucial well-being topics, amassed an online toolbox of resources, and created a one-hour free CLE to educate Texas lawyers on depression and suicide. The Committee on Disciplinary Rules and Referenda aided by bar staff, successfully brought eight potential rule proposals to Texas lawyers for a membership vote. Texas lawyers overwhelmingly approved those proposals and the Supreme Court issued an order adopting the amendments effective July 1. The Law Practice Resources Division launched a new website, texasbarpractice.com as an umbrella platform where lawyers can find all of the bar's law practice resources, such as Texas Bar Books and Law Practice Management Program. TOGI, or our Texas Opportunity and Justice Incubator, transitioned to an entirely virtual format ahead of the pandemic, which allowed it to expand their program and cut costs. Finally, the State Bar created a fiscally responsible, balanced 2021-2022 budget that accounts for the pandemic's financial challenges. The Bar is in excellent financial health and well positioned to continue serving Texas lawyers and the public into the new year. I'd like to convey a special thanks and appreciation to the Austin law firm of Graves, Doherty, Heron, and Moody and specifically Bill Locke and his colleagues, Natasha Martin, Helen Curry Foster, Karen T. Barker, for their generous pro bono assistance with the purchase of the building and property at 1415 Lavaca next to the Texas Law Center. We couldn't have done it without them. President McDougal will talk about the purchase of that property in a moment when he gives his report. Remember that the 2021 annual meeting uh, is virtual and it is taking place Thursday and Friday of this week. On Thursday, we are offering a full day of online CLE up to 10 hours for the low cost of $185. On Friday, we will swear in new presidents of the state bar and TYLA and announce some special awards. The Friday program is free, but separate registration is required, so please take note of that. And if you haven't registered for both days yet, uh, please do that today. As a reminder, uh, the ethics filing deadline is coming up. Voting members of the board should have received a notice uh, from the Ethics Commission that the personal financial statement filing deadline was extended from April 30 to June 30. This deadline was extended at the same time the IRS text tax deadline was moved. Again, this affects all voting members of the board. Kaylin said to tell you, yes, that includes you third year directors who will be going off the board in June. <clears throat> A word about Dr. Ferrier. On April 26, the Texas Senate held a confirmation hearing and they summoned Dr. Ferrier to the committee and she blew them away. She formalized her appointment as a public member on this board. Dr. Ferrier is the founding president 
and President Emerita of Texas A&M University, San Antonio. She did a tremendous job at the hearing discussing her commitment to advance the bar's work on issues including civics education and access to justice. She also spoke eloquently about her love of the legal system and the rule of law. She has an impressive resume and the senators were clearly very impressed with her qualifications. Another one of our public members, Michael Vasquez, was also confirmed this session, finally, but he did not have to appear. The other public members were confirmed in previous sessions, August Harris longer ago than most. <laughs> we are fortunate to have these six public members on our board and we are grateful for the perspectives that they provide us. And now <clears throat> I'll wrap up by uh, recognizing one of our uh, State Bar staff. Norma, would you make your way up this way while I'm bragging on you? Uh, it's my pleasure to present the Quarterly Staff Excellence Award to Norma Galindo Day of the Lawyer Referral and Information Service. When LRIS began its renewal season in October, Renewals were done on a regular weekly admin rotation. Because online payment processing is a multi-day process that can cross over from one week to another, Norma saw an opportunity to improve the rotation process. She volunteered to take on all online renewals. This made her the point person for the director and simplified operations for their team. This, is, this will now be a yearly or monthly rotation by year going forward, or at the very least by month during the renewal season. Norma also devised new systems for getting payment information to the accounting department and receiving approvals from that department. Her processes for researching and tracking payments may, may have helped her coworkers tremendously. Through her creative thinking and willingness to take on challenges, Norma has come up with permanent, viable solutions for her department and for the Texas lawyers. Norma, congratulations and thank you for your exceptional work. Mr. Chair, that completes my report. Oh dear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. Well, you know, it doesn't sit flat, Larry. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Tom Leatherberry. Tom is our outside counsel in McDonald versus Sorrells and Law HQ versus Willing. We are privileged to have him today and grateful for his firm's. Um, expert counsel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie, and good afternoon, everybody. So I have two cases to report on. Uh, the first, McDonald versus Sorrells. Um, that's the challenge to the mandatory state bar here in Texas. It was filed back in the spring of 2019. And uh, on, in May of 2020, Judge Yackel gave, gave us summary judgment, granted our motion for summary judgment, rejecting the plaintiff's three claims. <clears throat> the first claim was freedom of association, the second claim based on freedom of speech, the third claim was a procedural claim challenging the state bar protest procedures, dues protest procedures. So we went up to the Fifth Circuit on a very fast basis um, expedited basis. The reason for that is that the Louisiana bar is also being challenged. They have a mandatory bar, a little bit different in structure than ours, but the court wanted to hear those cases together. So they were fully briefed and we sat and we waited because the court wanted to hear argument in person. And so in March uh, of this year, we argued the case in the in-bank courtroom before the panel of uh, Judge Smith, Judge Duncan and Judge Willett. 
Uh, we're still waiting, waiting for our opinion. And uh, there, the other thing I would say is there are a lot of these challenges around the country based on uh, a Supreme Court case a couple of years ago called Janus. So let me just fill you in on, on where those other challenges stand. In the last 15 months, the court denied cert in two of them. One was in the Fleck case from, from North Dakota, and the second case was called the Jarchow case from Wisconsin. Uh, in the Jarchow case, two justices dissented from the denial of cert. That was Justice Gorsuch and Justice Thomas, and they, they called for the court to re-examine the principles of Keller versus California State Bar uh, in light of the Janus case. Uh, but they did not attract any other, any other justices to their view, or at least their published view. <clears throat> One week before our argument, the Ninth Circuit decided the Crow case uh, uh, about the Oregon Bar. Uh, and uh, in the first time, uh, a court reversed a dismissal uh, that a state bar had gotten. Uh, the Ninth Circuit uh, reversed the, uh, the dismissal on the association claim, not on the speech claim and not on the procedures claim against the Oregon Bar, but basically the court said that, uh, and it was a 12B6 dismissal, not a summary judgment like we had. The court said uh, there may be a right of association claim here. We don't think Keller decided that, and so we're going to remand it to the district court for the district court to consider whether Janus impacted, you know, what Keller said, what Keller means, and, and what Janus, what effect Janus had on these cases. Uh, the two plaintiffs in the Oregon Bar case have taken, uh, have filed separate petitions for cert in the U.S. Supreme Court, pressing the free speech claim, and also asking the court to overrule Keller if uh, mandatory bars uh, are permissible under Keller. Uh, that briefing is, is extended. The Oregon Bar is not going to file its first response until at least early August, so that will be ongoing. There are several other <coughs> state bar cases pending in the federal courts of appeals. Uh, I mentioned the Louisiana case that was argued on the same day as our case right after, afterwards. Uh, the Oklahoma case was argued in the Tenth Circuit back in November. Um, the um, Wisconsin case was argued in the Second Circuit this January. And the Michigan case uh, is going to be submitted on briefs to the Sixth Circuit uh, sometime later this summer. So there are a lot of moving pieces uh, to this litigation, and uh, we'll be sure and keep you informed uh, and um, uh, about, uh, about the progress and, and certainly when we get our opinion from the Fifth Circuit. The second case was Law HQ versus Willing. Law HQ is a uh, law firm or law organization that uh, does uh, consumer telephone cases and fax cases and, and those types of cases. They wanted to open in Texas under the uh, trade name Law HQ, and because Texas at the time the lawsuit was filed had, a, had an absolute ban on the use of trade names, Law HQ sued the state bar, well, sued, sued our chief disciplinary counsel um, uh, in her official capacity uh, for uh, unconstitutional uh, res restraint of speech. They said the absolute ban on trade names was old hat, and uh, very few states still had it, and, uh, and, and filed for declaratory and injunctive relief. We reached an accommodation with them because um, the state bar disciplinary rules amendment process had already uh, been well underway, and uh, I want to extend my thanks to everyone at the state bar and, and all the members of the state bar and directors who worked so tirelessly on those, those rules revisions, and also to the Supreme Court. So when the Supreme Court issued its order approving and adopting the change in the, in, in the trade name ban and replacing it with the amendment, which simply precludes 
uh, the use of false or misleading trade names. Uh, we approached the plaintiff and the plaintiff voluntarily dismissed the case and Judge Pittman didn't let any grass grow under his feet and closed the case the same day. So that case is resolved uh, in, a, in a very favorable way, I think, and, um, and you know, we, we have that behind us. I think there's only one other state uh, which is still uh, having active litigation about the trade name ban. I think that's Rhode Island. Law HQ uh, filed a number of different cases on the same day that they sued Texas against the nine or so states that still had absolute trade name bans. And one by one, they've resolved them all in some, uh, some fashion in, in those states, mostly by rules changes and rules amendments as we did here in Texas. But Rhode Island is still holding out at least the last time I looked. So, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. And uh, happy to stick around. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, we owe a lot to Tom and his firm. We appreciate him being here today very much. With that, we will recognize Mr. President for his report. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Jennifer, start coming up here. All right, presentation at item number A is going to be my presidential citations, and I have a few of those to give out today. The first one is going to be to one of our directors who is always available, at large director who's I don't want her spitting her water out right now, but Wendy Adele Humphrey, <laughs> <laughs> who was always available, did an exceptional job with her contributions to us and the, the committee as far as with getting our director at large position, the interviews, and with that, I want to give my first presidential citation to Wendy Adele Humphrey for all the time and effort she put in, and also changing my idea about academia in the bar. I mean, it's... <laughs> The second one I want to do is somebody that I always thought in our board meetings and our committee meetings was the voice of reason. He was always calm, level-headed, and seemed to think everything out. And for that, I want to give my next presidential citation to James Wester. Some of you may or may not know all the work that our bar staff did and directors did in obtaining the building that we have over on Lamar now at 1415 Lamar. Uh, there was a lot of work, a lot of meetings, a lot of time by both staff and directors that went into this. And one of the directors that put a lot of work into it is also the longest serving director, I believe, in history of the state bar, isn't he? So, so August Harris will receive the third. <laughs> <laughs> not just for the... Okay. You should have gotten up here to joke off telling your watch today. <laughs> Thank you, Art. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your service and everything you did. The next, I don't believe they're here, but I want to give a citation to the Committee on Disciplinary Rules and Referendum. It's the first time we've had a referendum since the one back in, I think, 2011, and a lot of work and everything went into it. Um, I mean, Steve knows in DCAP, y'all did a lot of work, but the, re the referendum committee, the, the, the CDRR, put a lot of time into it. And I have given a citation to Lewis Kennard, the chair of the committee, to Claude, how does he say his last name? Why does it different every time? The clue. The clue, okay. Vincent Johnson, Timothy Belton, Amy Brinson, Rick Hagan, Justice Denise Garcia, W. Carl Jordan, and Carol Nicholson. 
who served on that committee for all the time, work, and actually years of service that they put in. And I'd like to recognize them with their, I believe they've already got them by mail, but recognize them for the contribution everything they've done. <laughs> Two other people I want to recognize, and I always look for people that I think contribute to the profession of being a lawyer outside of just bar service. And one of them is a local here in Austin. Her name is Betty Blackwell. Betty served on the Commission for Lawyer Discipline. She is an advocate for lawyers. She does free CLEs, at least before COVID, at the Travis County Courthouse for lawyers just for showing up. She's been an advocate for lawyers for as long as I've known her. She's active in the Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, been on their board of directors. And with that, I want to acknowledge Betty Blackwell and I'm presenting to her a presidential citation. <laughs> on the civil side, I've looked around on the civil side and I've had several lawyers, some board members and past board members, tell me about one lawyer who is just the picture, the, what you want to see when you look at a civil lawyer who knows civility and how to treat their clients, their patients, their patients. No, it should be patients, uh, their clients, other lawyers in the courts. And with that, I am presenting to Richard Elliott of a presidential citation because of the civility and the example he sets for all lawyers of Texas. <laughs> now, thanks to Rob Crane, we wound up implementing at the State Bar the Together We Dine program. And the Together We Dine program is something completely different than implicit bias or critical race or anything like that. It's an open discussion where people talk about their issues, be it on race, social justice, whatever. And it's a dialogue, it's an opening, and it's something that was very successful. We were actually able to present that and make it available to every lawyer licensed in the state of Texas. And a lot of lawyers took advantage of it. And a lot of lawyers who are more conservative than others may be reached out to me after going through that and told me it was not what they expected. They were expecting something, basically a preaching or a lecture or something along those lines, but it turned out to be a listening. It was an eye-opening experience. And I did not get a single negative con comment back from anybody. And I was wondering when we first did this where some of the more conservative lawyers were going to come down on it. And when we first implemented this, some of them reached out to me with negativity saying, hey, you know, what are you doing? You're fostering this stuff. And I basically said, look, I've been through one. Rob got me to go through one. Trust me, go through it. And they did. And every one of them came back to me and said, they're glad they did it. They learned a lot. It's not what they expected. And for that, the people that actually put this together are Pastor Richie Butler, Butler and Charlene Edwards of Dallas. And I want to give them a presidential citation for the work that they did in implementing this program. Rob's getting a shout out for all he did in it, but they did such a tremendous job in reaching out to so many people and doing a great job in basically just opening minds. And for that, I want to give Pastor Richie Butler and Charlene Edwards a presidential citation for the work they did in Together We Dine. Next, we have word groups, and, and, and I probably, I don't know, Trey, if I've done more than anybody else had in a while, but we put a let, together a lot of work groups and presidential task forces during this year. We had a lot of goals that we wanted to accomplish, and believe it or not, I think we accomplished almost every one of them. In doing this, there was things that I'd learned and heard from lawyers that I thought needed to be addressed, and we addressed them. The beginning one we did was our presidential task force on criminal court proceedings. With COVID and everything that was going on, the criminal courts were basically shut down, along with the civil courts and the family courts. But we noticed on a task force that they had put together through the Office of Court Administration, criminal courts were be, being <coughs> kind of treated differently. So what we did was put together a group of Kenda Culpepper, the elected DA from Walkwall, Grant Schreiner, the president of Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers, and Judge Alberto Char Alfonso Charles, who was the regional judge out of Longview. 
And they each picked four other people, myself and Judge Burt Richardson, set on this task force. And it was an amazing thing because we were able to come to consensus, make our recommendations to the Supreme Court and the Office of Court Administration. And when it came time for them to issue their orders and such, the Supreme Court basically adopted almost every one of our recommendations. And that was something that we thought was just unheard of. That, I mean, we actually made a difference with this. And with this, I want to introduce you to Kenda Culpepper, who is here. Even though there was three co-chairs, she kind of led the show. I've already given her a, president, a resolution in the past for her work on this, but she just continues and continues and keeps going. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to Kenda Culpepper. Well, I'll tell you what, this looks a lot different than Zoom. Hello, everyone. Um, my name again is Kenda Culpepper. I'm the district attorney in Rockwell County and very honored to serve as one of the co-chairs of the Presidential Task Force. Um, and am here to give the report on behalf of myself, uh, Grant Shiner, and um, Judge uh, Charles, um, who are the other co-chairs, and believe me, did just as much work as I did. I have to tell you that, um, and I'm so pleased to be able to give you another report, and even more pleased that it is not right before lunch. Thank you very much. Uh, but um, I'm incredibly proud of the work that we've done on this task force. You know, um, President McDougall has given you kind of a, a, a little bit of a recap, but I want to I want to tell you a little bit more um, in a recap basis of what we did. President McDougall created this task force the very first week. Um, that he uh, was president to respond to this COVID, the COVID pandemic and the statewide shutdown of the court system. And he appointed Judge Charles and Grant and I um, as co-chairs because this was a very collaborative approach to this. Um, Judge Charles has served as the judicial chair. Um, Grant Shiner um, has been and continues to be the president of the Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. And I was the president of the Texas uh, District, Attorney, uh, District and County Attorneys Association. So we were bringing together three completely different perspectives to look at the court system and find out how we could um, improve and make an impact um, in this unprecedented time. And he gave us the opportunity to um, appoint four people within our own respective practice groups, and then he stepped back and let us run with it. He was at almost every single meeting, but he uh, really let us take advantage of this open forum to really have a great collaborative conversation. And I wanna talk to you a little bit just about the scope of the, of the representation, because we were able to appoint the best and brightest, some of the best and brightest from our uh, practice areas. And um, we also wanted to have regional diversity because we knew that the pandemic was affecting different parts of our region and courts were responding in different ways to depending on where you lived. So um, to give you an idea of that regional diversity, I'll start with the North Texas area, because that's mine. Um, so in addition to me, um, as the DA in Rockwell County, we had Dallas DA John Cruzo, Mark Daniel from Fort Worth, and, the D and DA Staley Heatley from the Wichita Falls area. From the Panhandle, County Attorney Scott Brumley from Amarillo, and Dan Hurley from Lubbock. From El Paso, Judge Maria Salas Mendoza. From San Antonio in the Valley, uh, Laredo DA Chilo Alanis and Bear County Chief Public Defender Michael Young. From the Austin area, Judge Elizabeth Earle, I see you right there, um, and David Botsford. From the Houston area, Judge Susan Brown and G Grant Shiner. Uh, and from the East Texas area, Judge Charles and Judge Bill Miller from Texarkana. And every, almost every single prosecutor and defense lawyer had been a president of our respective organizations. So we brought a lot of leadership um, to that meeting. And our first meeting was on, and let me just say this too, uh, President McDougal was on at almost every meeting. Trey Apfel was at many of the meetings. Um, Burt Richardson from the CCA, he sat on the meetings. And David Slayton, um, who we all know from the OCA, was very, very involved in this committee. Our first Zoom meeting was on June 29th, so almost a year ago, and we met. Re we have met regularly ever since. Uh, in fact, the full group has had 20 meetings in, in less than a year, which is incredible. I find that incredible and just goes to show how dedicated this group was. During the early phase, we met every single week to determine the legalities of remote proceedings and the safest way to allow courts to return to jury trials and in-person uh, proceedings. 
And it was really valuable to look at this from the perspective of all the different practice areas. Because as you might expect, we all had very different perspectives. We had different ways of looking at things, which is perspective, Kenda. And uh, it was interesting to be able to work together to find solutions. Um, and I can tell you that we learned a lot from each other. After a lot of discussion, we sent a list of 14 separate recommendations to the Texas Supreme Court. And as Larry just said, they um, adopted almost every single one of them, many times quoting our committee verbatim into the OCA guidance and the Texas Supreme Order court orders that y'all have become so familiar with. And I, I have to say that when we started, we didn't know that we'd be writing the rules for all the jury trials in the state of Texas, but that is quite frankly um, what happened with this committee. And since that time, we've continued to meet at least once a month um, to discuss proceedings throughout the state. We've made further recommendations to the court. Justice Learman, thank you so much for um, reading those and listening and taking those into account. Um, and uh, we've continued to have an impact. We've discussed so many issues including vaccine availability for lawyers. I talked about that at one of the updates. Speedy trial issues, conducting live trials with some witnesses appearing remotely, uh, and many more. And recently, we individually became very involved in the legislative uh, effort um, Trey, in our individual capacities um, in the legislative effort to take jury trials virtual. And as Judge Charles told you in the last update, the committee was unanimous that jailable criminal tr jury trials should not be held virtually. Um, but we were split about contested evidentiary hearings uh, and about whether judges needed par uh, to have party consent to have remote proceedings. As you might imagine, um, lawyers thought that judges should have consent and judges didn't <laughs> necessarily. Um, and so uh, several committee members, including myself, testified in our individual capacities again in front of the Senate and House committees regarding the efficacy of a lot of different bills. And I know the reason I'm kind of going back over this is I know that in a few minutes y'all are going to be talking about um, whether to continue this, uh, this task force. And I can tell you that the committee has discussed it as well. Are, are we still needed? Do we still need to be having these conversations? Everyone like you is so incredibly busy and we don't want to just have meetings for meeting's sake. Um, but we also agree that we are continuing to do very impactful and important work. And I was talking to Judge Charles yesterday. Uh, we were laughing because uh, we've quite frankly been very surprised at how such a diverse group of lawyers um, has been so collaborative. We really do work well together with, you know, I have to say there's been a couple of tense moments um, with all those people on a Zoom call, but we've done great work. And the courts are thankfully starting back up. Most jurisdictions are starting jury trials again, but there's a giant backlog of cases. And as a result, we think that remote proceedings will have a place in the future, and we want to continue to discuss best practices, improved practices, uh, for moving forward. And there's some other wild card issues um, on which we could believe we can be helpful. With the influx of COVID money into so many of our counties, we think that this is the perfect time for innovation in the court system. Um, second, because we have so many practice area leaders on the committee, we've been key communicators to other criminal practitioners throughout the state, and this is as important now as it's ever been. And with David Slayton leaving, that's not a secret, right? He's uh, leaving to go to federal pastures. Um, our committee can help with uh, the institutional knowledge needed to help with court transitions throughout the state of Texas. Um, I might mention also, um, and I'm closing, uh, that we continue, we will continue to meet by Zoom. Um, it's worked well so far, it's kept you know, fist fights um, from happening sometimes. So there isn't really a reason to change. I'm kidding, we never got into a fist fight on Zoom. And there would continue to be no fiscal impact to your budget. We'd be excited to continue to report our progress to the board. I assure you, uh, when we feel like there's no reason to re continue to meet, we would be the first to do so. So I hope that you will continue um, the great work that we're doing. And I know that President uh, President Sylvia will be thinking about that. So thank you so much for your service on behalf of the lawyers in the state of Texas. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but thank you. I'm incredibly honored to have served on this task force. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I'm gonna skip the rest of B and come on down and sure. I'll come back and catch B yeah, at the yeah, end. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. All right, next is our report on our task force on public protection grievance review and the client security fund. This is one where we, myself, I believe, 
President-elect Firth, it also heard a lot of complaints from lawyers about the way that our system works, some of them valid, some of them not. But we decided to put a task force together to look into these things to see how we could keep the grievance system fair to lawyers but also protecting the public. I reached out to the Honorable Judge Mike Fills. He's a retired judge out of Harris County who's now sitting as a visiting judge in one of the district courts to chair. He, on his own, picked out and chose the committee that or the members of this task force, and they have been working hard up until almost the last minute, like last week, correct? Yes, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Judge Mike Fields. Mr. Fields, Judge Fields. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I hate that you put me behind that last report. Uh, mine will not nearly be as concise. Um, I want to thank the president of the bar, Larry McDougall, the board, Chairman Ginn. Uh, most of all, um, a couple of members of the committee, Ms. Lucy Fisher, who was instrumental. Forbes. Forbes. Good Lord. Sorry. Forbes, uh, who was instrumental in putting together this report. Sorry, Lucy. I still haven't had a chance to see, meet you in person. Um, after the entire time that we've been meeting in Brett Rowe, who is not here. Um, the state bar staff was instrumental in getting this done, and I don't know, um, quite frankly, when Larry worked uh, this last year on his practice because he was at every meeting that we had, uh, as was Trey Apfel, uh, Lowell, who's here somewhere, uh, Jennifer Reams, who was uh, fantastic in making sure that the train ran on time and that we got everything done and to my um, assistant, Ms. Teclesia Branchard. Uh, I heard the same question a number of times from people, what are you guys doing? Uh, and, and what is the purpose of your committee? We have people doing everything that you're talking about, so why are you doing it? Here is the charge that we got from President McDougal when he put this task force together. It was this, listen, listen to the bar, listen to the public, and, and learn what it is that they think about our process, about how our grievance process works, uh, and what it is that we do. He wanted to facilitate a continuing discussion on ways to improve our grievance process, on ways to increase our client security fund, and on ways to provide greater public protection. We did not get to start in June as the last committee did. We started in September, which didn't give us a whole lot of time to meet and work, but the 20 people that we got together who are from all over the state of Texas, uh, just as the last committee, we had people from as far away as El Paso and for me as close as Houston, Austin, uh, the Panhandle area, and the Valley. There were people of every different race, ethnicity, gender, and practice area. Uh, the first thing that we did was engage in an education process to determine what it is that we don't know about what we need to know. Uh, we heard from Shauna Willing, the Chief Disciplinary Counsel, Judge Sue Carita, who were super helpful in giving us information about the Grievance Oversight Committee and the work that they've done. And as you read our report, you'll see that we have borrowed liberally uh, from the Grievance Oversight Committee's report and from the other reports and, and documents that have come out from other groups. Here's why. We believe that what you are doing here in the State Bar is working. And we don't believe that a whole lot needs to change. Yes, there are some suggestions that were made, but the work that's happening here, Mr. Chairman, the work that's happening here, Trey, the work that's happening here, Larry, is incredible. Um, we didn't have a multi-year effort to work with. We had a multi-month effort. And so we really truncated what we were doing to make sure that the deep dive that the other committees uh, have engaged in matched up to the very brief swim that we were able to engage in. We heard from our ombudsman, Ms. Stephanie Lowe. And you know, when you have 20 people on a Zoom call, uh, one, you can't see them all, and two, you don't necessarily know them all. We had a whole lot of cats to herd in this, in this committee, in this task force. Uh, and some of those were some fairly mean cats. Uh, and so when Ms. Uh, Ms. 
when Ms. Lowe stepped up to talk, I was concerned about the way she was going to be treated. There were some people who had a concern about the Ombudsman's office. Uh, one, that it was assisting uh, citizens in filing complaints against lawyers, which is not true. That's not what she does. Despite the very tough questioning that she received, she was always professional, always calm, always confident, uh, and gave us an overview of what it is that her office does and how it helps the citizens of the state of Texas. In fact, she was so thorough, confident, and, and competent that I think that she encouraged one of the suggestions that we have at the end of our report, which is that an ombudsman type office should be set up to assist lawyers. The grievance process is terrifying for those of you who have ever been through it. For those of you who have not, the grievance process is terrifying uh, and, and it is complicated. And even though we are lawyers, it is difficult to navigate those waters oftentimes. It would be helpful for those of us in the bar to have someone that we can lean on, not for legal advice, but for advice on how to get through the process, how to make sure we meet those deadlines so that we don't end up losing our license for failure to meet the administrative uh, duties. There were people on the committee with some agendas, with some ideas, and we talked about those ideas. Uh, but we all agreed on one thing, that organizations like the Texas Lawyers Assistance Program, which has helped so many lawyers get through this very difficult time of the pandemic, are essential to the operation, the successful operation of the bar. Eventually, we set up subcommittees to assist us in coming up with ideas, the Grievance Reform Subcommittee, the Clients Reimbursement Subcommittee, the Grievance Process Subcommittee, and we all listened to the charge of our president to listen. As a result, we had listening sessions that gave us the ability to hear from both the bar and the public. You'll see comments at the end of your report if you take a look from the bar. We have a lot of written comments, but we had some verbal comments in the listening sessions that we all thought were of particular importance, and so we asked those people to come back. Here are some of the things that were suggested with respect to the bar grievance process and how it might be better improved if it can be. Confidentiality. A number of lawyers in the state bar are concerned about the confidentiality of the grievance process. Uh, Shauna Willing will tell you that this process is meant to be as confidential as possible, but that doesn't stop other lawyers from saying to the public and other people that a grievance is ongoing, which can harm a lawyer in their practice uh, and during the course of a case. Uniformity. There is a disparity with respect to how lawyers are treated throughout the state in terms of sanctioning. One of the things that was discussed in our task force was creating a more uniform sanctioning program. Whether, well, how that is achieved obviously is a decision that you all will have to make. But making it so that lawyers in rural areas and urban areas are treated equally in grievance task force committee meetings and in sanctioning process. Another suggestion was reviewing the burden of proof with respect to proving misconduct. Right now, it's at a preponderance of the evidence. The suggestion is that we study raising that burden to clear and convincing evidence so that lawyers have a greater chance of fighting the grievances that are filed against them while giving the public the knowledge that when a grievance is sustained, it is a lead pipe cinch grievance. There is a disproportionate impact and I believe that we all know this, on the grievance process with respect to minority lawyers. We heard earlier from a former board member that there are discussions with respect to whether it's the Anti-Defamation League, whether it's the discussion of, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Larry, the implicit bias training, uh, these sorts of things, how the disproportionate impact is remedied is going to be a decision that you have to make as members of this board, but it exists. It may be that we need to educate the lawyers in those minority groups better so that their practices run smoother and they face fewer grievances. It may be that we have to educate the members of the grievance panels so that they understand that there are differences in the way that lawyers are approaching a different subject matter. Whatever that is, something has to happen to correct those disparities. 
It is a delicate and uncomfortable topic, but it's one that has to be addressed by this body. Another one of the things that came up during our discussions was the idea of sworn complaints. And this goes to the area of public protection. There were a number of lawyers who have said we need for the people who file complaints against lawyers in the state bar to swear to them, swear to the truthfulness of those complaints. I am opposed to that and I have made that clear to the members of the committee and I let them know that I would be saying that here to you today. I believe that sworn complaints would chill the grievance process and it is a necessary process for us to maintain our independence. As we heard from counsel, we're being sued because we are a mandatory independent bar. And there are a number of people who would like to take that mandatory independence away from us. It is, in my opinion, and I believe the opinion of many of the members of our task force, crucial that we maintain our independence, that we maintain the integrity of this bar, because our independence is what makes this bar special. I've had the privilege of teaching and lecturing in over 30 states to a number of different bars and judiciary groups. I can say this without question. The State Bar of Texas is one of the greatest bars in this nation. Our independence, our integrity, the way our process works is bar none. Pardon the pun. We should do everything that we can, and our task force agrees, to increase our client security fund. I don't know where that money is going to come from. And I can't suggest to you anything other than what we came up with through our task force. And that is possibly looking at those lawyers who have been sanctioned but have not been removed from the bar to assess a surcharge. There is the suggestion of placing arbitrary caps on the amount of money that any individual can get per lawyer. Uh, or reducing the amount that a person can get proportionate to the number of clients that are affected per lawyer on a percentage basis. All great suggestions and all of that is going to be something that you all will have to discuss and come up with a solution for. I appreciate the opportunity to serve this bar. I haven't done it before. I served on the State Commission on Judicial Conduct for a number of years and that was grueling. This is a whole new thing. Uh, the amount of work that you all put in to make this bar run blows my mind. What you do to keep our bar independent, what you do for the integrity of this body is something that I cannot thank you enough for. Your service is appreciated by the lawyers in the state of Texas and certainly by me. I'm gonna close up by saying this. After hearing the lawyer speak, there are going to always be people who attack us. There are always going to be people who ridicule this profession and lawyers. We are not a punchline. We are not a joke. We are lawyers in the greatest state in the United States of Texas. This bar is one of the greatest bars in the United States, States of Texas. I thank you for your service, and I thank you for giving me an opportunity to make this presentation to you. God bless you, God bless the State Bar of Texas, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Larry. And I would just like to kind of echo something that Judge Phil said, is I've been fortunate to meet a lot of bar presidents and executives from around the country, and uh, we are kind of at the top of the class. I mean, it's, it's, we are up there, and we are probably one of the most looked at, admired group of people sitting here that there are. Mr. Chair, this is an action item. At this time, I'd like to make a motion to refer the, refer, refer the task force report to the DCAP subcommittee for review in the next presidential year. Well, the, hold on, Mr. Director Fisher. So we're going to talk about discussion here in just a second. There's been a motion. You've made the motion, right, yes. Mr. President? So I need, is there a second? All right. Thank you, Director Goldsberry. For discussion today, 
Go ahead and click that little hand on your Zoom feature today. <laughs> or, or, Director Fisher, if you're going to talk, I'd like for you to go to the microphone, get in line if you can. The rules, um, the one that Director Tolchin's beat you to, the rules for today are the same as always. I'm not going to limit anybody in terms of time or content so long as it not, does not become abusive in nature. Director Tolchin, you have the floor. Thank you. First, I want to thank that uh, task force for a lot of hard work. One of the things that's particularly difficult is you're looking at such a big topic. It's almost as though when we put out a request for comments for, to all of the lawyers and to the public, it's almost like inviting people to a British history or a British culture survey class. And that doesn't mean that people who are interested in Macbeth Part 2 or Chapter 2 will show up for the purpose of, of talking about that in particular. And so while the extremely detailed report has many parts that I completely wholeheartedly agree with, uh, and I feel that there are two areas where if we had specifically asked people for comments on those two particular topics, there would have been an outpouring of additional information for that task force to consider. And I say that based upon two polls that occurred in the Texas Lawyers Group. For those who may not know, that is the largest group of attorneys in the entire state. It's a recognized bar association by this body. And in that group, there's more than 15,000 people. And in the, for the purposes of this poll, there was a poll on whether or not we should have sworn grievances. It happened in 2019. The results of the poll, all Texas lawyers voting, 475 yes, five, one, two, three, four, five, said no. Something is amiss when you have that level of 99%, okay? That's like the amount that Saddam Hussein wins his broken election by, okay? The second poll was whether or not we should have clear and convincing evidence or we should have uh, the, uh, what's it called? Burden of proof. Preponderance, thank you, I have prop here, sorry. Preponderance of the evidence, okay? And the outcome was 437 said we should have clear and convincing evidence, and 14 said that we should have preponderance of the evidence, okay? That's like 97% said we should have that. But this committee has come down that we should merely study it. And that's a little bit problematic. I don't see anywhere in this report that it mentions Alabama or Florida, which has sworn grievances. We may decide by this, uh, from this report, and DCAP may decide to go with these recommendations or, or whatnot, but I'm really looking for someone to talk with Alabama and to talk with Florida and to find out if there's any disparate difference between when they shifted from one to another and if they ever did, and to survey other states and see what, if anything, they've done, okay? Also on that point, it's important to recognize that there's a number of people who have run for high positions in this body, who are in this room, and some who have since graduated out of this board, who have run specifically saying to audiences and even in writing that they support sworn grievances, okay? This is one of those put up or shut up moments where if you really are walking the walk that you speak on an issue where 475 to five attorneys want something, who exactly are, elects us here, and do we respect their interests by making it really clear that maybe this is not an institutional opinion, but it sure is a popular opinion, and we should look carefully at it. Finally, let's talk just a little bit about clear and convincing evidence, because I'm gonna be looking for the DCAP committee to be talking about these things. Nowhere in this report do I see reference to, in re Rafalo, 390 US 544-1968, where the American, the United States Supreme Court held that disbarment proceedings are, quote, adversary proceedings of a quasi-criminal nature, and, quote, disbarment, excuse me, disbarment is designed to protect the public and is a punishment or penalty imposed on the lawyer. And why does this matter? Because when it does those things, you look beyond simply preponderance to a higher level of scrutiny which typically, in this situation, would be clear and convincing. And who does that? Every circuit court in our federal court system, every single one of them has a bar, 
and every one of them uses clear and convincing. They followed the United States Supreme Court and what they have found. The same is true among the vast majority of states, but nowhere in this report do I find any of this information. Again, we could choose to look beyond it. We could say the Texas Supreme Court has chosen not to recognize this, but we should have an abundance of caution to protect the attorneys of this state from losing their license on a whim instead of on something more. And that's not to say preponderance is a mere whim, but it's closer, and it makes attorneys feel respected and heard when these are two issues that they care. I've never seen, in all of my years doing this bar stuff, I've never seen two issues where attorneys are so united. Finally, I just, uh, this is just like a, a side note, but it's important to point out that even the State Bar of Texas itself, in Polk versus State Bar of Texas, 480 F2D 998 comma 1001, Fifth Circuit, 1973, the, our lawyers argued to the Fifth Circuit that discipline is quasi-criminal, and they did that in order to invoke the Younger Doctrine. So when it was convenient, we were willing to say it. Now when it's hard, we should be willing to say it too. Thanks very much. Thank you, Director Tolchin. Um, I'm gonna give President McDougall a quick chance to respond, and Director Fisher, the floor will be yours after that. Director Tolchin, I don't think anybody's disagreeing with the positions you're taking, but what we have is we put a group of people, and as you can probably tell, I don't interfere with the directions these work groups and task forces go in. And what we've done is done a study. Now we are asking the board to forward our study to the DCAP committee for the next year and allow them to either expand on it, to study it, make decisions and further recommendations to our board. I understand what you're saying. Those were left out and I agree with you there. I'm very familiar with those because you and I have personally discussed them. But the thing is, what we're asking right now is just for, to keep this conversation alive, keep this movement going forward, to forward this to our DCAP committee and allow the DCAP committee in the next bar year to further work on this matter and, and go beyond where this, like Judge Phil said, we had a limited window and opportunity of time. And this will give the task force a starting place and at least some idea because we did do live hearings and we did have people call in and speak to us. So this will just further this and put us in a position to even address the very issues that you brought up. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, whether it does or not, I'm taking the floor back. <laughs> <laughs> Director Fisher, you've got the floor. Thanks, Andrew, for the polite version. Um, maybe mine is not. Uh, uh. <laughs> You're there to stop me. I haven't even said anything not yet. Not yet. I'm just. Be I, calm. I'm, I'm not jumping right, yet. Look, but when Larry ran for bar president, like the number one issue, and I was one of his campaign managers, were sworn grievances. The only thing I agreed with the judge on, of all the things he said, was that being on the state commission for judicial conduct is a grueling job. It's a lot worse than that. But we don't need to talk about it. Um, sworn grievances. Listen. When a lawyer gets grieved, that's their livelihood. And if somebody doesn't have the courage to come up and say what they're the claiming is true, then I'm sorry, that grievance isn't worthwhile. You know, people should be, should be if you're going to hold the lawyer accountable, you hold the person making the charges. Because I've pointed grievance pa panels. This was probably my issue 10 years ago. You were part of it. And Sylvia, when you ran to get votes, you said you were before four sworn grievances. I really want people who run for bar office to have positions, to take issues. So sworn grievances is something that's over. And Andrew has that big group. I have a bunch of Facebook groups. Texas Family Lawyer is probably the most active Facebook group. Andrew can argue with me. And we also have about 15,000. And we have the exact same results that lawyers want sworn grievances. So if we're representing lawyers, and, and, and you don't have that, then you're, you're doing us a disservice. You were always for it, Larry. I don't know what, you know, I don't think you were convinced by logic. Okay, some of the other things that I'd like to see. Um, clear and convincing evidence. Um, if, if Andrew said there was only two states that don't have it. You know, I think it's a, it's a, a lot of people have to work hard to go to law school and, and have a job, and there's a lot of stress. And, uh, you know, making that just clear and convincing, like I think 48 states, is that right, Andrew? Have it, it's something like that, have it. We can join them. 
We're not unprotecting the public by doing that. There was a couple of other things that I, I wanted and, uh, and I thought were fair. I was mistakenly, even as a director, people call me two or three, lawyers call me two or three times a week. I, I put a stop to it because it's, it's not right. But they call me with their grievances and, and, and some of them are so distraught and a lot of them in the past said, Steve, I'm just not going to answer this. I just can't put up with this anymore. And that really affected me. And one of the things I wanted the bar to do, didn't, wouldn't cost any money, is that when someone gets a grievance, a serious one, and they don't answer in their 30 days or whatever it, is, it, it does, that someone be appointed who knows him in that, or her in that district and say, hey, are you okay? Because a lot of them aren't. They start drinking, they have other problems, they've, there's been suicides. I just want the bar to do that. Just someone to come out and say, do you, do you, it might be that the grievance is so overwhelming that, hey, why bother? Fight it, I'm going to lose. But I know of cases right now, different places, and Tyler and stuff like that, where the person has a legitimate defense, and they just they can't deal with it. It's, it's scary to get a grievance. Now I tell people, because I've been warned, you know, I can only tell you procedures, but I give them one piece of advice. When you get it, don't freak out. Move away from it. Walk away for a couple of days and think about it and answer it. So there really is a lot that, that can be done. And I'm not sure from that report, Larry, what we accomplished. And we did have some votes, but the messages I got from lawyers is, what are we voting for? This isn't the stuff that we wanted. Just to have a vote for a vote, we wanted a vote on, on, on sworn grievances, and we know the result would be. And we wanted to vote on clear and convincing evidence. That was probably more of Andrew's issue than mine. And we didn't have any vote on, on just this humanity thing where, please, sir, ma'am, are you okay? Can, do you need 60 more days to file the answer? There's no rush to remove them. The condition on that that I wanted was, however, if they want an extra 60 days to, to get help or to answer it, that they take no new cases before that. But there's a lot that we had hoped for and a lot that people running for office, can, most, of, most people running for directors. I probably got 10 or 12 people to run. All of them have said they're for that. So I'd like people to hold true to what they campaigned on and I'd like people to hold true on what the lawyers of this state want. Thank you. Thank you, Director Fisher. Judge Fields, did you have some comments you'd like to make, sir? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if I can. I don't know the protocol. And, and if, if you all uh, find my speech hes hesitant, I tore a rotator cuff, and I'm in a little bit of pain right now. Uh, but I do want to respond to one of the comments that was made. Um, I was taught that doing what's right isn't always popular. And doing what's popular isn't always right. Holding citizens to a standard of what we would hold lawyers to may sound popular to 500 lawyers, but it is not right. And it is not what this bar stands for, nor is it what we should do. I know that I am at odds, possibly with our president, and certainly with a number of people who have spoken with respect to this issue. And that's unfortunate. And, and, and I respect you, brother, for putting me as the head of this task force, understanding that we would have differences, and I believe that that's why you put me here. Chilling the public's ability to make complaints about lawyers will be the death nail for this bar. It will send us to a place that we do not want to be. Administrative hearings where non-lawyers are judging our conduct. That is just not something that is palatable to me personally and to the majority of the members of this task force. Understand, our, our group was set to give recommendations. We have no rulemaking authority. We gave our recommendations to this body and you will do with those recommendations what you will. I wish that I could have said more that you agreed with. I am not disappointed that I didn't. I, I will say this. Each and every one of you knows what it takes for this bar to remain independent and successful. That is critical. I said it there and I'll say it here. This is one of the greatest bars in the United States. We have to keep it that way by keeping it independent. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Judge Fields.
Lily, Director Lydia Mount, pardon me, Director Mount. I'm not as tall, so I'm going to move this down a little bit. Oops. Um, Lydia Lisondo Mount, Director for District 12, representing the southernmost part of Texas. Um, I'm very concerned about the recommendation that we not have sworn grievances. It is so easy for people to make accusations against lawyers, and as everybody in this room knows, attorneys were the brunt of jokes day and night. People have, some people have bad impressions of what we do for a living. Some people resentment for maybe the successes of many of the people in our profession. Whatever it may be, we end up easy targets. I've practiced in the fields of criminal law. I have done some family law work. God bless those of you who do that all the time. Um, and there are, I personal injury also, and sometimes we get clients who get very angry and very upset over the circumstances of their case, and, and attorneys end up being the people against whom they take out their frustrations. And it's so simple for people to attack us verbally, but if we also allow them to attack us where it counts the most in our professional world, which ends up attacking us financially, it, we, we, we end up at a really unfair, uh, in an unfair playing field, and, and it's not, it shouldn't be that way. Um, if, if people are willing to come forward and sign a grievance form, I think they should be able to sign it under oath as well, because if what they're saying is true, what does it hurt to swear that it's true? It, it, there shouldn't be any, any chilling effect if what they're claiming in their grievance um, document is true. I know somebody who right this very minute is going through the grievance process, is being accused of being a racist. I've known this person for 20 years. There's nothing racist about this person in any way, shape, or form. But the grievance is there. Why? Because she is the attorney representing the grievance wife in a divorce for no other reason. And this person has had to answer this grievance. And it, it, it's one of the most appalling and one of the most disgusting things I have ever seen happen to an individual. This person has been practicing for over 40 years, never had a complaint, and now there's a smudge on her record. Why? I think greatly in part due to the fact that this individual, the person who made the grievance, the person who filed the grievance, didn't have to swear that anything in, in the grievance was actually true. It needs to stop. The State Bar, yes, we do have a, a, a responsibility to the public, but we have a responsibility to the attorneys who are the members of this bar. And it is wholly unfair that this continues to happen. So I urge that we have sworn grievances, and I also urge that we raise the standard to clear and convincing. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have grievances filed against members of this bar that are completely and totally unfounded. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Director Mount. Director Baruch, before you jump in, I just want to make a point of clarification here so we can really focus in on the issue because we could talk about this all day. This issue before us today is not a vote on sworn grievances or uh, the standard of proof. We are talking about the motion is whether or not to refer this report for review by the DCAP committee. So I just want to be clear, not to suggest, Director Mount, that your comments weren't appreciated. Just I want to make sure that we do focus our comments on whether or not we should refer the motion, excuse me, refer the report to the DCAP committee. Um, just because we, we can be here all night, this is important, but I just, we do have other things to do and I just want to be efficient with our time. Thank excuse you. me, Director Brooke, my fault. No excuse necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think President McDougall's point is well taken. These are all legitimate concerns, and the committee no doubt will study and hash them all out. But I'm a little concerned about the tenor of the discussion because this is a publicly viewed proceeding, and there are members of the public watching our business. Uh, and I think it's important for an elected director to stand up here and assure any watching members of the public we understand quite well the grievance system exists not only to protect lawyers but to protect you. Uh, we are mindful of the balance in those two competing, at times, competing concerns. So I think, for example, the results of the poll Director Tolshin discussed are, are critically important for the committee to look at. If 495 out of 500 lawyers uh, 
felt that way. But I think it would be equally instructive for us to know how 500 members of the public who have been through the grievance process would view these questions. I think we need to know the answers to both of those questions, and I just wanted to speak to assure any watching members of the public uh, that we understand our role to protect you as well as to protect the rights of accused lawyers. We can balance those concerns and we will balance those concerns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Brick. Director St. Ives. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm one, one of the individuals Andrew spoke about because I did run on this with Larry and it still remains very important to me. And as a member of the DCAP committee, I want to be assured that when this report comes over, that we're not held to that because I still support the sworn um, complaints. I think that's very important for us because it's our livelihood that we work really hard for. And I sat on the grievance, the grievance panel before I got on the board and I saw these members of these really small firms or solos, they couldn't afford to retain counsel and they are at a very weak moment. Since COVID as a member of TLAP, I have been um, contacted by numerous individuals who ignored their grievances and they were at their wits end, they didn't know what to do and they were gonna lose their license. And so there's a lot of different factors and I just wanna be assured that if we vote to send this report to the DCAP committee, we are not held to what the task force found, that we can revisit this, we can do the research ourselves to make necessary recommendations to the board. Thank you, Director St. Ives. Director Bim. Good afternoon. As a criminal defense lawyer and family lawyer, I am one of the people who is often thought of as a target by the, as somebody that has a target on their back from the grievance committee. I'm probably also one of the few people in this room that's actually answered a grievance. And I can tell you that both of them were summarily dismissed, and, but those people that filed those grievances, neither one of them had access to a notary. And so for them to be able to attempt to access the only disciplinary process that they know, they would have had to do a significant amount of legal research and be dependent upon finding answers that they were you very, very poorly situated to find. And as a member of the um, Client Security Fund Committee and the vice chair of that committee, I'm here to tell you today that there are bad actors among us. There are lawyers who go bump in the night. And if one of those lawyers goes undisciplined because a client who has been taken advantage of does not have access to a notary or who fears notarizing a document because they are afraid they will be prosecuted, if this person is not disciplined, then we have failed as a bar. We have failed at self-governance. And for that reason, I recommend that you vote yes to referring this report to be considered by DCAP because this is a self-governance issue as much as it is an issue about the livelihoods of individual lawyers. I can say that one thing that I think we have to remember is that the people who work for the Chief Disciplinary Council, they are professional attorneys as well who take their obligation to the bar and take their obligation to the public just as seriously as we take our livelihoods. And I think we do have to give them some credit for not sitting around and just willy-nilly believing anything that is written on a piece of paper. 75% of grievances are summarily dismissed. So if 25% are going forward, at a minimum that means that someone has stated facts that support potentially a violation of our rules. It matters not whether that's notarized. It's something that we need to take seriously. So please vote yes in favor of this report being submitted to DCAP. It does need to be considered in its form. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bim. Director Tolchin. This will be brief. Um, first, Chad, thank you for talking about public protection. That's urgent, and I'm grateful that you did that. I'm sorry I did not. Um, with respect to whether we should have notary, Part of what the DCAP committee should study, and I do support them receiving this report to do that study, is the difference between Florida and Alabama. In Alabama, a notary is required. In Florida, it's not. It's simply that you swear under penalty of perjury. I support the Florida system. And please don't get bogged down in the whole idea of a notarization. I don't think any of us would ultimately support that. That would be too burdensome and that would harm the public, like Chad said. Thank you. 
Thank you, Director Tulsa. Director Smith. I'd vote yes to refer. Uh, let me just tell my story briefly. I've had uh, one grievance filed on me in my career. It was summarily dismissed, and I was proud to be part of a system where my client could have a concern addressed by the state bar and determine if I acted appropriately. I didn't have a problem with the system, and I don't consider it a black mark on my record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Smith. I'd Director. just like to offer an amendment. Okay. The, the amendment is we submit that as a proposed, except for the amendment on sworn grievances, and I'd like people to take a voice vote on that, see where they really stand as compared to what they campaigned on, and uh, hold on, just Director, hold on, Director Fisher. I'm not. I it's not your fault. I'm sure it's me. Can you tell me just without without asking people where they stood on with the campaigns, what your amendment is? It is to uh, just delete the section on uh, sworn or unsworn grievances to remove that from the report and to refer it to further consideration. Just like you said, we could talk about it for hours. Do you accept uh, the amendment? Uh, and do we move it? Uh, he, no. I, I don't, yeah, so we don't, so do you, okay. So I just wanna make sure I'm understanding. You want to remove from the motion the portion of the report that talks about sworn grievances? Correct. Do I have a second to remove that portion? Sure. All right. It has not been accepted. Then I, I don't think if it's been accepted, I don't. I want to make sure I'm right on my rules of order, Ross and John. But I don't think if I think that's right. If it's not been accepted by the original proponent, there's no vote on that. Correct. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Steve. It was not accepted. I'm sorry, Director Cortez Maras. That's me goofing up on the Roberts Rules of Order. I'll try to get better with those one day. Okay. In, in, in that case. Um, because, because that, that uh, motion and that report, I believe, is contrary to uh, the majority of what practicing lawyers, courtroom lawyers, who get the grievances, then I, I would recommend that we vote against it. I understand. So right now we have a question. Thank you, Director Naylor. We've got a call for the question. Um, the motion is as it was worded by uh, Mr. President Larry McDougall to make a motion to refer the task force report to the DCAP committee for review. Uh, I believe we had a second from Director Goldsberry. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion, cat, no, uh, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Derek, would you like to come up? I have you giving the report on the Justice and Leadership Work Group. <laughs> I got to catch him in a... <laughs> After all that, I'm just going to throw it I think mine will be a little easier, but we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> I know we're all glad to be back here in person. I'm a little sad to not be on Zoom just from the standpoint that I can't have my 10-month-old uh, daughter, Nora, sitting up here with me watching the meeting like we did uh, last time. <laughs> but she's entered the shrieking phase, so I don't know if that'd be good for anybody right now. Um, in addition to not getting to see Nora, you're also not going to get to see Carmen Rowe, who is the chair of our work group, uh, the Justice and Leadership Work Group. Um, she told me to tell you that she's sorry she could not be here today, uh, but I know that uh, on behalf of myself and I'm sure on behalf of everyone else in the work group, we're very appreciative of her vision uh, and her work and her leadership and putting this together, keeping us on task and keeping us focused and doing our work uh, and making these recommendations to the board today. Uh, on July 27, 2020, the State Bar Board of Directors held a special meeting to discuss and consider action regarding online commentary made by uh, President Larry McDougall and other directors. Uh, as one of the actions, the board approved the creation of the Justice and Leadership Work Group, and it assigned us the following mission. Uh, we were to consider and recommend action items to the Board of Directors on various diversity and inclusion issues currently facing the bar, including a review of all oral and written comments presented to the State Bar of Texas. Uh, Carmen Rowe was the chair of the committee. She put it together. She did a great job putting together people who had different perspectives, uh, different experiences that we could bring to help address these issues and fulfill uh, our task. And in addition to myself and Carmen, uh, board members Adam Schrammick and incoming uh, board chair Santos Vargas served on the work group. In addition to uh, Gary Bledsoe, Shavaz Brown, Pastor Richie Butler, Tisha Kimbrough, 
uh, Teron Moncrief, uh, the Honorable Audrey Moorhead, Paul Tu, Candace Walker, and we had uh, a lot of great help from Amy, Amy Starnes uh, as our State Bar Staff Liaison. Uh, we met 10 times via Zoom, and we reviewed uh, a number of comments over from 61 speakers who uh, gave feedback from what occurred during the July uh, meeting. Uh, we read hundreds of letters submitted by attorneys and members of the public giving comments. Uh, we took those comments and we grouped them into categories of ideas and from that we formed or uh, outlined four goals to affect change. Uh, we then honed those four goals and have uh, put forth in our report four recommendations uh, for the board to consider going forward. Uh, recommendation one uh, states that the State Bar of Texas seeks to accomplish its mission for all Texas lawyers and citizens without exclusion, without exclusion of persons based in whole or in part on race, ethnicity, uh, religion, color, national origin, age, sex, disability, whether physical or mental, military and or veteran status, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, gender expression, or other characteristics characteristics protected by applicable federal, state, or local law. In carrying out their duties on behalf of the State Bar of Texas, directors should A, consider their own implicit and explicit biases and decision making on behalf of the State Bar of Texas, B, discourage conduct verbal or written intended to exclude, harass, intimidate, degrade, or humiliate, uh, encourage a diverse slate of candidates, uh, be considered for all appointments over which a director has authority, and D, engage with local bar associations, including minority bar groups, to ensure awareness and consideration of issues important to these constituencies. Uh, our second recommendation related to the conduct of directors uh, and states that uh, a, as directors of the State Bar of Texas, any public statements or conducts by, conduct by directors may be construed as reflecting upon the State Bar of Texas as an organization. In all public interactions or communications regarding the legal profession, the State Bar of Texas directors should A, follow the State Bar of Texas Board of Directors Code of Conduct, B, follow the Texas Lawyer's Creed, uh, C, be courteous and professional, and D, to not, uh, not engage in behavior intended to harass, intimidate, degrade, or humiliate others. Um, we then came up with uh, recommendation three uh, related to uh, how candidates for offices are vetted. Uh, the recommendation states that the State Bar of Texas nominations and elections committee evaluate candidates for uh, president-elect prior to consideration by the board of directors for a final vote. And carrying out their duties on behalf of the State Bar of Texas, the board of directors should recommend for consideration that the State Bar of Texas nominations and elections committee study and consider a policy of seeking public input regarding the State Bar of Texas candidates for president-elect prior to their submittal to the Board of Directors for a final vote. <clears throat> Finally, uh, we uh, came up with a recommendation related to the Office of Minority Affairs and um, we heard from the director of that group and she told us about what they did. It was something that a lot of us on the work group uh, weren't really familiar with or at least to the extent of what it, what it did, uh, the full extent of what it did. Um, and we believe that that organization should be given uh, more consideration for expanding expansion in terms of staff and funding. And we came up with our fourth recommendation, which say, states that the core mission of the State Bar of Texas is the promotion of diversity and the administration of justice and the practice of law. The State Bar of Texas works to achieve this mission, including through the Office of Minority Affairs, which has three primary goals. Uh, one, to serve women, minority, minority, women, and LGBT attorneys and legal organizations in Texas. Two, to enhance employment and economic opportunities for minority women and LGBT attorneys in the legal profession. And three, to increase involvement by minority women and LGBT attorneys in the state bar. Uh, to further achieve its core mission, the state bar of Texas should examine, develop, and implement ways to enhance the work of the Office of Minority Affairs, including but not limited to a, adopting the recommendations of the President-Elect's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force for the Office of Minority Affairs. B, assessing ways to optimize the effectiveness of the Office of Minority Affairs by examining its current organizational placement and role in helping the State Bar of Texas achieve its core mission. And finally, C, to uh, increasing the resources and personnel to support the activities of the Office of Minority Affairs. <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, the Justice and Diversity Work Group would like to thank the board 
uh, for this assignment and to make sure that all public uh, and member comments submitted to the board in person or in writing at the July 2020 meeting were heard and examined for actionable diversity, equity, and inclusion ideas. Uh, we were honored to have been chosen for this task to help the bar fulfill its mission to promote diversity in the administration of the justice system and the practice of law to improve in order to improve the quality of legal services in our state. Uh, and just on a personal note, it's my last meeting here, and I just want to say in the meetings, one of the meetings leading up to the creation of this work group, um, I shared my story of recovery, and uh, I was really uh, just taken aback by the positive feedback I got from members of this board, um, uh, members of the public, other lawyers across the state who uh, related to what I said, and uh, it just really meant a lot. And uh, today during the new director orientation, Sylvia talked about um, you know, wanting to promote respect and civility in the practice of law. And I think one way to do that is for each of us to listen to and be willing to share our stories. We all have a story, we all have overcome something, whether it's related to diversity uh, issues that I've talked about in this report or have been discussed here today. We all have something to contribute. And if we all listen to each other, open and honestly uh, and are willing to do that, uh, we begin to relate to one another, connect with one another, and ultimately empathize with one another. And I think once we do those things, we're able to, uh, we can overcome anything. So I just want to say thank you all. Just as a point of personal privilege, um, Derek, when you shared your story last year and at the beginning of this year, you weren't the only one that heard about your bravery. Other directors here heard about it and appreciated it. And thank you for your leadership and for your bravery and for your courage and for caring enough to stand up and be vulnerable. Um, it, was, it was something that I will never forget. So thank you for that. Sorry, Mr. President. Not a problem. All right. Next is our work group on Texas lawyer needs arising from the 2020 pandemic and the 2021 winter storm. I don't know about y'all, but I started receiving a lot of phone calls and emails from lawyers wanting assistance because of finances, because of issues created by this. We basically found not just our bar in a situation, which again, I have to commend our staff. They did a great job in keeping us up and running and keeping us within budget. It was an amazing thing that surprised me. They were able to do that, and actually we came in way under budget. And to that, Trey, you and your staff deserve a big thanks. But we decided to put together one more work group. And this work group was one to deal with the lawyers and what we can do to assist lawyers. I called on Roger Key and Cindy Tisdale to form a work group and mainly become a think tank to come up with ideas so that we can address the issues affecting the lawyers. Is Cindy still here? She's right behind you. Oh, Jesus, no wonder I couldn't see you out there. All right, she snuck up behind me. All right, with that, I'd like to introduce you. If you don't know Cindy Tisdale, she's a prior board member. She's also a prior chair of the board and also basically a family law guru that teaches everything in family law, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Cindy Tisdale. Thank you, Larry. Guru, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that clip and, and play it. Play it. Guru. Um, first of all, it is so good to be here in person and see all, all of you fa your faces. I know many of you, I look forward to meeting many of you. Um, Roger, sorry he couldn't be here today, but Roger and I both wanna thank Larry for this opportunity and this board for the opportunity. Um, this board approved this workforce in April. I loved hearing the other work groups since June, October, We've had since April. Um, thank you, Larry, I appreciate that. Sure. But no, so you know, Larry called me and said, we need to look at what can we do to help our lawyers? They're, they're struggling, what can we do? We need to assess the situation and figure that out. And he tasked Roger and I with uh, co-chairing this work group to, to go forward. So we did, we jumped right in. And the only reason, there, thank you. I don't know, I'll give you a sign. Um, the only reason we got it done in two months is because of these people right here. We had 11 of the most hardworking, dedicated, energized people on this workforce. I'm not gonna list them, they're there. If you know them, thank them for their service and their time because they did put a lot in in two months. Um, 
So this task force was, um, or work group, was tasked with identifying areas where the state bar could continue or expand its efforts to assist its members. That's a large task, right? How can we do this? So in looking at um, that task, we identified three things we could do and we could do fairly quickly. So first of all, we did a survey of the members. Um, and that survey was to discuss, you know, what the needs were of our members, what could help them out. And I'm gonna discuss those survey results here in just a second with you. The second thing we did is uh, produce a short video that we're going to share with our members and really flood them with it um, of, a, of a personal story of a member that had COVID and what he went through and the struggles he went through in his practice. And also to highlight what, um, what resources were available through the bar and that could have helped them. And the third thing is we are getting the word out because honestly, the state bar, you heard Trey's uh, report, the state bar has done a lot through the pandemic, but I don't think attorneys have really heard what is available to them. So um, I think this work group looked, we're not gonna reinvent the wheel, but we need to get this word out. So let's talk about the survey for a minute. The, uh, I'm not going through every, survey question and answer, but I'm hitting some highlights. At, before the pandemic, 11% of attorneys said they worked remotely. During the pandemic, that jumped to 52%. The um, change in revenues for law firms, 50% of law firms said they had a decrease in revenue. Another 25% saw an increase, I don't know who that was, and 25% saw, um, did not have any change at all. The 41% of law firms in Texas reduced their physical office footprint, 41%. Um, another 24% of law firms, uh, uh, they uh, decreased their compensation for workers. Now this next one we can all, <laughs> we can all relate to, 35% of attorneys found an inability to disconnect from work. It's tough to disconnect when you're used to getting up, getting ready, eating breakfast, getting in your car, go to work, coming back home and doing family time, to getting up, having breakfast, staying in your pajamas, going in your office area, getting on Zoom, kids coming in, I've got to do the laundry, and that kind of goes in through the night and there wasn't a specific work day. And a lot of attorneys, 35%, said they had a very difficult time having that disconnect. I know I did. Um, we also asked attorneys, what would you like to see continue from this? These numbers were staggering. 86% want electronic signatures to continue. 85% want online CLE from the bar to continue. And 81% want electronic notarization to continue. The top concerns, we talked about the top concerns and the needs of attorneys. The theme throughout all of those answers was technology. I don't know about y'all, but when Zoom first came out, oh heavens, I needed help. I needed my kids to help me. So, but in looking at technology, attorneys were concerned with how to work remotely, um, what their law practice management software should be, what the billing schedule should be, things of that sort. So a current theme throughout all of those answers were the technology and the difficulty they had with it. So that's just a summary of the survey. Um, again, that's not all the answers, what the state bar staff is doing. Now remember, we just got these, uh, the survey results back yet. We're, we're two months, we didn't have much time, but the state bar staff is going through those answers. They're looking at it, they're reviewing it, finding out what else we can do to assess the needs of our members and to address those needs. So um, the next thing we're going to show you in here just a minute is uh, a little clip of a video, a tease. It's going to be a tease of a video, not the whole thing. Um, there was a gentleman on our workforce, Manny Sieta is his name, and he actually, he contracted COVID. And he was not in a, <laughs> he, um, not in a good place. It was very bad. He had to, you know, his solo, had to shut down his practice. And in the first meeting, he talked about the struggle he had keeping his business, making a living, what his family had to go through. And, you know, kind of light bulbs went off because his story was so riveting. We were looking at him going, there's our answer. This is what we need to do. We need to get the word out and he's the one to tell it. 
So the state bar staff got together, we did a video of Manny telling his story and highlighting what the state bar has available to its members for times like that. So now I'm gonna have, show you a, a short clip of Manny's story. Hey folks, my name is Manny. I'm an attorney here in Houston. Been practicing about 25 years. You know how that goes. We have a busy, profitable practice. You get to thinking you're in charge of your life. Well, I thought I was in charge and then all of a sudden, boom, uh, the coronavirus introduced itself to me and I lost track of everything. I lost track of my practice. I lost track of my life and my very existence. I was on a ventilator. My kidneys had failed. The doctors called my wife and said, ma'am, we don't hold out much hope. My wife being a woman of faith said, well, I hold out plenty of hope and I'm gonna pray for my husband. I'm gonna pray for you guys. I'm gonna pray for the staff and uh, we're gonna see a miracle. Well, we did. My blood oxygen shot back up. A little bit later, my kidneys started working again. And then my heart settled down. Well, thanks to a very good physical therapist and my determination, I walked out of that rehab hospital. Listen, uh, if you're like me, I'm kind of uninvolved with the state bar. But you know what? The state bar is really amazing and they have programs where you can designate in advance an attorney who knows about your system and knows how to get into it and would help you if you're in a sudden accident, if you put in a sudden coma somehow. And because of my story, they're now thinking about how to improve all this to help us. So check it out, be prepared, take care of your family, take care of your friends, and be safe out there. God bless. So there's a short snippet of Manny's story. Again, he goes on to talk about the difficulty of, of running his practice and how he wished he had known what resources were available to him and his family from the state bar when he was in the hospital near death and they were trying to take care of him and trying to take care of his practice. Um, there's a couple of things I wanna highlight with you. The stuff the state bar has already done. I wish I could take credit for all this. I really do, but I can't take credit for any of it. Um, first of all, there's the advanced designation of a custodian. What that is, is you can go on uh, to the, I call it the disaster portal, uh, but the disaster portal, and there is a form you can fill out so you can designate another attorney to take your place or take over your practice in case of a catastrophe, be that a hurricane, illness, you know, something to that effect, and you designate someone that you want to step in. The second thing is what's called the SOLACE program, and the SOLACE program is something where it's a portal where attorneys can go on and volunteer. I can go in and say, I volunteer. If there's another attorney that has a catastrophe hit their life, I will help them in their practice, and attorneys can go in and volunteer so the state bar can match up if attorneys that will help other attorneys that are in uh, a disaster or a catastrophe. I want to thank the great work of Amy Starnes. She's the State uh, Bar Public Information Director. She created this disaster portal. Doo -doo -doo, but, uh, she created the disaster portal and it's to increase awareness, to get everything under one place so it, as attorneys we can find everything we need to. The final edits are still being made but you can go look at it now. It's under texasbar.com backslash attorney resources. And like I said, final edits are being made, but it's made available and you can look at those now. Um, and I tell you, in talking to Manny, he wished he had known about those resources and those tools when he was going through his illness. 
So to increase um, more awareness, we also worked with the Member Benefits Committee. They're going to send out a postcard to every member that highlights Manny's story, highlights the disaster portal, and also highlights the technology that's available through the State Bar, since that was a recurring theme in our survey answers that they wish they knew more about. So it's gonna be a little postcard they get in the mail. Hopefully they don't have to open it, throw it away. They can look at it, see it. They can go on and look at Manny's story, know there's something available to them, and help get that word out. Um, since the State Bar has done all this work, you know, the, the committee, we looked and we, we decided, like I said before, we're not gonna create, recreate the will. It's already been done. We just need to get the word out and we need to do it in such a way that it captivates people. And hopefully Manny's story does that. And the survey will help the state bar in the future to assess the attorney's needs. And, uh, you know, maybe plug in if need to in the future. The Texas Bar CLE and the law practice management programs are the best ones going forward to do that. And I believe they will. So that is the work of the Texas uh, Lawyers Needs Work Group. I want to thank Larry so much for putting uh, his faith in Roger and me and getting this done. And I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to serve the lawyers of the state. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy. And I guess what this proves is, is that the State Bar, we've been ahead of the game and doing all this stuff. It's just that I've always said that sometimes we're our worst enemy at patting ourselves on the back and getting the word out. And we're hoping now we can get the word out and more people will take advantage of it. I mean, one of the things we had is in the last board meeting is our Sharon Crowley Trust. For the first time, we've had so many lawyers take advantage of that that we had to replenish in the middle of a fiscal year the money to support that and keep that going. So what we have with the COVID stuff is more lawyers drawing on our resources, and that's a good thing. If I could just finish this up, I'll, oh, I'll take sorry. a break. Yeah, no, you no, bet. No. Yeah, All right. Now, just basically some reports from me. We have a new out-of-state liaison. It is, her name is Rocky Israni. I've only talked to her on the phone, but I've been very, very impressed with her. She is a Texas lady. She went to UT undergrad, got her master's from Rice and her law degree from University of Houston. She currently resides in San Francisco, uh, has a lot of interesting comments about San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, but she is going to be new to our board, and I think that she's going to be an excellent addition. She's very sharp. She's a character to talk to. She's actually very funny. And I do want to thank Denise Hoggard for her time on our board. She is our outgoing uh, out-of-state director. And if you've ever spent any time with her, she's just a joy to be around and I think a great asset. Since this is my last president's meeting, I want to thank everybody for the work that they've done this year. I think that we've accomplished as much, if not more, than any other bar has in a long time at the State Bar, and that's due to everybody, our work groups, our directors, and especially our staff members, and all the amount of work and time they put in. By going to COVID, with the COVID protocols and doing the Zoom meetings, it allowed us an opportunity to do things in a way that we probably wouldn't be able to do. So again, I want to thank our bar staff especially. And, and again, I know the name Jennifer's been thrown around, but Jennifer and when Chelsea was here, just did an amazing job of keeping everything going. And while y'all aren't gonna see it until Friday or, or whenever y'all gonna see it, I have given Jennifer and Chelsea, among other members of our State Bar staff awards, just for the amount of time and effort. I don't know about you, but I would get emails and phone calls from Jennifer at seven, eight o'clock at night, same from Chelsea. I mean, those, those ladies just worked a tremendous job and they deserve our gratitude and thanks because without them, I don't think we could have accomplished everything that we did. I mean, the task forces are a big deal. You've already heard from some of them. So I just kind of want to go over just kind of a wrap up. One of the things I wanted to address is the State Bar or advertising review. I've always said that we have a, basically, it's a customer service issue. Uh, what we're doing now is switching to an online submission process. This should help things move quicker, get the process moving, and make it easier for the lawyers in our advertising review. And I'm hoping that will resolve a lot of the issues and complaints we've been having. Trey talked earlier about our bar or building purchase at 1415 Lavaca Street. If y'all haven't seen it, I was hoping that we would meet at the bar building and we could all go take a tour of it. But it's that little building right there on the corner, kind of behind the bar building. We now own it. It is our property. And I know there's been some rumblings and grumblings about time of COVID and all this going on and lawyers hurting. 
how can we spend our money on something like that? It was an opportunity in my view, and I believe everybody on our executive committee, that we could just not pass up. And this is one of the things that August Harris worked very hard on in helping implement this thing. But you know, one time in January of the, when Randy was still president, this issue was presented and we approved buying it and we quickly got outbid. And what wound up happening is the historic provision, uh, pro, the historic committee in Austin uh, didn't like what they were doing, denied them their permits and allowed us to come and jump back in and pick it up a lot cheaper than what our original purchase price was. Uh, Trey and his staff did a, a lot of studies on this. The, I mean, everything from contamination to the plumbing to the roof to the air, I mean, everything that you could think of. And we still thought it was a great purchase to go through. There really wasn't that much wrong with the building. It was just old. I mean, that building was built allegedly at about the same time as our state capitol, but it's now ours. We can put staff in there or we can use it as a, another hall, event, place, CLEs, whatever. Uh, it's, just, it's just a purchase that I felt like if we didn't jump on it when we had the opportunity, our bar leaders five, ten years from now would be fussing because we didn't jump on it and it's something we had to do and that's one of the great things that I think we did this year. One of the things that I consider my most important accomplishment happened in the year that I was budget chair is I fought for and argued, and Trey fought me a little bit like he probably should have, but we wound up getting a new position for TLAP. So it's just not going to be the two we have in here now. We will have a third uh, lawyer counselor in there. Chris Ritter and Erica have been working their tails off. Uh, I think they've been working extra hard during this time that we've been going through this. I can't appreciate enough, say enough of what they've done, but I'll be perfectly honest with you, I was starting to get worried about Chris and Erica because they were just working almost around the clock and they are there 24 hours a day for any lawyer that has problems. And as you know about the increase we had, I just talked about momentarily, with having to refund the Sharon Crowley Trust, you can just imagine that was just increasing their workload on top of it. So I think that we will have, that will be a big benefit for us. I can tell you that uh, in talking at the Southern Bar Conferences that I've been to, and I was at the Louisiana, Louisiana Annual Conference last week, uh, we're ahead. They look at us like we're a leader. They wanna know what we're doing in Texas. So it's, we've set the bar. And I think by, and when I told them we had another position to add and make it that much more available to our lawyers, they were just, I mean, impressed. And that's one of the big things that we've done. And I'm very proud of that. Uh, you know, one thing, there is always that bridge too far. And if any of y'all are World War II bus like I am in Operation Market Garden, you had the deal where the Americans and the British and the Canadians were trying to capture Syria bridges to get into Germany, and they went one bridge too far and were not successful. My bridge too far was the courthouse access badge. We formed a work group early on. David Sergi was heading it. Uh, Randy did a task force on it, uh, got it through committee, and, but never got it calendared. Uh, in this case, we tried again to solve all the issues and we could just not generate the support over the legislature that we needed to try to get this access badge done. I'm hoping that in Laura's year is another legislative year that her and, and maybe even Sylvia can get in there and try to push this issue or see where the holes were because I know that was something very, very important to the lawyers of Texas. Being president of the bar has been a very distinct honor for me. I know we had our bumps in the road in the very beginning of that year, but I think we've moved on. We put this beside us. I haven't dwelled on it. Most of y'all haven't dwelled on it. And it's allowed us to accomplish everything you've heard about today. And to each and every one of you, I want to say thank you. Not just thank you to you, but to all the lawyers that allowed me to be in this position by voting for me. It's been a great honor. It's probably one of the greatest honors of my life. And with that, I want to say thank you and God bless. In June, um, we're going to take a quick 10-minute break in just a second, but in June, um, I talked about Larry, and I talked about his desire to fight for Texas lawyers and his care about Texas lawyers, and I think if you look back on his task forces, that's what they focused on, Texas lawyers and the public. And I think for the last hour or so, we've heard about the actions on that committee, um, on those task forces and those work groups, and Larry, I think you'd be very proud of what they've accomplished, and I think you should know that it's been my privilege and my joy to serve with you as chair and I thank you so much for the work that you've done this year and for the great 
reports that we just heard about. Thank, Thank you very you. much. With that, I know we've been going for a while. I know we have some things later this evening we all want to go to, so we're going to continue to move efficiently, but I can tell some of us need to use the facilities. So if you will all be on your honor code to be back in 10 minutes, I've got, I've got 325. So at 335, please be back. We're in recess. We're starting sharp at 335.
I'm calling this meeting to order. Please come to your seats. We're going to continue with our president. Please give her the respect that she deserves. Uh, our Madam President's report. I'm going to start calling names. It's not going to be fun. <laughs> All right. We're going to move on with our agenda. We're going to hear from our president-elect for one more day, Madam President-elect Sylvia Barunda Firth. And I call the meeting back to order. Good afternoon, and thank you, Charlie, for that break. It, I, I had not realized. I didn't think I would ever say I missed the Zoom meeting, but I did, because in Zoom meetings, we could turn it off and move whenever we wanted and, and eat and do whatever. It's hard to sit up here in the front, so thank you, Charlie. Well, and thank you all for being here. I, I, I know that during COVID, we all were very anxious to get out, but then now I know from talking to lots of people, some of us are anxious to be out and a little worried and maybe left people at home who are a little bit worried about you being out. And I, I thank you for, for taking the time to come here today. I'm gonna keep my report brief because I, act, I also have, it's like, I feel like Larry and I have show and tell. We have people to bring, you know, I, I, have, I also have a chair of a task force who's gonna do the lion's share of the work today. Um, but I wanna start by thanking you all for approving the appointments that were part of the consent agenda. I don't, I don't know if anybody had a chance, even looked at those, but that's part of the very important work that you did is approving the consent agenda. And I want you to know that staff and I worked many hours on making those appointments. Um, and I wanna give special thanks to Ray Cantu and to Miranda Sewell who worked with me. And it was not easy to do remote. We had multiple meetings remotely and things being shipped back and forth and resumes, et cetera. Um, but I want you to know that we took great care in making those appointments, and as always is the case, we did it with a view towards uh, addressing diversity in the state bar. And diversity not only with regard to race and gender, ethnicity, and um, gender identity and orientation, but also the type of practice and also geography. So it's a hard, anyone who's done it, can tell you it's really hard to do because you're looking at all these different committees and trying to make sure that they're balanced. Um, we also did it with the view, I, I, my philosophy was if it wasn't broken, I didn't want to fix it. Um, I'm very grateful to volunteers who give their time and if you spend any time with me at all, you've heard me say this because I say it all the time, is our most precious resource is time. You can't buy any of it, you can't buy more. Um, you, when you're choosing where to, where to spend your time, um, I always want to make it so it's not wasted and so that you feel if you've given up being with your kid at his soccer game to be at a committee meeting, it's, it's, it's a valuable um, experience. Um, so I, I, people who have been giving their time, I didn't remove people from committees. I, it's not my style. They were there doing a great job. Um, but I, I, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about something I, I did do. So most of you know that we had a record number of people to apply to be an at-large director this year, which is fabulous, and I'm really excited about that. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we didn't lose those people who had stepped up and said, I'm willing to be a volunteer to the State Bar. So I appointed several individuals to serve on committees who had interviewed for at-large director but were not selected. Um, I, I went through that process, and I know how disappointing it can be if you don't get it, and it's hard. I and mean, they'll tell you, they tell you at the beginning, you may have to apply for this more than once, but I fear that when people don't get the appointment, that, that we lose them. So these are all, and they had not put in to be on committees, but um, Miranda called them and said that was what I wanted to do and would they be willing, and every one of them said yes. So these are all amazing individuals who demonstrated a desire to serve the bar, and I wanna make sure that we found a way to keep them involved. This is one way that I thought of to strengthen the pipeline for creating diversity um, at State Bar Leadership. Once we bring people into the fold, and you all know that because you've, you've been uh, part of that, um, then they st end up staying, um, or you get called to come and do something different. So I think it's time for us to, um, to, to, to do what we're saying. If we're saying these diversity is important to us, we need to make it happen by the appointments we make. And um, someone spoke about it earlier. You guys get a chance to make appointments to grievance committees, et cetera, the first year. I guess that was in the uh, um, uh, orientation. So keep that in mind, just like we do um, when we're making appointments. 
I also continued the tradition of appointing members from the leadership SBOT class to serve as advisory members for various committees. And these are individuals who have interested, expressed interest in serving the state bar and being leaders. And this was a way to get them in, started on committee work. And we also, and I'm doing air quotes about, promoted some of the advisory members to regular membership so that they stay in. And finally, and this one was a tough one, I made a couple of phone calls to a few lawyers who had held chair positions for a really long time and asked them if they'd agree to step aside and create a leadership opportunity for somebody else. Um, and that worked with varying degrees. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you. I had, I had a, at least one person tell me I still haven't finished my agenda and made a good argument for, for staying there as a chair and was left to be. I'm, I'm, like I said before, I'm grateful. Um, but I, I, I'm bring that up because you all will recall a meeting before last when I gave the report on the um, committee review task force, which is the, t the group that meets every other year. And we review all the committees to see if, if we've got um, uh, duplication of efforts, et cetera. So sunsetting, if you will. At the end of that report, we previewed that we think it might be necessary to start talking about term limits for chairs on the committees. And that's gonna be controversial, and it's, um, but I think we talk about it so that we know we're looking at it because that's a way we create leadership opportunities for others. Um, you all know that the Diversity Task Force has been working really hard, and I'm really proud of them, and I'll tell you that they've put in a lot of hours, um, and they've even exceeded my um, expectations. Um, they, they've done the report, which, which is included in with, with your materials, and they, their task work, force work has been very impressive, um, and it, their intention is to support the state bar's core pur purposes of improving the quality of legal services and supporting the administration of justice in Texas. And it's clear a lot of thought and research went into this, and I want to thank um, the staff who's also been supporting, Karen Shevins has been support, supporting the work of that. Um, but I, I'm gonna turn it over now to former State Bar Board Chair and good friend, Joe Escobedo, to discuss the report. And I'll just tell you, I, I mentioned it to you, to the first years that there's still some in the back of the room. Um, you'll make really good friends as State Bar. And I, I actually have a picture where Joe and I were being sworn in. We didn't know each other, but we're standing right next to each other. And he is a good friend and took on this task of chairing this task force for me. And I, I wanna ask you to please welcome Joe Escobedo. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joe Escobedo. I'm an attorney from Edinburgh, Texas. And uh, man, it feels good to be here. It, re it really does. It feels really natural for me to be here. And, and Charlie, actually, Cindy and I were talking. If you want to take the rest of the meeting off, we'll, 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 we'll do the rest of the meeting Don't for tease you. Me. No, I hear you. Um, but I'm here to give the, uh, the report for the, D the DEI task force. And upon being selected as president elect, Sylvia first, Barunda first announced the formation of a 15 member task force on diversity, equity, and inclusion to study and propose actions in promoting DEI in the administration of justice and the practice of law. And I'm gonna repeat the, the, the last phrase, in the administration of justice and the practice of law, because it's my firm belief that what we're suggesting is, goes a long way in, in furthering the values that we should hold dear in the administration of justice and the practice of law. The task force members included representatives from all of the affinity bar groups TYLA and other groups included uh, former chair of this board, Rayhan Ali Muhammad, included um, former president Lisa Tatum and others, uh, and there were an incredible group of people, and it was my honor to, to chair uh, that committee. So why is DEI important to the administration of justice and the practice of law? And the reason for that is quite simply because Texas, we live in a very diverse state and it's only getting more diverse by the day. A few, a few statistics to consider. Since 2005, Texas has been a majority minority state. Since 2011, Hispanic students account for the majority of students in, Tex in Texas public schools. In, in 2019, Texas became home to the largest black population in the United States. 
In 2020, Asian Americans were the fastest growing population in Texas. And in 2019, 4.1% of Texans, nearly 1 million people, identified as LGBT. So we live in a very diverse state, and that this is why we believe these principles are important. <coughs> why should all lawyers care about DEI? Simply put, it's, we're in the business of advocacy and representation, and our state bar should not only reflect and represent the face of Texas, but it should also be responsive to Texas' diverse population. In other words, DEI efforts are about creating better places for Texas lawyers to work, being better uh, lawyers for the, to our, our clients, and striving for a fair and impartial legal system. It's also about instilling confidence in our system of justice. And given the events that have happened in the last year or so, I, will, that, I don't know if that's, it's any, there's been any time where that's more important. It's very important. There, there we give reasons in the report as to why, there's, there's business reasons why it's important to have diversity. There's a, there's a study that's mentioned in the report that increased diversity makes us more innovative, more creative, and increases business performance and profitability. Some of you all may have heard that in, in, in 2019, more than 170 general counsel and corporate legal officers signed an open letter to big law firms <coughs> stating that their companies will prioritize their legal spending on those firms that commit to diversity and inclusion. So there's practical reasons for it as well. This is not the first state bar task force to address DEI. In March of 2006, state bar presidents Eduardo Rodriguez and Martha Dickey oversaw the creation of a task force to study and make recommendations to improve the hiring, retention, and promotion of minority and women lawyers in large and mid-sized law firms and corporations in Texas. The report of the 2006-2007 task force is included in your materials. While the 2006 task force that I just mentioned was primarily concerned with glass ceiling type issues, Ms. First task force took a much more comprehensive approach. Specific assignments included a review of that report, the 2006-2007 report, to determine if any items that were recommended and not, but not completed should be advanced. Consider revisions to the Texas Lawyers Creed to include DEI principles. Consider and suggest updates to the Office of Minority Affairs and its offerings, including decre increasing dedicated staffing and increasing budgeting. Make recommendations for mandatory and voluntary DEI education by Texas lawyers. Improve communications between the state bar and its members on DEI. Improve CLE offerings relating to DEI and create pipeline opportunities to increase minorities in the bar and state bar leadership. The task force held seven meetings since November 20, 2020, countless meetings between the subcommittee members uh, as well. The task force members worked in, in the committees in the following areas, CLE and education, communications, pipeline issues, implicit bias, and administrative issues. In your materials, you'll find the report of this task force and their recommendations. I just want to highlight a few uh, for you here today. In the communications realm, one of the recommendations was a monthly article on a diversity topic in the Texas Bar Journal or the Texas Bar Blog. This has been done in the past, and we, we we're suggesting that it should be continued and advanced today. Assessing the impact of the pandemic, specifically on women and minority attorneys, you've heard about that uh, from other people reporting to you today. We believe that that is very important and, be, and anticipate that the pandemic has and will disproportionately impact women and minorities, resulting in these groups experiencing greater attrition from the legal practice. It is highly recommended that we take steps to proactively address the impact on the profession. On the CLE front, the state bar should encourage each state bar program of 12 hours or longer to include a diversity segment. This is, if you, for those of you all that remember, this is relating to attorney wellness issues. That's kind of the way it started. We just we started including some of these areas in these larger um, CLEs, and now everyone takes it for granted that we, we're going to have some of these um, topics. We believe that it's time to have to do the same thing relating to DEI. DEI training for all Texas lawyers. Bless you. Sorry. Um, and I know you're going to hear more about this later, the admin committee, um, when the admin committee gives a report. 
But we, the, the task force believes that the state, the state Bar of Texas is currently faced with an opportunity to show the importance it places on ensuring Texas lawyers are equipped with, to provide fair, impartial, and unbiased representation. The State Bar of Texas is already behind, and it's not something we like to say because we do believe we have the best CLE in the country, but it is behind in including DEI and bias training as part of the, as, as part of the MCLE requirements. Many bar associations include DEI and bias training as part of their MCLE requirements, two of which uh, specifically call out credit hours and must be devoted exclusively to DEI and implicit bias, and those are California and Missouri. This task force recommends that the MCLE requirements for all attorneys licensed in Texas be changed to include one of the three ethic credit hours must be devoted exclusively to explicit or implicit bias, diversity, inclusion, or cultural competency. Pipeline initiative. TYLA does a fantastic job on this. We, we, we want to encourage that. We want to host a statewide diversity pre-law summit aimed at minority undergraduate students interested in law school. There was a story yesterday, you might have seen it, uh, the, the statistics throughout the state and in Dallas and in Houston. Throughout the state, 10% of attorneys in Texas are Hispanic, yet Hispanics total 40% of the population of the state. Creation of a diversity council. The Office of Minority Affairs has requested the creation of a standing group that is recognized by the state bar that includes designees of the affinity groups and committees for example, the diversity in the, in the profession that, that will meet regularly to support DEI initiatives. Lisa Tatum, I have this, she mentioned this in one of our meetings and I have it in the back of my head. She says, if we don't make this permanent, nothing good will come from this. This is one way we can make it permanent. Administrative recommendations. Expand collected demographic information. Consider expanding demographic information collected and reviewed by the bar of its membership to include LGBTQ community and other information involving a broader scope of information. This is something that's been asked for and the section is asking for it and I believe that it's, it's important for the section to be able to properly represent, represent its members. An expansion of state bar policy to mandate the active recruitment of diverse attorneys in the highest level of the bar board and committee service including the position of state bar president. There are, many, there are many other recommendations that are in the report. I don't want to take up too much of your time. You have the report, and I encourage each of you all to review, to review it. If you have any questions, uh, you, you can ask me now, or if you have any questions, you can send them to me later. I'm sure most of you all have my email, or you can get it. I have to tell you that it, it has been my privilege serving as chair of this task force. We had some contentious meetings as well. Um, some of it kind of broke down into, into uh, areas of uh, the older people in the committee and the younger people in the committee, but that's fine. We, we listened. Uh, I've been very impressed with their dedication um, of each one of the members of the committee in improving the bar's effort in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it was my honor, like I said, to, to uh, share that, that uh, task force. And thank you for your time. Yes, Director Fisher. Yes, um, <clears throat> first, and I think Joe wasn't here, and the new members weren't here, but we voted, on, I, I wrote a resolution to change the Texas Lawyers Creed and to put in protections for women, minorities, uh, gays, disability, and I think I left out religion. And I want to thank Joe and, and Sylvia for three things. One, for letting me speak to your com committee, no time limits, and talk about it, and two, I've read the report, and you took that amendment I, uh, I wrote, that change in the lawyer's creed, and you made it a lot better. I really like the wording you put in there, where for each lawyer, I will, instead of my general things. And the third thing I'd like to thank you for is for saying bless you to that poor person that sneezed. But really, that, that, that was good work. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you all very much. As you can see, I hope you all take the time to re review the report. And you can see there's, if you all remember way back when, when we started down this path, I told you it was always my vision to have a group of lawyers help me to come up with the presidential year initiatives. And um, they 
far exceeded that. And, it, and it, if you notice, it's dovetailing with other things. You'll start hearing from the MCLE committee. These are all, we're all arriving at the same conclusion with different groups. And I think that, that, that we're, that's where we'll go and we can move, that's our way forward to see, you know, step at a time, we're gonna make some incremental change here. Um, which leads me then to my motion. So I, um, and actually it's gonna be threefold. We're trying to be efficient. So it's a motion to uh, request that we continue the diversity, equity, and inclusion task force um, for my presidential year. Um, and then the presidential task force on criminal court proceedings, which was discussed by um, Kenda, Kenda Culpepper when she made um, Larry's report, we definitely believe there's, there's a need and a value to, in continuing that work. We're still coming out of COVID, we got a lot of work to do. And I, I know at least, I, I was told that Justice Learman was very much in favor of the, continuing it as well. And then the last is the Texas Opportunity and Justice Incubator, also to be all three extended through December 31st of 2021. Interestingly enough, they all kind of relate to each other, so I, I'm, I would make a motion to in, um, extend all three through December 31st of 2021. There's been a motion, and Director Jason Smith has seconded. Any discussion? Seeing no hands, all those in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all. Thank you all very much for doing that, and we'll, you'll be hearing more in the coming months of which ones of the initiatives we're going to pick and highlight and bring back to you all for consideration. Um, also some other business, you all recall that the one of the duties of the president-elect and every other year is to chair the committee review task force. Um, when, we, when we met with the different committees, the disabilities issues committee spoke to me and I was actually the lawyer that, that interviewed them. Um, they asked to change their name to disability rights and issues committee. They thought that that was important in order to reflect the work that they really do. And unfortunately at that time, they hadn't voted on it. Um, and they, they voted afterwards, because I told them that, well you need to vote on it. And, and they voted um, and they did get approval. So we're a little out of sequence. It probably should have been part of that report, but, but rather than be sticklers and make them wait two years, I'm asking you to consider um, on behalf of the Texas Review, committee task force, I ask that you, the board approve changing the name of the Disability Issues Committee to the Disability Rights and Issue Committee. Need a second. Second. I think I saw Director Benny Augusto. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Sold. So fast. Okay. Well, thank you all very much, and I look forward to talking to you all more tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President-elect. We're excited for tomorrow and for your next year. With that, we will turn it over to item number 11 on your agenda, our report from our media past president, Mr. President Randy Sorrells. Randy. Okay, I have three things to talk to you all about, and I'll move pretty quickly through them. Uh, but they're mostly going to be reflections on being present over the last three years. So let me tell you quickly uh, what they are. Three pieces of advice. First, don't be afraid to take a chance. Step out of your comfort zone, run another race without fear of losing, or do something different. I'm gonna give you three examples. Uh, Trey Apfel stepped out of his comfort zone from League City in Galveston when he decided to run for president, elected to the State Bar of Texas. He had a great practice, he was thriving. Apfel's one of the best known names in Galveston. And he said, I'll take a chance and I'll run. And he got in a runoff and he won. He had a great tenure as president. Back to Galveston, builds up his practice again steps out of his comfort zone and said, I can do one more thing for the State Bar. And he applied to be Executive Director of the State Bar of Texas. He's been a great one because he can relate to solos, he can relate to you as the board member, he can relate to uh, uh, the lawyers that he served throughout the state. That's, that's a, an example of step out of your comfort zone. Sylvia Barunda Firth, boy, talk about getting into the bar uh, game late. I don't know how many years you were practicing when you decided to put your name in the hat. 30 years without doing organized bar work and says, I think I want to get involved. Puts her name in the hat. She's our next president of the State Bar of Texas. Justice Deborah Lehrman, really comfortable job in her hometown of Fort Worth. Uh, going to be elected forever, be comfortable. 
Why not to try to do something bigger? What a family law specialist going to the Texas Supreme Court? You have to be bold. Step out of your comfort zone. Try to do something uh, more than you think you can do. Second, you need to have a plan and be persistent and consistent and be flexible. Uh, Charlie mentioned Larry McDougal uh, showing up in the face of a rocky start. Larry mentioned having a rocky start. But what he did was he persisted on the task forces that he brought up, continued to work throughout the year, uh, put in work groups late in the game to try to help lawyers. Lawyers first, lawyers first, lawyers first. All he tried to emphasize was lawyers first, trying to make a difference. And I agree, he did have a great year uh, as far as what he accomplished after a rocky start. And then he addressed it and he made his weakness a strength bringing uh, Rob into the game, saying, let's include diversity. Let's talk about diversity. He didn't go backwards like many people thought. He didn't keep the bar at the same level. He raised the discussion. He raised the, uh, the bar. And now Sylvia is prepared to run with it. So he's done a great job. Uh, the, the, the one thing I also want to mention about your incoming uh, president-elect is someone I've known for several decades now, Laura Gibson. She's a planner. She's consistent. She's persistent. She has a plan to implement the plan. That's the type of planner Laura is. These little bottles uh, that you see uh, spread around, those are Laura Gibson reaching out to you all early on. But one thing she also is is she's a listener. And both she and Larry did listen to what people have to say. And if you listen and you adapt and you're flexible, you're going to have a great bar year. And that's what we have with coming up with Laura because I know that. And speaking of two listeners, one of them isn't here today. It's Jerry Alexander. He's a statesman. I can say that because he's a little bit older than me. Uh, in our first Zoom meeting that we had, which was early on, he was the only one in a three-piece suit. He looked great with a matching mask. He was wonderful. He listened. And then I'm going to stop for a second, and I want you all to recognize what, who won't get recognized maybe until tonight is the other great listener, the only one of us who developed a nickname throughout the year. You know who I'm talking about. The Double T. Stand up, Double T, because we're going to stand up for you. Stand up. Texas Treasure. Give him a round of applause. He, he did that because he was one of the youngest chairs we've had, and he got us through the start of a bar year where people, lots of people, focus their eyes and attention on the bar, and we had a leader at the helm who got us through rough, rough waters in a pretty safe fashion. He improved the image of the bar by the way he handled himself and the way he handled us, some of whom were pretty opinionated, for sure. So that, let me go to the third point uh, that I want to talk to you about, is this diversity effort really does make a difference. Um, we're listening to people, we're hearing what they have to say, um, Joe mentioned it, uh, certainly we're better as a result. Some of the things about listening, I listened to Catherine in her invocation, talked about it. Derek mentioned it. We are strong-willed uh, people in this room. We are opinionated. Um, not everybody agrees with our position, and we don't agree with everyone else's position, but I encourage you to listen as Charlie and Jerry have uh, showed us uh, what to do. So with that, I'll tell you, I'm not being rude over there with two computers and, and, a, uh, and an iPhone that's working. Um, I'll tell you why in a second. I tried to follow that advice. My wife had been telling me for a couple years, you've been at the same firm for a while. The people ahead of you by the name, they have been dead for a while. Why not step out of your comfort zone, finish your bar year, and start your own firm? And that really worked on me. And so we said, decided to do so. We were going to grow slowly. My wife is Hispanic. We were going to focus on diversity, and we were pretty excited about that. Then the plan turned into a change because a case gets called to an in-person jury trial in Houston with a well-known uh, son and godson of a player named Roger Clements, seven-time Cy Young Award winner. It was live-streamed, and people knew Roger were going to was going to testify, so people watched the trial. At some point in time, when I was trying to extend my, my client's mental anguish claim, and he's very quiet, the godson of Roger, um, my wife is in the courtroom watching, and I said, how did this injury affect you? 
and he was a very quiet individual. He leaned forward and he said, I got emotional. <laughs> we need emotional damages. That was his stance. I got emotional. My wife said, we go out on our own in your first trial, you're going to get poured out in front of thousands of people who are watching, and there were thousands watching. Can we get our expenses back, she said. Well, as it turns out, uh, the jury decided that his emotional, because actually he did, he ended up crying two additional times, two times on the stand. The jury loved him. They gave uh, him every penny we asked for, 30 times the offer that the insurance company made, three times our demand of the policy limits uh, of a million dollars. It's a great start to a January, February. We had to get flexible because our slow growth turned into people saying, hey, I want to come work with you. Can I do that? What do you bring to the table diversity-wise? We now have seven lawyers. We're getting ready to hire an eighth. We have people of different color, different gender, different, different sexual orientation. And that goes to what I'm doing now is I'm listening a lot more. So I encourage you all, as you go out to mentor, listen from the young people who work with you. I listen to what they have to say. I'm becoming a better lawyer as a result. So while my soapbox on this level ends, do something bold for sure. Formulate a plan and build in flexibility and go out and listen. Go out and listen to what your constituents have to say and know that I'm listening because I want to hear what you all have to say. Come and talk to me. I want to hear about your firm, your practice, your growth, and more about the State Bar. So with that, uh, my soapbox is gone, uh, but your all's is still standing strong and, and, and keep speaking from it. Thank you, Charlie. The great encourager, Randy, thank you for your encouragement, your wisdom, and your mentorship. Thank you for being a leader that listens to everybody, makes everybody feel special wherever you go. We're looking forward to seeing what happens over the next couple of years, and we wish you the very best of luck. Um, do you have a report for us on the uh, nominations and elections? <laughs> So Jerry should be giving this, but he's in trial, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's in trial, in case you all are wondering where Jerry is. Talk about having a plan and need to be flexible. Uh, as you know, the 2021 state bar election season's been successfully completed. Uh, the second election conducted under pandemic um, conditions. Some would say it was a great turnout for the conditions. Others would say it's a terrible turnout. It wasn't enough. We have to encourage uh, votes and voters to come out. When you have the first race, two years ago under pandemic conditions end in a 37 vote difference, was it 37? The next race this year, Laura, how many votes difference? 206. I mean, votes matter. If we can't use this to encourage people to vote, we've got to figure out a different way to get to folks uh, to, to tell them to vote. And you may say, and Steve Fisher will go out and say, you all need to vote, it makes a difference. And, and others who are on the other side of the uh, state will say, you all need to vote, it makes a difference. So please get out and get people to vote. So congratulate, congratulations to Sylvia and Laura on their wins, but they also had great opponents who were, who were uh, wonderful candidates and ran wonderful races. Pablo and Sarah Dysart from San Antonio, they won great races. 20,000 people voted. That's about 19% of our, uh, our, our constituency. 24% were paper ballots, 76 were electronic. Just to give you some idea, we're going more towards electronic. We're not out of there yet. My request is we get to electronic sooner than later because the paper ballots cost us tens of thousands of dollars, but we know we want to encourage voters. We have to weigh that versus um, trying to save money. There were 10 new direct, direct, district directors that were elected. Those are in your uh, board effect of your newly elected uh, board members. Uh, Laura Gibson, I'm going to use her one last time. She would say uh, to the, the organization she's run, you as an experienced member need to go find five or six people to go introduce yourself to you don't know. So to you all, uh, second and third year director, directors now, your challenge tonight is to go introduce yourself to five complete strangers you don't know that are first year directors and welcome them to the bar. It's a great ride for three years and uh, 
make sure that they have a friend or colleague they can sit with uh, and talk about the bar at any time. Uh, Director Schramick, while Director Schramick is coming up, we're going to be on item number, I guess, 12B, our policy manual subcommittee, and looking forward to hearing from Director Schramick. It was a lot easier when I could just unmute myself, right? <laughs> Uh, and I don't know about Jerry Alexander, but I'm missing the gym shorts and tennis shoes right now myself, but that's, that might be disclosing too much. Uh, all right, so we're here, we have four voting items. I wanna keep this as fast as possible because allegedly we have about 50 more minutes in this meeting, right? Uh, we'll see how that goes. So the policy committee um, met a lot of times this year. We had more meetings than I think anyone would have ever anticipated, uh, leading of course out of the special meeting, board meetings we had uh, at the beginning of last year, uh, leading all the way up to about two weeks ago when we had our final meeting in which we brought multiple groups together. So today I have four voting items. The first two are what I call the cleanups. The issues in the policy committee that people have identified as problematic, not matching actual practice, and or that actual practice is better than what the policy uh, manual might say. And then the other two have to do with more substantive issues relating to our diversity and inclusion initiatives. So I'd like to start with the first voting item. Um, if you are following along and you have your PDF open, it's page 155 of 332 pages. That's our big PDF if you download that from the Board of Facts. <clears throat> and the first one I think is relatively simple. Uh, it has three parts to it. This is one motion, three parts to it. The first is to add to the policy manual two pro bono awards that we've been giving out that aren't listed in the manual. So I think this is a pretty much of a no-brainer. Those awards include the Judge Merrill Hartman Pro Bono Judge Award, awarded to a judge who has outstanding pro bono initiatives and practices. And the other is a Pro Bono Support Staff Award for folks who aren't attorneys like paralegals, administrative assistants, interpreters, uh, who are helping and providing their time free of charge to help pro bono initiatives. Pro bono is near and dear to my heart. I'm the chair of our firm's National Pro Bono Committee. And so I think it's great that the more recognition we could give and the more we can do to incentivize pro bono work. The second part of this first motion, has to do with term limitations for the ABA delegates. Uh, it currently said that the ABA delegates term, maximum term, is uh, six consecutive years period. And the problem we have is if there is no one who has been selected as a successor, you know, what do we do then? And so the practice has been what most board uh, manuals say and most, you know, board of directors policies say is, or until a successor is appointed. And so that's just a clean up to go if there's nobody who's been appointed, no one's been, whatever reasoning, someone can go on past that until their successor is appointed. And the final thing has to do just with really cleanups relating to the agenda and minutes. Um, it has some language that kind of is outdated, such as uh, materials being delivered to board members. You know, and there's some argument, well, what does that mean? So language like provided, so that we can do by email, you know, ho however it's provided and also allowing materials as they become updated may be provided to members less than seven days if additional materials become available. It's really just a wording issue. There is no substantive change, but it's something that staff suggested to make it clearer. So those are the three items. And at this point, uh, Chair Ginn, I would like to make a motion to adopt those changes to the policy committee manual. Need a second. second. Diane St. Ives, Director St. Ives is our second. Any opposed, excuse me, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, the second uh, uh, changes um, are uh, also kind of cleanups, but a little more substantive. So let's talk about those. Uh, th the second one has to do about when members of section reps to the board don't have voting authority on matters um, coming before the executive committee and this board, uh, but those members can make and second motions at a member of the executive committee or a board. So again, we have section committee here leaders, they can make or second motions, they can't vote, they don't have the voting power, but it allows them to participate in the discussions and to make motions. This is a practice that was recommended, uh, supported by not only the policy committee, but the executive committee, um, and that's what that first part of two has to do with. The second part of two has to do with an immediate past chair. Charlie, you're about to learn a lot about this. 
uh, an immediate past chair, uh, we're adding or suggest adding a provision that similarly says, while the immediate past chair has no authority to vote on matters coming before the executive committee or the board, that that chair may make and second motions at any of those. Additionally, that immediate past chairs may be appointed by the current chair uh, as a member uh, of a chair of a, of a committee. And that when serving on any board committee other than the executive committee and budget committee, the immediate past chair shall be counted towards a quorum for those committee meetings. So it's essentially taking what we've been doing, which is relying on the past chairs for a lot of their expertise and their guidance and value in sections and executive committee meetings, and actually formalizing saying, you can make and second a motion and we're gonna count you towards the quorum for that meeting. So though that is the second uh, voting item on the agenda. And at this time, I would like to make a motion to adopt those changes. Coming from the committee, it does require a second. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. So those first two is what I call kind of the general cleanups, the fix things to make it you know, match practice. Everyone is, uh, who's been involved in bylaw amendments, you read them and you go, is that really what the bylaws say? And we don't do that, right? How many has had that experience? Uh, the next two have to do with our diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, the first one I wanna focus on is item number three. And it has to do with the uh, selection of president-elect candidates and the vetting of those candidates. As you all remember, this was an item that was uh, suggested and sent to the uh, policy committee uh, arising out of the special meetings. I believe at our last meeting, I previewed both this item and item four and asked for comments so that we could get it into the best shape possible. And uh, to let you know, this third item not only went through the uh, policy committee, it then went to the nominations and elections committee. They had some edits. It went back, Janine, I know she came, came back to the policy committee and Santos came back to the policy committee in order to go through their changes and ultimately arrived at what is uh, in your packet, the policy manual revisions relating to 2.0107 and 2.0109. What 2.0107 says, and I'm gonna just read to you the addition, it's one relatively simple addition, which is that this subcommittee shall perform the due diligence it deems appropriate on each nominee it intends to submit to the board. Why is that important? Well, first of all, I was kind of surprised to find out if you read through our policy committee, in theory, the, the nominating committee doesn't have to do any due diligence. In theory, they don't even have to interview anyone. In theory, they could pick randomly a resume and send it to us, to the board, and go, here are the people we recommend. In practice, that doesn't happen, right? It's a very important committee. They do a lot of research, et cetera. What this does is to make sure that we have in our rules a statement that the due diligence shall be performed before the nominees are sent to us to vote at the board level. So that's the first change. The second change has to do um, with uh, the scheduling of candidate forums. We had an argument over, should they be called town halls? Should they be called? But scheduling of candidate forums is what we ultimately arrived on. And this really adopts um, what some of the metro bars did this past year, right? Because of COVID, they had these um, Q&A sessions with the candidates. Um, uh, you were allowed to log in, you could ask questions. And so we want to institutionalize that. We, want, we propose having under the amendment to at least two candidate forums every year. And at those candidate forums, it's important, and we put it in the policy manual, that lawyers are allowed to ask questions directly of the candidates. So on the one end, we're gonna be having, making sure that we, as a board, only vote on folks who have, who have had due diligence done on them. And on the second, before any Texas attorney votes, they will have the opportunity to ask directly a candidate any question they want that they think is relevant, right? Do you think the sky is blue or green? Thank you, that was my question, that's all I wanna. Whatever you wanna know, you're a voter, it's a town hall. The nominations and elections committee will find the way to implement that. I'm sure there's gonna be trial and error as to what works best. Uh, but at the end of the day, it says we're gonna have these candidate forums and we're gonna give everyone an opportunity to ask the questions they want. I love the Texas Bar Journal interview articles, but they're like an interrogatory. They've had 30 days to answer them, and they really don't get to that question, answer that I wanted answered, right? So this allows you to ask the question. You're not prepared, whatever you wanna know, right? So I think combining these two items gives both this board and gives the lawyers of Texas the ability to do their own due diligence before they cast their vote, and hopefully 
will actually lead to better engagement. I know an issue we've all been talking about. So with that, I would like to propose the third voting item, the changes to the policy manuals relating to selection of candidates and the announcement of candidates and scheduling of candidate forms. Coming from the committee, it doesn't require a second. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing none, seeing none, all those in favor, please respond by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. The final voting item we probably spent the most time on in the last nine to 10 months. We had countless meetings and we went all over the map. Um, and that has to do with a code of conduct for this board, right? The code of conduct started, I think, about 15 pages. It's down to two and a half. So that tells you that we did a lot of thought, a lot of reflection, a lot of whittling down, and we had to strike a balance. We had to strike a balance as to have meaning, something that you could enforce, but also not to, to, to make sense that it, the, the items we were going to enforce, right? It couldn't be so broad, it didn't have any meaning, and it couldn't be so narrow that it, you know, reads as some punitive rule of code, right? And so what we ended up doing was really stating the broad principles. The first thing we did, of course, was incorporate the current code of conduct that applies to every a lawyer in Texas that comes to a Texas bar CLE or event. We make that applicable to this board and our meetings, right? Which makes sense, it's ready written, it's been implemented for the past few years. And then we add a few things uh, onto the top of that, including making sure that you know we don't have um, meetings in which there are people harassing, intimidating, degrading, or humiliating others, right? This is a code of conduct. It's not aspirational, it's the things that we as required as board members to do. This has been vetted not only by the policy committee for several months at this point, it went to the executive committee for review and recommendation, and it went to you all at the last meeting to provide comments. There were comments provided, and we made a few edits. Uh, at this point, we believe that this code of conduct is strong, is good, and is uh, ready to be implemented, and therefore, I would make the fourth voting item for adopting the code of conduct. Coming from the committee, doesn't require a second. Is there any discussion on this item? I have a question for the legal counsel. Okay, let me hear let me hear Director Fisher first. Uh, not Fish, I'm sorry, Director Smith and Director Fisher. We'll hear from Director Smith and then we'll go to we'll go to your question later if that's okay. I, th I think you've done great work. I can tell there's a lot of work uh, been done on this. I the one friendly amendment I would offer is in subsection D uh, on the last line where it says shall not engage in behavior intended to harass, intimidate, degrade, or humiliate. I would add the word discriminate at the beginning of that series of words, but uh, it's great work. Thank you. All right, and Director, excuse me, Mr. President, sure. did you have a question? I have a question, Council? Mr. Fisher, our general counsel. Mr. Fisher, in light of the case of Wilson versus Houston Community College going to the Supreme Court, do you have any recommendations whether we should hold on this at this time or the enforceability of the punitive actions under subsection F under that case? Yeah, for those of you, I think everybody's aware that uh, there's a case, the Houston Community College System versus uh, David Wilson. The Supreme Court has granted cert on the U.S. Supreme Court, and they'll be ruling on that in the near future. And it deals with, it's a Fifth Circuit case, appeal from the Fifth Circuit case, and it deals with the ability of a public board to censure one of its members. So I think that this is a changing area of the law. I think we certainly have the, the right to adopt a code of conduct, and I'll just be aware that the adoption of the code of conduct isn't likely to invite any, any legal issues, but its enforcement might, so we just need to keep an eye on that case, and if you decide to adopt this today, well, it would be important to come back and revisit the enforcement uh, provision, subsection E, depending on what the Supreme Court does. Uh, if you decide to not adopt this today or pursue it later and wait to see what the Supreme Court does. I think that's defensible too, but just be aware that <clears throat> the enforcement issue is out there and we're gonna have to likely revisit it and look at it depending on what the Supreme Court does. And let me add real quick for context, because again, I was trying not to go through all the mechanisms. Uh, we had this reviewed uh, multiple times uh, by uh, our general counsel, John Sermon, our legal counselor, and Mr. Leatherberry, our outside counsel. So we would not be proposing anything that we had any concerns with about the legality. I agree there could be a future case that makes this change. Uh, and also this does not, there's a savings clause in here that says nothing in this uh, code of conduct 
will limit any person's free speech rights and should not be interpreted as such. So I, I think that covers that base. Director Forbes or Director yes, Calvillo, whichever. Yes, thank you. Uh, twice today, I've been called for Yeah, sure. sorry, so, it's I my am bad. Lucy Forbes, okay. Sorry, Lucy. No, no, you didn't, that's okay. Okay, uh, first, I fully support the spirit and intent of this code of conduct for equal access to justice, high standards of ethical conduct, and to promote diversity in the administration of justice and the practice of law. Where my concerns come in are in the details. Uh, I have a question about whether this board has authority to promulgate rules. When I read the State Bar Act, section 81.020, section 81.024, and when I read the state bar rules, Article 4, Section 1, Subsection D, uh, I have a concern whether this is consistent. Second, uh, Subsection D is not broad enough. I believe that our aspirations should extend to everyone. I would like to add at the end, or any person. So make it broader. My third point. Uh, I have very significant <coughs> concerns about subsection E, enforcement, and F, corrective action. This director disciplinary scheme is vague, and in its enforcement might be unconstitutional. For this, I'm relying on the U.S. Supreme Court cases of Becerra and Button and the Fifth Circuit case, which Mr. Ross Fisher just mentioned, HCC versus Wilson, and the oral argument in our own case. So uh, in conclusion, our work towards diversity, equity, and inclusion for every member of the bar and the public must continue, but we need to do it right. So I, I would like to make a motion. I would like to commend for our general counsel to review the code of conduct. I'm making this under the access to services protocol of September 28, 2018. Uh, I commend the committee. This is phenomenal work and our work is not done. So I, I would like for our, Mr. Fisher to give us a formal report based on my concerns. On what basis? There is a motion on the table. We can't, you got it. Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure I understand. So but to understand your motion, Lucy, just for the record was to have Ross Fisher bring a formal report, correct? That's right. I do find your motion out of order at this time. There's a motion on the floor. Okay, so what do I do? Because I want my motion. <laughs> Hell of a question. Good. You are going to hear it, so tell Hell me how. Question. Let's start this first. Uh, Jason, you're, because you're asking for a friendly for a motion that's coming out of a committee, I don't know that Adam can technically accept the friendly amendment on his own. I think I need to have someone second your friendly so then we can add it that way. Does that make sense? Sure. So do I, have a, do I have someone that seconds? Jason's initial friendly amendment to add the word, you said to add the word diversity, Jason? Discrimination. Discrimination, pardon me. Discrimination. That seems fair. What's, you, all right, I got a second, Director Scott. Um, do what, Ross? So I can, and, it's, and it is yeah. acceptable to the chair, right? So, yeah. So the, the um, I hear some questions here. The, the language at issue, is the last uh, uh, part of D, so little d, diversity, equity, inclusion. The Senate states, um, board members shall not engage in behavior intended to harass, intimidate, degrade, or humiliate others based on these characteristics. And the, and the uh, friendly amendment is to add or discriminate against others based on, these, based on these characteristics, which ties back to characteristics protected by applicable federal, state, or local law and for context, everything that is listed prior to that reference is currently protected by applicable federal, state, or local law, which was our guiding principle in this section. 
So with the friendly amendment being to add the word discriminate, which I think in context is not in any way materially changing this, I, I, I accept the friendly amendment. Lucy, to answer your question, while there's a motion on the table, you can't bring a new motion unless it's a motion to table or a motion to refer back to the committee. Okay. So if you want to make one of those two motions, you may, but other, you can't make a new motion that's outside of the one that's being made right now. Okay. Can I make a friendly amendment? What is it? To add at the, <laughs> oh, it depends. <laughs> okay. To add at the end of D or any person. I want it broader. We, we, every single member of the bar and member of the public deserves the same respect. I want to add uh, to make it broader or any person. To be clear, your, the friendly amendment is to ask to add any person to what part of the motion? So, oh, okay. Board members shall not engage in behavior intended to harass, intimidate, degrade or, hum or humiliate others based on these characteristics or towards any other person. Just make it broader. Cover everyone. Okay. Um, and then I still want to make my table motion, whatever it's called. I still want to do that. Fair, you just let enough. me know how to table the, the All right, thing. fair enough. All right, so I guess we would add the words or any person to the end of that. I guess do you okay. accept that friendly. Um, uh, with all due respect, Lucy, I understand your point and no person should ever be discriminated against for anything, um, but I do not accept that because of the spirit of this code of conduct is focused on protected rights under state, federal, and local law and making sure that we are following that law and that we are following it as a board and making sure that we are not committing unlawful, essentially, discrimination, harassing and abusing people based on those protected characteristics. So, Director Forbes, knowing that, so do you want to make a motion to either, ref you said to table or refer to committee, which one would you like to well, make? Either we oppose it or we table it. Well, I need to know what your motion is. So. I want to make a motion to oppose this or ta actually to table it. Okay. I, I do believe in its spirit. It's just in the details. So you want A to motion to table that we don't vote on this. All right, so your motion is to table this motion that's been presented to the board, correct? The code of conduct, yes. All right, do I have a second? Second. All right, Director Fisher seconds. All those in favor to table this motion concerning the Code of Conduct, say aye. Should we discuss it? Should we have discussion? Can we have discussion? Sure, we can have discussion. Go ahead. Okay, Go so. Go ahead, Director Calvillo, I apologize. So I'm still standing here. Oh, uh, I thought you were just holding the microphone. I apologize. Number Director one, Calvillo, it's all you. Holding, holding the microphone for my good friend here. Job. But this, but also, uh, my, mine is a more, uh, more of a mere inquiry, and that is to, to Director Shremek. Uh, you talked about honing this down from 15 pages to, to 12 pages, or to two, two and a half pages. And I think you've done a very good job. It, it reads very elegant. What I wanted to know, and maybe this, this discussion is, is useful for both motions, and that is the process of honing it down. What did you examine? I, I know that, for example, there's, there's an impeachment uh, provision in, in the State Bar Act and other related acts, and I know you considered those, and I think it might be informative to us to, to be apprised of that process that you did to, to, to hone it down to what it is. Before so, you answer that, Adam, Just a mere inquiry. Before you answer that, yeah, a Come table on, motion is not up. I'll Come on. Hold all right. There we go. Hold no. on. Director. All right. I got it. Hold um, on. Hold on. A, a tabled motion is not up for discussion. A tabled motion, we hear it without any discussion. So the motion has been. What, uh, what about an a friendly amendment to Director the table Fisher, motion? Director Fisher, we're going to take the, the table motion first. So just give me a second, all right? all right? So the motion was made by Director Forbes to table the motion concerning the code of conduct. Director Fisher seconded. All those in favor of tabling the code of conduct motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Does not pass. So we can now talk about your friendly amendment, Director Fisher. <laughs> All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, That's, uh, no, hold, hold, hold. Well, no, Director Fisher, sorry. Just hang uh, on for me, brother. In fact, would you do me a favor? Would you put that microphone in the stand, please? I, I like the way David was. was I know was it, but it's, people, you know? it's making some noises and it's hard to hear. So you're calling for a roll call vote? Thank you very much. Director, uh, excuse me, Mr. Executive Director, can we have a roll call vote on this issue? And um, Charlie, Mr. Ginn, may I clarify? I want to table it until we get more guidance from the U.S. Supreme Court in the HCC versus William case. So, uh, if I may. I understand. Thank you. Your and that was my friendly amendment. You got it. Only until 
the courts rule. Thank you, Director Fisher. I appreciate it. All right, the tables, the motion's been made for the table. A call for roll call vote has been made. Mr. Executive Director, will you please call roll? Uh, thank you. Mr. Augusto. Aye. Mr. Allison. Aye. Mr. Almanzan. Aye. Mr. Baruch. Aye. Ms. Bim. Aye. Ms. Brooker. Aye. Mr. Cavillo. Aye. Mr. Luis Cardenas. Aye. Mr. Cook. Mr. Crane. Aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. Mr. Dawson. Aye. Ms. Hernandez Ferrier. Ms. Barunda Firth. Mr. Fisher. Ms. Forbes. Mr. Ginn. He'll hold. Ms. Goldsberry. Mr. Gravely. Mr. Harris. Ms. Harrison. Ms. Humphrey. Mr. Hurst. Ms. Cortez Matas. Mr. McDougall, Ms. Cara Miller, Ms. Mount, Mr. Naylor, Ms. Rispoli, Mr. Shramick, Ms. Scott, Mr. Sergi, Mr. Sims, Mr. Jason Smith, Mr. Todd Smith, Mr. Sorrells, Ms. St. Ives, Aye. Mr. Tolchin, Mr. Vargas, Aye. Mr. Vasquez, Aye. Ms. Welburn, Aye. Mr. Wester, Ms. Pack Wilson. Aye. So under the rules that we can see, it requires a table requires a majority and not a two thirds. I do not think that we that the table motion passes. It does not. So motion to table does not pass. So was there a friendly director Fisher that you had? I have a question to ask. You can ask it if you I'm gonna answer David's question. Oh, okay. but that's fine. Yeah. Who's Adam, okay. okay. I have some good oh, I hate this thing. I have some concerns because I think your heart's in the right place and it always has been. But you mentioned a couple of things, and I'm wondering how this, which is borders on censorship, um, I wonder how this would affect people who, have, who might say and publicly disagree with the bar, as I do on certain issues. You mentioned the Texas Bar Journal, and I'm not sure you were around or aware, but when candidates that were perceived as reform or anti-bar, like me when I ran, and Joe Longley, they edited and opinionized and added stuff to the Texas Bar Journal. And I think that was the downfall of, it, it worked against me, but when Joe Longley ha had it and people just erupted. So I wanna know, if I say that, that Larry turned his back on criminal defense lawyers in one of these groups and, and they're agreeing with me, is that, I mean, is, would that uh, qualify as, as conduct that, that's bad because I'm criticizing another officer? Thanks, Steve, for that question. Um, sure. And of course, as I mentioned, this was a nine to 10 month process and we went through multiple iterations and due diligence. And David, I'm gonna answer your question too, uh, just a second. Um, no, it doesn't, because if you look at page one, it's underlined for emphasis. And this was one of the important things we put in the beginning, that this code of conduct only applies when participating in the affairs of the board and its committees and its sections. We are, did not touch the issue of social media personal social media usage comments. This is about when you're at a board meeting, an official committee meeting, an official uh, uh, participating in a group like this, that's only when it applies to this board of con code of okay. conduct. And, and Maybe so a future board will want to broaden it, but starting now, we're taking a small step forward and moving in the direction of having a code of conduct, which is good corporate governance. And to get to David's question, which was what did we do? How did we whittle it down? We started by looking at what do other bars do. We looked at what do nonprofits do as a guide for their board members who have a fiduciary duty to the organization. And so we started with a lot of those broad clauses that you probably have seen in your nonprofit documents about the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, the duty, all those sorts of duties. 
and we ultimately concluded none of that really should fit into this code of conduct. We're, you know, we are different, we're not a nonprofit, we are, you know, a quasi-governmental entity, we have various responsibilities, and so that's why we did things such as, if you look at section C, compliance with laws, rules, and regulations, board members shall comply with all laws, rules, and regulations applicable to the state bar. And if you don't, this body can enforce that, that you have violated a rule. So for example, you can have criminal liability for disclosing information taking an enclosed session. I think that this board should also be able to enforce a violation of a closed session discussion and not just say, well, we'll see what the prosecutors do about it. Well, maybe it's clear or not. This is simply saying we are going to govern our own board by clearly applicable standards and by uh, what I believe is a completely 100% uh, lawful document. We went through multiple levels of attorney review. Uh, uh, not only did we have the review of outside counsel, we had the review of the members of the, of the committee who did their own legal research and, and review. So could something happen in the future that we have to revisit this issue? Sure, is this legal today? I wouldn't be pre presenting it to you if I didn't believe 100% that it's legal, enforceable, and the right thing to do. Hey, Adam, thank you. Thank you, really. Thank you, Director Fisher. Director Smith, Director Forbes, either one. And Director Calvillo, did that answer your question, sir? No, that happened. Hold up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Director Smith. All I have to say is I know uh, Adam has done a good job of explaining what the committee did on this, all the things the committee looked at. These are all genuine issues. These are all things that the committee looked at and revised the policy to try and to take those into accommodation. The issue of, of, of uh, the general counsel's given us his guidance on what we need to be careful looking forward, it's not what's in here now. That deals with if a situation were to come up where we would need to take action under this, at that point we would have to look at, well, what's going on with the case at the Supreme Court? Have they ruled? Have they limited what we can do? But that doesn't affect, uh, as, as far as I understood the comments, uh, our ability to use this as it is. I think this is a great first step. It's great guidance to all of us on what's expected, and if it, we ever get to the point where action needs to be taken, we, we need to do some, some checking then, as we always should. But I think this is a really good first step, and, and the issues that are being raised by everyone are ones that I know that the committee looked hard at. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Smith. Director Forbes. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you all can hear me because I'm, I'm petite, okay? Uh, I guess I'll hold it, okay. Now, at least in the version that I have, uh, the code refers to a social media guideline that to my knowledge does not exist. It's in the first paragraph. So if we approve this, we're approving something and it incorporates a, a document I, I've never seen, and I searched. I think we do have that. We do have a social media guideline. Do we have a social media guideline? Andrew will know that. Can we ask Andrew? Yeah, Andrew. Hey, Andrew, do we have a social media guideline? I, I think it applies to committees such that they have to, can't say they're speaking on behalf of the board and things like that. Uh, so what we did is we took all existing board policies and put them in there just as the refrain. And, it, and what it says is, to give context to Ms. Director Forbes' comment, it says this code is not intended to override or conflict with any applicable laws or obligations pursuant to the State Bar Act, the State Boroughs, et cetera. So it's a no conflicts provision is all it is. Well, I mean, so yeah, I found the, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do this my phone. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know okay. how to do that. Okay, I found the events and conferences code of conduct. I could not find the social media guidelines. And because I'm concerned with the outstanding Supreme Court cases, when this refers to a social media guideline, let me do it, let me say it this way. I would like to make a motion for our general counsel to review this code of conduct. Still out of order. You're still out of order for the same reasons, Lucy. So again, there's a motion on the floor right now, and the only two motions that you can make, and I'm so sorry, I'm not trying to, to, to stop you. Well, I thought, I thought it was the right the, the only motions you can make where there's a motion on the floor right now is a motion to table, which we've had, right? Or you can make a motion to refer back to committee. Those are the two motions. Now, you cannot, because those directly relate to this motion that's on the floor. If you make a new motion that's separate and apart, right, you, that's out of order. So okay. you've made a motion to table. You are free to make a motion to send back to committee, 
but that's the only other motion you can make at this point. Well, I mean, I don't want to take up more time. I would just feel better if, if our general counsel reviewed it. So if you're saying it's not available as an option. So I can make a motion to send it back to committee? You can. Well, that won't answer the question. So, okay, then thank you. Well, it, it functionally is, but they're two, they're two different ones. That's right. So, Lucy, are you making a motion to send back to committee? I, I don't know what good it would do. I mean, I, I want legal counsel. Or I don't know what good that would do, so I guess not. Charlie, you had asked a question. I just wanted to answer it briefly. I'm not aware of any code of conduct related to social media. However, it should be noted that there used to be something along those lines for candidates that we stripped out about three or four years ago with rigorous study. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So maybe we need to take out any reference to that social media guideline that doesn't exist. Thank you, Lucy. Go ahead. So I talked to John, and apparently he said there's, there are definitely social media guidelines that apply to staff, and that might have been added when, when it was done. So if there's a friendly amendment to remove, again, it's a no-conflict provision, folks. It's really not even important. But if, if you want to do a friendly mo amendment to remove that, Ms. Forbes, um, I think that's something I'd entertain. I think it would be more clean because it doesn't that's exist as best as I know. Judge Forbes, do you have a friendly amendment to remove the social media sentence from the, from yes. the motion? Yes. Do I have a second? Director Calvillo seconds. Do you accept the friendly I amendment? I accept it. All right. Thank you. Thank Perfect. You, Mr. Schramm. Director, Madam President elect, Janine Rispoli. My apologies, Mr. Chair. I stepped out right before this vote, and in the electronic passing of notes of trying to figure out what the vote was, didn't understand that. So if I can please correct my vote on what we just did the roll call vote on to nay. We'll let the minutes reflect that. Thank and you very much. Thank you to both of you for handling this discussion in a very civil and respectful way. Thank you, Madam President. Electricity, we're excited for next year. Director Smith. I, I, just a, a question. Uh, there's, I believe this also has a provision uh, entitled uh, paragraph H, no prior restraint. Nothing herein shall preclude any board member from making comments that are protected as free speech under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution and under Article I, Section 8 of the Texas Constitution. Does that also provide uh, protection for, for uh, board members who are expressing an opinion protected by the First Amendment? Uh, absolutely, and we also put two levels of enforcement here. One, it goes to the ad hoc committee first for a discretionary call as to whether it rises to level violation. It then goes to the executive committee in which in their discretion to decide whether or not it's not only a violation, but a violation that should be proceed, that should proceed before it would ever get to this board. Uh, there's a discretion built into this to make sure that we are only going to be using it in the most egregious and obvious cases uh, that are clearly applicable. And so that was the intent behind it, and that's why we put in all the free First Amendment things, the no prior restraint, because this is not, has, this has nothing to do with speech. This has to do with conduct, and, and that is not protected. So we're, call the question. so we're gonna call the question. All those in favor, please respond by, to, with the amendments, friendly amendments applied, all those in favor, Please respond by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Motion passes. Is that the whole thing? Yeah. Okay. I Got believe it. so. Sorry. I was confused. I understand. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you to both committees that worked on this, and, and thank you for everyone that took it seriously. And Director Forbes, thank you for the work and for the uh, insight you had on this. I know that took a lot of time. Thank you very much. When, um, let's go to the next section, which is our annual meeting resolution. Uh, immediate past chair, Mr. Jerry Alexander, is not here today. So you get me. Uh, former president, uh, state bar president, Joe K. Longley, uh, among his friends known as Joe K., is here today. He has submitted a proposed resolution. It's included in your materials for consideration by the annual meeting resolutions committee. Typically, that committee meets during the state bar annual meeting. They hear it, they consider their resolutions, and then they make a report to the general assembly at the Friday luncheon. Because our in-person annual meeting was canceled, there will be no resolutions committee meeting or gen general assembly of membership. 
So the board will consider the adoption of this proposed resolution today. Come on up, President Longley. We're privileged to have Mr. Longley here with us today. I'm going to ask him to present his proposed resolution, and then I'll open the floor um, for possible action and any discussion that would go along with that. Mr. Longley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's great to see everybody uh, again. And I, there's a bunch of new folks here I haven't met yet, but I look forward to making your acquaintance and uh, working on behalf of the State Bar along with everyone here. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry that uh, Jerry's not here because Jerry Alexander and I, although we have our differences of opinion and have very little in common as a general rule, we do have one thing in common, and that is every night he and I and our grandchildren and our children get on our knees and pray for the solvency of the insurance industry. And so that's, uh, his is a little, his is a little different reason than mine, but I think uh, Charlie will understand this, the difference. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. This is a, this is a courtesy resolution, and uh, it's uh, honoring uh, or stating our gratitude for Representative Yvonne Davis of Dallas uh, and Senator Sarah Eckhart of Austin. And uh, both, uh, Sarah, uh, Yvonne has been a state representative now for I think 20, 28 years. And uh, she agreed to carry, uh, what is House Bill 2393? And that went through a committee of uh, nine members, seven of which were lawyers. Uh, it's the jurisprudence, uh, the uh, civil jurisprudence and, jur and jurisprudence uh, justice com uh, committee in the House of Representatives. It came out of that committee. Uh, she had a committee substitute, uh, which amended the original bill. And uh, it came out of that committee unanimously because it was so late in the session, it did not get on the consent calendar or, or get passed. But what, what it provides is a vehicle for discussion of many of the things we've discussed today, uh, diversity, uh, voter suppression, and candidate suppression. And uh, the way her bill approached it uh, was that, uh, as we all know, every one of us here who's a member of the bar, we've been a member of TYLA at one point in time. I think, uh, Charlie, you're, you're still a member. And so uh, as we age out of TYLA, uh, something happens. And that is we no longer get to vote in both of the statewide elections that put members on this board in the form of the officers of the of a state bar, as well as the officers of TYLA. So her bill would have corrected that in that it provided a, uh, a private cause of action for anyone harmed by discrimination, <clears throat> and it prohibited discrimination in any form, including age, religion, sex, whatever. Um, she took that part of the, uh, of the bill out in committee, and the committee was left with one purpose only, which was to reduce the number of signatures that would be required for someone to get on the ballot uh, who was not nominated by the nominating um, and elections committee. And right now, I'm sure many of you know, uh, that requirement is 5%, which interpolates out to about 5,360 signatures. Uh, my friend, Steve Fisher, who's back at the back mic here, he was able to obtain uh, those 5,300 signatures back when he was uh, collecting signatures to be nominated as a uh, petition candidate. He was successful. Um, I was later successful, inspired by Steve, uh, to get uh, the necessary number, and we both, we both ran for election as petition candidates. Uh, I stand before you as the only successful uh, candidate who, who has ever achieved uh, election under that, those circumstances, although Steve might well do it again and get elected. Uh, but in any event, I'm sort of the exception to the rule. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. It showed how diverse uh, our uh, bar can be and uh, what, what the, uh, what the, what's left of the bill is that the signatures would be, uh, the requirement would be lowered to 1% which if you do the math would be, we have 106,000 members, and the math would be somewhere around 1,060 signatures to get on the ballot. 
Uh, the benefit of that would be that we have more diversity in elections. We have people, uh, Steve Bolin was here earlier. Uh, he, he showed up, and I think Steve over there, um, he showed up, testified for the bill. Uh, uh, President McDougal uh, threw a card in in favor of the bill. Uh, I testified, Trey was there as a resource witness, he testified, and if you look at your, uh, at your materials under this 13B in your agenda, uh, you'll find those materials as to what uh, the testimony looked like before the committee and the actions of the committee. So this is a simple courtesy resolution thanking these two legislators for carrying this bill and for using it as a vehicle for diversity. And hopefully, uh, if it never gets passed, this board will take care of the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks. Before we have discussion on this, um, because uh, previous president, Mr. Joe Longley, is no longer a member of this board, um, for there to be discussion or any continuance, I would need a motion and then a second to go forward. Do I have a motion? All right, Director Gravely is our motion. Who is our second? Director Goldsberry is our second. So up for discussion. Director Fisher. Okay. Um, the first part of his motion and the, and the legislation, which I, I testified in the House for, is almost a no-brainer. If we say that we're a Democratic bar, having a 10-person or 15-person nomination committee, Trump, and I had 56, 22 signatures, um, is, is just undemocratic. And I disagree with Randy. Randy and I are friends, we always disagree. But the re one of the reasons why there's such a low turnout in the elections is, in the words of former Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court when he signed my petition, is that it's always Tweedledee versus Tweedledum. There is no substantial, every now and then a Larry comes along, or Joe, but there's no substantial difference in, in, in the candidate's position. Their personalities are different. They might have a different race. So that I'm for, and I believe, and Ross Fisher has never really gotten back with me on this, but when you guys made what Longley once wrote was the Stop Fisher Amendment to change what the legislature wrote and make it so that instead of a year or whatever, that you only have a certain amount of days to consider to get those signatures, I think that's wrong. I, I am not planning to run for bar president this year, but if I did, I'd get signatures now and challenge you guys. That part is good. Don't that, you mean that, us? But, but the other part, I strongly disagree with Joe. And what Joe wants to do is, I guess under voting rights, is allow all lawyers to vote in TYLA elections. And I think that's wrong. I don't think that's a voting right issue. I'm a geezer almost. And, and, I, and I love that the, the local... Um, and everywhere I've been, the, the, the young lawyers invite me because they, you know, just so that we can hang out. We don't even have to talk about bar issues. But I think older people have enough influence in the bar. I don't want to mess with, with, with young lawyers. The young lawyers do more for the public than the rest of us do. I mean, that's the best organization with, with the bar. We don't need to vote in, in that. I, I really strongly, he's great on number one, on number two. I, I really oppose that. Thank you, Director Fisher. Director Bim, before you start, I need to hear from, I'm going to start with Director Sylvia Varun DeFerth, and then I'll come right back to you. Is that okay? Thank you, Judge. Or, Judge. I like I'm that. so used to saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Muscle memory. You got a promotion. <laughs> if I could, I, I, I was almost going to say point of order, because I think we shouldn't be debating the the merits of the bill. I think we were here to talk about whether or not we wanted to recognize the two members of the legislature. But that being said, I'm one who is always, will take every opportunity to express gratitude to the people that work so hard for us. So what I'm going to say, I don't want to be perceived as a um, slight to the two members of the legislature. I personally have worked with Ms. Davis over many years. Um, and Senator Eckhart is a, a very valuable member of the Senate. So I, I don't want to say that, but I, but I do want to say that I have some concerns about the wording of the amendment, I mean of the resolution. Um, I think that it states facts that are not necessarily correct, 
events that didn't actually happen. And I think we're going down dangerous precedent if we allow to, cr to create a record of us approving a resolution that, that um, has those kinds of statements in it. Um, so I would suggest that, you know, it's certainly appropriate if we, if the body decides to express gratitude for them for their attention to our issue, but I would, I would entertain, I would hope to ex ex have um, opportunity to amend the resolution to remove some of those factual things that are not correct. I, I think we, as a, as a organization, need to be very careful with the bills that are at the legislature um, and they need to go through our process. This bill did not go through our legislative process um, and we cannot uh, begin to allow things to slip and, and avoid that. So uh, that's, that's my two cents. I, I, if I, I don't know that it would be a friendly amendment to say just change the language to just say thank you very much for your kind attention to this issue and, and be done with it. But all the other language about, it seems to imply that there's discrimination going on with regard to voting. Um, and finally, I think anything this important, and I've spoken to Mr. Longley about this, so, he, so he's not gonna be surprised to hear this, that I think it needs to be considered by the entire, if we're going to send any kind of amendment from 5% to 1% to whatever it is, it needs to be carefully vetted through this body, through, the, th through our appropriate committee. So that, that would be my, and I hate to say it, but my recommendation would be to vote against that motion. Director Ben, we're going to come to you, and then and then immediate past president, Mr. Randy Sorrells, then Director Smith, and then okay. President McDougal. Thank you, President. Thank you, Director Ben. Your Honor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My concern would be that a vote for this resolution would be a vote that would be used to do, to somehow say or imply that this board of directors supported this legislation in its form, and that that's something that um, I'm encouraging all of you not to do, and also that a vote for this resolution would be an indication by this board that we supported the essentially the removal of the age requirement in TILA elections. And so I sort of see it as a, as a vote denying the importance of TILA members being elected to this board and their contribution is invaluable. So I would encourage each of you to vote against this resolution. Thank you, Director Bim. Direct, uh, media past presidents, Mr. Sorrells. Yeah, very quickly, when you said that, uh, Kate, the four, three guys behind you all shook their heads yes. I, th I think, did you, Michael, as well? Okay, yes. the three. So I shake my head yes, too, and I agree with uh, Steve Fisher on this one as well. Director Smith. I would also say vote against this for the reasons given by the last two speakers. This is not our process. This is not a courtesy resolution. This is endorsing legislation that needed to go through the process and did not. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President McDougal. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a friendly amendment. I'd like to amend paragraph four, whereas, where it states, and I will read, whereas a question has arisen regarding potential age discrimination by the state bar in the conduct of the annual TYLA election to choose the TYLA president elect, I would like to ask that that be removed from the resolution as a friendly amendment. Mr. Long, do you accept the president friendly amendment? No. no. The, oh, the maker of the motion. Sorry, it's not Mr. Long. I apologize. Mr. Gravely, do you accept the friendly amendment? Okay. All right. Director Schrammick. Um, this is being put forward as a motion to thank legislators that were trying to help us out. How could anyone not vote against thanking our duly elected representatives when we all know that has nothing to do with how this motion would be used. And so with that, I would uh, oppose it and recommend everyone else too. Director Shamick, thank you. Director Wester. And I, my comment would be just going off of what Adam said. I'm questioning why we're thanking legislators for taking legislation forward that wasn't ours. Thank you, Director Wester. Yes, sir. You know, I had to be recognized first. I don't, well, I wasn't going to do it. I didn't want to. We're going to do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Everyone else got recognized. Director Naylor. Um, I would encourage everyone to vote against it. But I'm, my biggest thing is, even with this amendment, forgive me, Mr. President, this did not go through the process. I, I don't care if you're the past president or anybody else. You don't get to circumvent the process. 
this is a bill. It needs to go through our legislative process. I do wholeheartedly agree with President-elect. This, as reads, misrepresents a lot of facts. So I would encourage you to vote against it, and I would ask you to ask yourself, which several people have mentioned, is there an ulterior motive here? And I believe there is. So I would encourage everyone to vote against it. Thank you, Director Naylor. All right, questions called. Oh, I apologize. Director Gravely, do you second the friendly amendment? No. I thought she did. Yeah, I, I just but to be clear, I'm all for belt and suspenders. Yes, sir. All right, yep. All right. So with that, the question's been called. We'll start it with just a yay or nay. All those in favor, all right, I'm gonna say this. Listen to my listen to what I say here. All those in favor of passing the resolution with the friendly amendment. Please respond by saying aye. aye. All those in favor of opposing passing the resolution, please respond by saying nay. nay. Motion does not pass. All right. Next item on the agenda. I should say on the legislators, I know all of us here at the state bar, staff and directors appreciate and value so much what our legislators do for us every year and I know how grateful we all are to them and, and specifically the representatives that worked on this bill. We appreciate all your work. When we go to, let's see, number 14, Director Steve Naylor. And Director Crane, you're gonna be right after him if you don't wanna make the, whatever you wanna do, Steve. <laughs> Save everybody time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a follow-up to our, we, this is for the DCAP committee, this follow-up to our review of Rule 5.08 of the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct as requested by this board earlier in the year. The rule addresses prohibited discriminatory activities in connection with an adjudicatory proceeding. Our committee met with the Chief Disciplinary Counsel's Office to gather information and to discuss the state of the existing rule. The committee determined that there wasn't enough information or evidence recommended to recommend any additional amendments to the rule at this time. If there becomes issues in the future of systematic problems related to the rule, the board could re-examine them and consider any further action if necessary. And that concludes our report, but I would like to thank the committee for the DCAP committee for their hard work. Um, and I'm gonna argue with Rob Crane, even though I serve on his committee, that it might be the hardest working committee in the state bar. But I wanna really thank my members because they took this job seriously every single time. And I am very sad to say that a few of them received some very unfair and harsh criticism by a few members of this group. And that really saddened me, but thank you very much. Well, thank you for your service and for your committee service, Director Naylor. Director Crane. Yes, reporting for the hardest working subcommittee of the State Bar of Texas, Board of Directors, the Client Security Fund subcommittee. Um, just when it, This is where the rubber meets the road. We've had a lot of discussion already about the Client Security Fund, and this is such an honorable thing that this profession does. And it, it, our public member, Michael Vasquez, really said it well. I didn't know about this subcommittee when I came on the board. I didn't know we did what we do with this, neither did he. And this really speaks highly of this profession and going back to its roots as being an honorable profession and making sure that we're there serving the public. Even when there are a few of our members that don't do what they're supposed to do, this state bar stands behind serving the public and does its best to make things right in difficult circumstances. Um, the committee met again on June 15th. We discussed a number of multiple um, issues, discussed a number of issues. Uh, to help to improve the process for the next committee going forward. For the year, 135 applications were reviewed. That's like 135 cases. Um, 80 of those applications were approved for a total of $483,699.91, which is generally in line with what has occurred over the past few years. This doesn't happen without Claire Reynolds. Um, Claire is with the Office of Chief Disciplinary Counsel. She's the administrator and legal counsel for uh, the fund, and she goes through and she prepares the materials for each and every one of these cases, and we cannot thank her enough as a board for the hard work that she does. 
Um, our committee members, the hardest working committee members of any subcommittee there is on the planet, are, is my vice chair, Kate Bim, can't do this without Kate. Um, Benny Agosta Jr., Derek Cook, Lucy Forbes, Yolanda Cortez Maras, uh, Lydia Elizondo Mount, um, Steve Naylor, Carmen Rowe, Michael Vasquez, and Amy Wellborn. Um, I just thank you all for allowing me to be part of this wonderful committee of people who debate the, debate the issues um, that come up, and we don't always agree, um, but as a collective group, I think we get it right, and I'm really just proud to, to serve with them. Um, thank you, um, Randy Sorrells, uh, for the new directors coming in. We prayed over the observation of one of our State Bar members who recognized the hard work of our chair and recognized the fairness of the Texas Treasurer. And I just thank you, Randy. Prayers were answered. Texas Treasurer has been made part of the record in every State Bar Board meeting since the beginning of the year. Um, and as my last report, I'm just a point of privilege, just it's been an honor and a privilege to serve with all of y'all. Um, I didn't know necessarily what I was getting into when I came on board three years ago, and uh, this has enriched my life, and I feel even stronger about just the beauty of this profession and what it is that we're here for. Thank you all. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Director Dawson, do you want to buck the trend and come up here? <laughs> I, no. Oh, I did, yes. Sorry, Gina Bunn, item number 15. I apologize. Ms. Bunn? You're right there. You, you can speak from wherever you want. Well, actually, along with Director Forbes, <laughs> I might be, this microphone isn't really set for us vertically impaired folks. Uh, but uh, anyway, I am the uh, chair of the Commission for Lawyer Discipline, and I'm here to report uh, to you on fiscal year uh, 2021. Uh, let me get my glasses on so I can make sure I get all these numbers correct. Uh, for fiscal year 2021, uh, June 1st, 2020 through May 31st, 2021, uh, there were 459 complaints resolved through 372 sanctions. Uh, the sanctions imposed June 1st through May 31st included 18 disbarments, 15 resignations in lieu of discipline, 123 suspensions, 36 public reprimands, 100 private reprimands, 80 grievance referral program um, candidates, uh, and also uh, it included a, a collection of $308,000 and $308,000 in attorney's fees revenue collected through May 31st, 2021. Um, I would also just like to say this is my last board meeting uh, to attend as a member of the Commission for Lawyer Discipline. My final term expires in August. I've served the past six years, this past year as the chair. Um, it's been quite a, an honor and a privilege uh, to have served my profession in this capacity. Uh, and I get it. Discipline is kind of a dirty word. Uh, but I have come to learn uh, most definitely through this experience that an effective, robust disciplinary process uh, goes hand in hand with the privilege of self-governance uh, and um, that we as lawyers in Texas enjoy. Um, I've come to understand the process uh, plays such a vital role in, promoting, uh, in protecting the public, in protecting the integrity of our profession, uh, and also sometimes in identifying those of us uh, who need help through whether it's the, uh, the, the uh, grievance referral program or, or other programs. Uh, and Shauna Willing, our, uh, the chief disciplinary counsel for the past two years, has done a, a really phenomenal job in leading us in our mission uh, to serve tex the Texas attorney community and the public. And, and I know that that's a, a delicate balance, but I think she has done a, a fantastic job. I want to also thank President McDougal and uh, Judge Fields for the work that they did on this task force, the other members of the task force from the, from the board, uh, to shine a light, and all, also the Grievance Oversight Committee, to shine a light on the process and to hopefully improve it um, and uh, improve the functioning, maintain transparency, and help ensure that the process is in, administered fairly and equitably. 
and uh, I want to thank Trey for giving me the opportunity to serve in this capacity, uh, and also just thank all of you directors and the staff of the State Bar. It's just been such a pleasure uh, for all that you do for the lawyers of Texas. Uh, thank you. Trey, I believe you had a personal privilege. Point of personal privilege, uh, Gina makes me look real good because she was my last appointment on the way out the door in my presidential year when I appointed her to the Commission for Lawyer Discipline. She's been there six years. She has served as vice chair and now chair. The work of the commission, they, they meet monthly and they review 30 to 50 cases every month. Uh, it, is, it is a tremendous effort and challenge uh, for a lawyer in private practice. Gina, thank you very much for your service to our profession. Thank you for uh, accepting the appointment and uh, thank you for, for representing our profession in, in the, your top shelf. Great job, thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Bunn. All right, Director Dawson, now's your turn. Uh, we're going to hear from Director Dawson on item number 16, our Audit and Finance Committee. Director Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, while Rob may claim that, or Director uh, Crane may claim that his, uh, his is the hardest working committee, I will submit to you that our committee made more money for the state bar than any other committee <laughs> combined. All of the materials, and that had nothing to do with me, um, it won't surprise y'all. All the materials are in section 16 of your meeting book because I know that the uh, uh, cocktail hour is near. I'm gonna go through this as quickly as possible. The bottom line is we're in great financial shape, uh, great financial shape. This slide, the first one shows our general fund operating results uh, for the period ending 430 2021 versus uh, the prior year. You'll see that the actual net revenues over expenditures uh, totaled approximately 1.1 million. There was a decrease from the prior year of 41 million to 39 million. That was expected because of the pandemic, but there was a more than a bigger increase in the decrease in expenditures from 37 million down to 31 or nearly 32 million. Um, so the decrease in expenditures has more than offset the lost revenue. Uh, and we'll go over that in more detail. The next slide shows the trend by department. Um, you'll see that membership dues, not surprisingly, counts for half of our state bar revenue, uh, and that continues to grow over the last three years. Um, the Texas Bar CLE revenue uh, was down to 12.3 million, down 1 million as a result of the pandemic, but really that was a tremendous achievement by the Texas Bar CLE staff. The fact how they were able to move all of our in-person CLE programs to online programs and only have a loss of revenue of $1 million was really, really impressive. Um, other revenue items such as investment uh, uh, revenues and income have gone down in the past year, but they're expected to return to normal as we emerge from this pandemic. The next slide shows our expenditures, um, again by department. Um, and you see that almost all of the expenditures for all departments have decreased from prior years. And this is a result of everything going online, CLE events, committee meetings, board meetings, all being uh, occurring remotely. And so we, there was a huge decrease in costs associated with um, these, uh, these th everything going online. Um, the board commitment expenditure, which is the last item, that includes the purchase of our new building at 1415 Lavaca, as well as other uh, commitment expenditures that were approved in last year's budget. Lastly, um, this slide presents a, a comparison of operating results to the approved budget uh, for the 11 months ending in uh, April 31, 2021. You'll see that we had a budgeted revenue of 40.7 million, actual revenue was 39.046, which is a difference of 1.7 million. However, as I said, our expenditures were down $8 million giving us a net um, positive variance of 6.5 million. Most money made in the, by any committee this year, 6.5 million. Um, some people have asked questions about what's gonna happen to those funds. Those funds will be allocated during the fiscal year 2022 to 2023 budget. 
Next year's budget's already been approved, so the following year, those funds will be su submitted to that budget committee, and they can allocate them um, as they see fit. So um, bottom line is um, uh, we had a great year financially, and I would like to, um, where's Tracy? Tracy Jarrett, could you stand up and be recognized? Um, so this is, Tracy, no, you're not done. You're not done. Um, she and her staff do an amazing job. Um, they do an amazing job. I mean, I, I could go on for, for a long time, but I mean, the fact that we went through this internal audit that we're going to get to, and there were no, not even little blemishes on our record, and that's a real tribute to Tracy uh, and her staff for the fabulous work that they do. And um, Tracy, I want to thank you because um, when, when Charlie called me and asked me to be the chair of the Audit and Finance Committee, I told my wife and she started laughing. She thought that was hilarious. So you've made me, you've helped me get through the year and I want to thank you and I want to really uh, honor you and your staff for the tremendous work that you do. So thank you, Tracy. Um, so that completes the operating results year to date. Let me switch gears and go to our upcoming audits. Um, so um, the fiscal year 2021 financial audit was conducted by Weaver. They're going to continue their work in June, in uh, June, July, and August, and that work will be presented to the board in January at your uh, board meeting. Thankfully for you, you will have a new Audit and Finance Committee chair who will present that to you next year. The fiscal year 2021 internal audit will be conducted by McConnell and Jones. They're going to focus on the MCLE department and the Information Technology Division. They're going to examine financial processes, customer service, and compliance areas within the MCLE department and they're gonna look at security data backup and recovery systems in the IT departments. So per our board policy section 3.03, .03, the board selects an independent audit firm to conduct audit services every five years. That RFP process for our internal auditor um, will be overseen by next year's audit and finance committee and they will recommend an audit, uh, internal audit firm for this board at its consideration at the April board meeting. And now I'd like for Darlene Brown and Liz Myers to come forward. Um, you all will remember that um, they were going to present at the, oh, you're behind me, good. Um, they were going to present the results of the internal audit, and we're going to go over that um, briefly now. So thank you, please. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, for the record, my name is Darlene Brown, and I have Liz Myers in the audience back here behind me. I know we're, we're running late, and I want to get everybody to happy hours just as quickly as possible. So today I'm presenting a summary of the three audits that we completed this year. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank everybody for your support, not of, only of our firm, but of our audits and our processes. I'd like to give special thank you to Tracy Jarrett, Tracy Knuckles, and Sandra Carlson for their dedication in working with the section boards and members to prepare them for the audit and your guidance as we worked through audit completion. Finally, I'd like to thank everybody that was involved in these audits, the quick responses and taking time from your day helped us to get the audits completed quickly and successfully. Before I begin the audit results, I want to explain the difference between finding and an improvement opportunity. One of the things that's different with our uh, firm versus some of the others that you have um, is that an, we don't classify everything as a finding. For us, a finding is if it's an internal control weakness or non-compliance with required policy, law, or regulation. We define an improvement opportunity as an area where the internal control or process is effective, is designed, but can be enhanced. Next slide, please. So the first audit that we have is the public funds investment compliance. While statute requires that this audit be completed once every two years, your leadership has made the decision to have this audit completed every year. We're very happy to report that we rated the inter internal controls and processes for the investment funds as best practices that are effectively working as attended. We reviewed 25 compliance requirements and we had no findings to report, so congratulations to everybody. Next slide, please. Our second audit was a T chief disciplinary council processes, and there's been a lot of discussion today around these, uh, the, the, the CDC. Next slide, please. 
This audit resulted with an effective internal control rating and we had no findings to report. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. Through interviews, document review, and audit testing procedures, we concluded that the CDC has effective internal controls and processes in place to ensure compliance with attorney discipline systems requirements. We're talking about compliance with current policies. We also noted that State Board of Texas has established best practice in the complaint file management processes. Grievances are tracked and monitored from receipt to disposition. There's also adequate segregation of duties over client security fund. And at the time of our audit testing, the CDC did not have any past due classifications and classifications were being completed in a timely manner. We did have two improvement opportunities. First one is that uh, the written procedures need to be finalized. And that the second one is CDC should include in an attest statement that they have received the completed subrogation form with documents provided to the finance de de department before payment is issued. Next slide, please. We looked at a total of 35 compliance requirements, processes, and internal controls for complaint and co grievance handling from the time they were received through recording, referral, and investigation process. We compared supporting documentation to information presented to the local grievance committee panels and the Commission for Lawyer Discipline. We also reviewed how disciplinary actions are monitored in the client service fund payment process. Through the hard work and dedication of your CDC and your support team uh, resulted in no reportable findings. The next slide, please. The next uh, and final report I have for you is the section's financial controls and processes. We were pleasantly surprised to see the positive processes and controls that are in place. Overall, this is a very good audit outcome. This is the first audit that focused primarily on sections, and your section leaders take responsibility seriously and demonstrate that they are dedicated to ensuring your financial assets are protected. This hard work and, and diligence, and each of you are commended for your volunteer services. Our report showed that overall sections have implemented sound controls and processes to protect their financial assets, including segregations of duty controls. Next slide, please. We rated the internal controls as some improvement needed and noted three low risk findings and four low risk improvement opportunities. Next slide, please. The purpose of this audit was to assess State Bar of Texas Section's management controls and processes in place to protect financial assets and provide accurate financial information. Your 47 sections had a combined revenues of $3.73 million as of June 1st, 2019 through May 31st, 2020. The combined bank balances of these sections was $7.499 million as of May 31st, 2020. Through this audit, we noted that there were several commendations. First, CDC is ensuring adequate segregation of duties exist for financial transactions. Ensuring that transactions are authorized, supported, and recorded in an accurate and timely manner. That the developing of written procedures and uh, for their finances, which future offices can follow, and that knowledge transfer occurs. And then updating authorized signatories on bank accounts when there's a change in the officers. Next slide, please. We also noted that of the 13 compliance requirements, 96% of the sections were in full compliance, and 4% of the sections were not in compliance with some of the current requirements. Next slide, please. Our first finding is that the section bank and, the, uh, and investment accounts do not always include a state bar officer as an authorized signatory. For that, we recommend to update the state bar board policy requirements to include a policy requiring that a state bar financial officer be listed as an authorized signatory on all section bank accounts, including investments, when a section is placed under provisional status. This is a low risk finding. Our second finding is also low risk. We noted that sections that utilize CPA 
or bookkeeping services exceeded the maximum 60 days to complete and or submit bank reconciliations in June and July. Additionally, eight of the 68 bank accounts have outstanding checks that remained uncleared, which date back to 2018 or earlier. For this, we recommend that sections identify and resolve causes for delayed bank reconciliations. Additionally, that sections should perform additional research on those reconciling items that are past 60 to 90 days to resolve any issues. And then finally, policies should be updated to avoid outstanding checks that meet a steep, a steep criteria. Next slide, please. Our third finding is also low risk. We noted that seven of the 47 sections did not submit their financial policies to state bar in fiscal year 20, and 11 of the 47 sections did not submit the budget documents. We recommended that state bar require all section treasurers to provide reasons why they were unable to provide the completed budget by deadline, and also state bar should consider and implement consequences for sections not meeting policy requirements. State bar should also consider placing a section under provisional status if they fail to submit their financial packages for more than three months. Now we'll move to the improvement opportunities. The, again, these are areas where you can enhance internal controls or processes and do not mean that there is an internal control weakness. The first two of these improvement opportunities have to do with communications. The first one is when, it, is when finance division realizes they will be unable to provide finance packages to you in a timely manner. They should notify the sections in advance that the package will be late. The second opportunity is for financial reports to be provided at each section's council meetings to provide transparency to officers and members. Next slide, please. The third opportunity is to address bank balances. We averaged three years expenses for each section and compared that average to the current bank balance. We noted that four of these sections had cash to cover 10 years worth of expenses. 14 had enough cash on hand to cover five years worth of expenses. Seven had enough to cover three years worth of expenses and 22 did not have enough cash to cover at least three years of expenses. For that, we recommend that um, to update section bylaws or financial policies to maintain a safety net of a cash equivalent to a minimum of three years worth of expenses, if not already stated. And then we consider updating your financial policies to more state a maximum corpus to be maintained. Uh, we all know that when there's a lot of money in bank accounts, that's, that's a, a higher risk area. Our final opportunity is related to section board composition. We noted that it's sometimes challenging to fill all spots on your respective boards. We recommend to first determine the root cause for the lack of required officers or council members. And then if you're in a section that does not intend to fill these positions, then you should update your bylaws accordingly. So this concludes our audits for these three years, and we'll be happy to answer any questions now or in a future date once you have an opportunity to read the full reports. I do believe this might be an action item also. So um, for those of you that want more details about the audit report, it is included in your board packet and is also available online. On behalf of the Audit and Finance Committee, I make a motion to approve the internal audit reports from McConnell and Jones during fiscal year 2021. Coming from the committee, it does not require a second. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? So passes. Mr. Chair, it has been my honor and privilege to serve uh, under your leadership this year, and that concludes my presentation. Thank, Thank you, Alistair. Thank you to the Audit and Finance Committee. That's a big job, and we appreciate it more than you know. Thank you, Alistair, for your leadership. Our next is coming from the Administration Committee, Director James Wester. James, your floor. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, I guess I should start by saying apparently we don't make them as the most money and we're not the hardest working. But other than that, we have really had a pretty busy year. Uh, I'd like to thank the and recognize the members of the administration committee this year, 
Kate Bim, Derek Cook, uh, Rob Crane, and Sherry Goldsberry, and thank them for the amount of time and effort they've put in, in addition to uh, they've been very busy with, uh, with other committees also. Uh, if you'll recall, at the April 16th board meeting, uh, the MCLE committee brought forth an, uh, an opportunity for us to vote on accrediting um, both implicit and explicit bias as well as mental health and substance abuse for uh, cre ethics credit under our MCLE. And so this board approved that. Um, the, they also, also recommended at that time, the MCLE committee recommended that um, ethics credit uh, be left as voluntary and not mandatory. And so the charge that was given to the administration committee in April was to look at that issue. And so we did, um, and, and I have to tell you, after spending some time over the last couple of months, it really was a great opportunity for us to educate ourselves and to look at a lot of information, um, some of which you've already heard today that we had a chance to look at, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. So. Um, we had several meetings. We also talked to John Boyce, who chaired the MCLE committee. We got a flavor for the kind of information that had been gathered for them to make the recommendation in April. And it was, it was pretty extensive, the amount of information that was made available to them and the input they, they received before coming before this board with a recommendation. We also um, had an opportunity to go, with, uh, to, go to the uh, DEI task force and get input from them. And uh, Chair Joe Escovedo was here earlier today giving that report. And um, I, I have to tell you how grateful we are to that committee for the amount of information, thoughtfulness, and uh, input that they provided for us to consider uh, in making uh, a recommendation or reporting to you today. Um, we met, the, uh, the administration committee met for the last time on June 7th. Um, one of the things that was available to us, made available to us by the DEI task force, was an opportunity to see a draft of the report that they gave today. So we'd have a chance to see what some of their recommendations were gonna be and some of the, the things that they would, they would put forward. Um, I have, you know, I've gone to a lot of meetings, but I don't think I've ever attended a meeting that, um, w that I was more impressed by than the, the DEI task force in the way that they prepared for the meeting, in the way that they presented the information to us. Um, that group has, is, and, and I use this term for me, I can't speak for the rest of the admin committee, they were light years ahead of where I was in thinking through some issues. Um, we, we do tell you that we, um, they had some excellent ideas and you need to read the report. Uh, and I would especially encourage you, it's about 30 pages long, it's gonna take some time to get through it, but it is worth it. And so I encourage not only those of us that have it today, but the incoming board members, all of you need to take an opportunity to review that report. It's, it's got a lot of good information and a lot of great ideas in it. And I think that's gonna be important to Sylvia as, as she moves forward as, as president. Um, we, we agree that the board should continue to build on the work that we've already started during this bar year in the coming bar years. Um, we agree with the task force that implicit bias training is just one part of a much broader discussion. And when you read their report, you will see that. You will see uh, the depth in which they go into that issue and realize that what they're talking, what they have brought forth is much broader than just simply implicit bias training. Um, you know, we, we believe that as, as a board and as an organization, we continue to need to look at diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's an important part of what the board next year needs to take on. And uh, I know you're gonna see some of those issues simply by reading through that, the report that the task force had. Um, based upon the fact that you've got that report and we know that there are some initiatives coming um, out of that report uh, through 
uh, and with Sylvia next year as president, at this point, we think that there's really no need for us to uh, take any further action as a board on MCLE requirements in this bar year. Um, we think that there's an opportunity here to not only look at the voluntary MCLE that we've approved at the last board meeting as it gets implemented, but also we have an opportunity to see what some other states are doing and what the impact may be of some training that they that they proposed. So for those reasons today, I really don't have an action item for you. I do have some principles though that I would like to tell you that we as a committee uh, agreed upon and we think are important enough to mention to all of you. The first is that you've got to continue to review this issue and you've got to support diversity in the legal profession. It's important to the administration of justice, it's important to us as lawyers, and it's important to our state and the people we serve but because of the diversity of our state, as I think you heard Joe talk about earlier today. Um, again, I'm going to tell you, take the time to digest the report that the task force put together. Um, you, will, you will be amazed at the amount of information that they were able to gather and uh, what you're going to see in there. Um, I was going to say one of, our, one of the things we agreed on was that the task force should continue on next year. Well, that's already done, but that was one of the things we did agree on. And then uh, what we're going to say is we think it's important for this group, the officers and directors, to lead by example and continue to have DEI training as a part of your service on this board. We think that that's critical to lead, you know, our profession out there. And, and, and I, I'll tell you, if uh, and I think every, most people in here got to uh, see Dr. Reeves and go through that training, and um, it's absolutely excellent. I hope that the incoming directors get an opportunity to also sit through some training by Dr. Reeves because it was very impressed. So at this point, I don't have any motion, but I see, I guess I need to let sure. Chair Ginn back. Discussion, go ahead, Director Smith. Um, did, I, I heard uh, Joe Escobedo talk earlier about how uh, a majority of states require um, either um, diversity, some sort of CLE requirement in their ethics requirement for diversity or for uh, implicit bias. Um, did did y'all study that? And, and what were your findings on that? Um, and then I want to ask you about their recommendation. Okay, Jason. Yeah, I, I mean, from a standpoint of, yes, there are a number out there, and I think Joe even mentioned the fact we're probably behind, although we've We've done, taken a step to try to catch up with what we approved in April. Uh, but yes, there are a number of states. There, I think Colorado, uh, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Rob, they instituted some mandatory implicit bias training uh, a month or two ago. Right, because the one, you know, obviously the issue that we had before us in April, and I guess really that was brought to us is, do we have mandatory implicit bias training? And that's one of the big issues that, you, that Jason, you'll see in their report, is that it, this is, it's a much broader issue than simply implicit bias. And by the way, when you read that report, you're gonna hear them say, we probably shouldn't be using that term. We should probably be using the term unconscious bias instead of implicit bias. Um, and I guess as your report, are, are you just deferring to their report and, and encouraging us to, to look at their recommendations? Well, or, I think... Or, or did y'all, did y'all, I, I guess I don't understand, did y'all know of their recommendation about unconscious bias, diversity, training? Uh, did they give you that at the beginning of the month? And, and did y'all consider recommending that to us, piggybacking on the, the work that they did? Uh, I would say, well, let, let me think for a second. I think we got, we got uh, excerpts of their report the same day we had the meeting, I believe. I believe it was on June 7th. 
was the day we, we just got clips of various parts of their report specifically relating to implicit bias. We didn't see the entire report until it was published, you know, on a board book. And so we just got certain pieces of that that we looked at and, and came to the conclusion that, again, they've done a lot of work, they've made some recommendations or brought some information, and based upon what, as I understand, what will be done with that task force report is Sylvia and the board takes that report, looks at it, and over a period of time will look at certain things and either expand them, contract them, implement them, not implement them, because that seems like that was exactly what was done uh, from the 2007 report. So y'all aren't making a recommendation against? We're, we're not making a recommendation against it. What we're saying is we can't come to you today and say we, we should do that knowing the information that was provided to us and having looked at it. And so really where we are is we're left with, I think, where we were uh, with the MCLE committee uh, in April, which is right now it's voluntary and we can't come before you today and say, yeah, you need to go to mandatory implicit bias training. I think when you look at the, look at the issues and look at the broader scope of DE&I, we're not ready to take that step because that m we may need to look at something larger. Okay. All right, thank you very much, thank you. Okay, well, oh, you have more? I, yeah, I get to complete my report. Well, I just quickly want to say this is, this is my last time at the board meeting also, and I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to serve with you. I sure missed the last sort of year and a half in which we couldn't get together. And unfortunately, a couple of people stole my thunder today, and so I'm gonna call them out on it. And one was Randy bringing up the Texas treasure, and then of course Rob did it. And I'm just going to say amen to the prayer. But even though this is my last meeting, I want to give you all a challenge. Because Charlie's going to be around next year. So please do your best to make sure you recognize Point him as Texas treasure in every board meeting <laughs> for the next bar year. Thank you. Thanks, all right. Get out of here, Wester. Okay. Next up, I think we've got Director Andy Almond's on. No? Sherry, I'm sorry, Director Goldsberry, I flipped a page. Director Goldsberry, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is my last meeting, too, and for you first incoming directors um, that are still here and still awake, this is a very good example of what you're gonna be experiencing over the next three years. And three years sounds like a long time, but I'm gonna tell you it's gonna go like that. You've only really got 12 meetings and tomorrow's one. And this body, as you've seen, doesn't move to change quickly and it shouldn't, right? Uh, and so if you, if you have a pet project, you need to step on it. That's my advice to you. All right. On Monday, June 14th, the Performance Measures and Strategic Planning Committee approved updated performance measures for 2021 through 2026 based on the, the State Bar Strategic Plan, which the board approved in January. The board is required by the State Bar Act to update the strategic plan and performance measures every two years for the performance measure update, our consultant, Elizabeth Derrico, who helped to update the strategic plan, held meetings with small groups of state bar staff to adjust the performance measures and make them as efficient and useful as possible. In your materials, the new performance measures are highlighted in yellow. And next year, we expect the subcommittee to continue to work on a format for a high-level dashboard report of performance measure outcomes for use by the board. In 2022, the subcommittee will begin work on another strategic plan. So <clears throat> at this time, I move that the board approve the updated performance measures based on the strategic plan for 2021 through 2026 as included in your materials. Coming from the committee, it requires no second. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank One more you. thing. 
Don't be afraid to be the contrarian. <laughs> All right, Director Almond's on. Now it's your turn. I appreciate it. Floor's yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andy Almanzan from El Paso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a report on behalf of the Appeals and Grant Review Subcommittee comprised of Cara Miller, Mark Gravely, Mary Scott, Carmen Rowe, and Carlos Cardenas, and assisted by our staff members, Ray Cantu, Brad Johnson, and, and Don Jones. The Appeals Grant Review Subcommittee hears appeals from administrative decisions of the MCLE Committee and the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. The subcommittee then presents its recommendations to the entire board for consideration. On May 6, 2021, the subcommittee heard the appeal of a Texas Board of Legal Specialization decision brought by an appellant, Mr. Joe Maida IV. The TBLS had placed Mr. Maida's criminal law certification on inactive status, finding that he did not meet the recertification requirements for the specialty area. The hearing was conducted by video conference, during which Mr. Maida and Mr. Leo Figueroa, the executive director of TBLS, each were allowed to present their position. The standard for review to be used by both the subcommittee and the board is the substantial evidence standard. This is the standard commonly used in appeals from decisions of administrative agencies. Under the substantial evidence standard, the test on appeal is not whether the agency reached the correct decision or even the best decision. The test is whether reasonable minds, considering the evidence as a whole, could have reached the same conclusion. The agency's findings, inferences, and conclusions are presumed to be supported by substantial evidence. And with respect to the criminal law certification requirements, specific area requirements provide that an applicant for recertification must have devoted a minimum of 25% of his or her time practicing criminal law in Texas during each of the five-year period of certification. The record showed that TBLS considered the information provided by Mr. Maida and determined that he did not devote a minimum of 25% of his time practicing criminal law in Texas for two consecutive years, 2019 and 2020. The subcommittee applying the substantial evidence standard ultimately voted in favor of the TBLS decision. And on behalf of the Appeals and Grants Review Subcommittee, I move that the board uphold the decision of the Texas Board of Legal Specialization, placing Mr. Maida's certification in criminal law on inactive status. Coming from a committee, it does not require a second. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Director Cordova. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my report's uh, pretty short, so I figured I'd save the walk and I'll just do it right from here. Uh, Deborah Cordova, I'm the chair for the new director's orientation committee. And the new director's orientation uh, took place this morning for the new board members, liaisons, and the section representatives. This year's incoming directors is a very diverse, energetic, and committed group that's willing to serve. If you're an incoming director and you're still present, would you please stand? They will all be sworn in tomorrow morning. And Randy also stole my thunder because I want to also echo what Randy mentioned earlier and I challenge you to please take some time tonight and introduce yourselves to our new incoming directors. Thank you and this concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director. <laughs> Director Brooker. Thank you, Chairman. Um, throughout this year, it has been heartwarming to see the State Bar's commitment to helping Texas lawyers during the pandemic. Now, Randy didn't steal my thunder, but Trey did. Um, since June 1st, Texas Bar CLE has provided $5.8 million in free CLE to all lawyers via our online classroom and um, with our online classes. And that's pretty awesome. 5.8 million. Um, specifically, the State Bar's provided $687,000 in scholarships to Texas lawyers to attend these. Texas Bar CLE has converted all live seminars to webcast format, as most of you all know, 
Um, but that's through the end of this month. We will thankfully be able to resume some live programming starting in July, so in just a few more weeks. And we're working with hotels about how to stage those events safely with masks and social distancing and other safety protocols. But we're excited because the first quarter of the fiscal year includes our biggest and most well attended advanced courses from personal injury to civil trial to real estate, criminal, and of course, family law. Reducing registrants capacity for social distancing is gonna uh, you know, impact um, us somewhat, but, um, but we're moving in the right direction. So we're really excited about that. And of course, for those people uh, and for those individuals who are not comfortable um, attending CLE events in person, or if they just prefer the convenience of virtual programming, there will also be um, webcast replays. So let me brag on the new TexasBarPractice.com website. This website has averaged 300 to 400 unique users' um, visits, which is something that the technology people tell me is a big deal, and a thousand page views per day. And since the launch of the new website, Texas Bar Books has seen an increase in subscribers to the Texas Bar Books online manuals, and revenues for those subscriptions have exceeded this year's budget by 30%, which is also a big deal. Another thing to note is that Texas Bar Books was able to reduce costs um, for their print production by switching to a soft uh, softbound format for manuals, and this change saved $160,000 in production costs to date. The Minority Affairs Department is planning the 29th annual Texas Minority Council Program, which will take place in Houston on October 27th through the 29th, and each year, TMCP recognizes and honors outstanding attorneys who've made an impact in the areas of diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. So please spread the word about these awards and honors and submit nominations. Um, I think the deadline for submission is um, June 25th, and all that information can be found on our website. And finally, um, a big thank you to Hetty Bauer um, for her leadership. Um, this committee heavily, heavily relies and functions thanks to her. And just as a reminder to help spread the word about Texas Bar CLE and their full and partial scholarships that are available um, for all of our state bar programs. So uh, just remember the application process for those scholarships are fast, it's easy, and it's confidential. So, um, and those scholarships are also available for Texas Bar Books. So. That concludes my report. Thank you, Director Brooker. Uh, Director Wellborn, your floor. Can oh, I ask sorry. one question? I'm sorry, go ahead, David. Director Booker. Do I know the answer? I hope not. <laughs> sorry. One of my constituents wrote an email on the 25th of May questioning the fact that we are apparently using masks at our upcoming CLE programs. I just wanted to get clarity on that. Are we or are we not? We are following the CDC guidelines. Um, that is what I, I know. So that is my Which answer. means, because I want to be able to give my constituent a clear answer. I was going to say the CDC guidelines encourages the use of masks, but I do not think we can mandate masks. Okay. Thank you. All right, Director Wellborn. Hello. All right, I'm here to report on the Insurance and Member Benefits Subcommittee. And I just want you all to know, unlike Mr. Alexander, I made sure my trial ended and got here on time. So there you go. <laughs> so um, next slide, please. I just want to look, if you look here, this is our positive growth. We have um, grown the insurance um, exchange, the Texas Bar Private Insurance Exchange, a ton this year, as you can see. And so that shows that we are a great committee, obviously, and have done well, obviously. But um, also, it's been a great program that we've started, and the program is growing. Um, growth isn't the only way we've monitored the program. We did a customer satisfaction survey this year. And I'm proud to report that 70% of the members are satisfied with the uh, program. This is way different than what you would get on the open market, which is 30 to 40%. So that's been great. 
Um, as everyone knows, the big um, issue that everyone's been looking at was the solos um, and health insurance for them. We worked really hard this year trying to get um, and hopeful, very hopeful that something would pass through the legislature. Unfortunately, nothing to do with the bill itself. It was killed at the very end, so um, we have to wait two more years. But there are some special enrollment periods going on until August 15th, and um, we're looking at various different things we can do in the meantime over the next two years to see if there's other ways we can support them. And due to some of the um, changes with the COVID um, rules and the special enrollments, it's raised the income levels to over 400% of the federal poverty line, which means we're seeing an increase in the exchange because there's some more opportunities for our members. So, um, next slide. One of our biggest accomplishments we learned this year is we were trying to figure out how to get the word out and to help people. And we looked at possibly sending out a um, email or a postcard and we decided to try a postcard. And after we did that, we sent it just to the solos and it increased the visits to our benefits site by 56%. And so then we went ahead and sent it to all the membership and it increased it by 85%. So obviously those postcards really seem to help. Um, we've increased our revenue by $75,000 over the last year to $1.1 million. And uh, we're looking at other programs, um, the other bars to see how we can improve and expand our um, benefits program. We've added a Global Fit, GE, Entertainment Discounts, and Lenovo. Um, review, if you look at the next slide, um, our benefits that we have for everyone outside of that, we're looking at different ways we can market those and to get the word out about all the different benefits because we have a ton. Thank y'all. Thank you, Director Wellborn. <laughs> Director Davis. also use this microphone. My report will be very short. I'd like you to know that Craig Chapman gave me a lovely longer report and I will hit the highlights for you. Um, <laughs> the IT department has completed several um, pretty significant things uh, since we met last time. The implementation of a new virtual server system, uh, some audio visual renovations at the Texas Law Center, uh, which I think we will all ultimately see the results of, particularly in the boardroom and the conference room, they've been outfitted, uh, outfit, outfitted with uh, Zoom capabilities, because we're all really excited to keep Zoom going, right? Um, and a new cloud-based phone system for the staff. What I do want to touch on, uh, President McDougal mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, the new advertising review portal is in the final phase of beta testing by a small group of attorneys. Once this phase of testing is complete, it will be available to all attorneys in the coming weeks. Uh, this portal will allow attorneys to submit advertising media online, pay fees, and check the status of their cases. Attorneys will no longer be required to mail their applications uh, with the advertisements. Everything can be completed online, and media can be uploaded instantly. We expect this to be a great benefit for Texas attorneys by simplifying the submission process, giving real-time status updates, and improving overall communications. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you, Director Davis. <laughs> Director Sims, do you have a report? No report. That's why he's the outstanding public member. Director Emily Miller. <laughs> oh, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to give a brief report on the Legislative Policy Subcommittee. Um, of course, on May 31st, just a couple of weeks ago, the 87th legislative session ended. Um, there were almost 7,000 bills filed between the House and the Senate, and just over 1,000 bills were passed. As far as the State Bar Legislative Package, um, several sections had proposals in varying degrees of, of success, of course, but a Business Law Section had one proposal which passed. The Entertainment and Sports Law Section had one proposal that passed. It was the first time that we'd seen legislation from that uh, section. The Family Law had 11 proposals. Uh, four which passed individually, and three others which were amended onto other uh, pieces of legislation. The LGBT, LGBT law section um, returned with the same uh, legislative package that they have proposed for the past uh, several sessions, and uh, neither of their provisions passed. 
And then the real estate, probate, and trust law section, or reptile, um, had three real estate proposals um, which did not pass, and then seven probate and trust proposals, um, one of which passed. And um, I'll just mention also that um, we just have a few more days in the, in the veto period in which the, le which the governor can sign or veto legislation, uh, which is the 20th day following adjournment. Um, most legislation that was passed this past session takes effect unless otherwise um, noted in the bill, unless there's a specific enactment date, and that's 91 days following adjournment. Um, I will mention that our ad hoc legislative committee met throughout the session to consider additional items as they arose, and that was composed of Ms. Barunda first, Ms. Out, Mr. Outful, um, Mr. McDougall, and Mr. Ginn, and myself, and we met um, as the need arises, uh, oftentimes on very quick notice. Um, I believe that that really concludes the um, legislative subcommittee report. Um, it was a busy session and a really different session uh, given the pandemic, and, and hopefully we'll, the legislature will be back to business um, in the 88th legislative section, session in a couple of years. And Mr. Ginn, that concludes my report. Should I keep, keep on rolling? Yeah, okay, all right. So I'm going to keep going with the section representatives to the board report. Um, throughout the pandemic, the sections were able to continue serving their uh, membership by levering, leveraging technology, just like the rest of us. Um, and they also recognize many cost efficiencies, which you saw uh, reflected in the, in the bank balances that were uh, reported in the, in the audit report. They also greatly expanded their ability to reach more, more of their members through websites, uh, virtual newsletters, and webinars, and really saw a real jump in participation for a lot of their meetings and programs. Um, the sections are also very ready to get back to meeting in person, and we have a very busy fall full of meetings and CLEs. Um, some of the bigger CLEs, like the family law section, are going to go back to in person um, this summer, and I know that several of the other sections are as well. And the sections department will continue to help them and guide them regarding the best practices as they return to in person events. Um, last year, of course, as previously mentioned, we underwent an audit for the sections. Uh, business practices and financial procedures and I'd like to thank all the sections and the section leadership a lot of whom are in the room right now for their participation in the audit process that we just went through uh, and in particular the state bar staff as well. Um, the section leadership was very cooperative and very prompt in their responses and they understood the necessity for that type of review and I'm sure are going to work very hard and diligently to uh, implement the recommendations that were made by the audit team. And I've been involved with sections for many years and I was confident that they were very conscientious of managing their money and it did turn out uh, that way indeed. Um, the exercise was very valuable and it did cause all of the sections to stop and think and document the procedures that they used to manage their finances and the section's business practices. And we were all very pleased with the results of the, of the audit. I'd like to take a moment to mention a specific important issue that has come up recently. The Hispanic Issues Sections has forwarded a resolution related to federal immigration detention facilities, which the section representatives will uh, examine as a group and continue the dialogue with the section, uh, and we will discuss it with the section as the, as the resolution moves forward. Um, and Mr. Chairman, that concludes the report of the uh, section representatives to the board. Thank you, Director Miller. Thank you. If this next speaker doesn't get you fired up, get your pulse checked. Madam President of Texas Young Lawyers Association, Brittany Harris. And Lowell, can I just have you run the slide so I don't have to fumble with all of that? And as y'all know, I'm usually very brief. I have a little bit more content today, but I'm a very fast speaker. So let's go to the, oh. Can you change to mine? There we go. And then the next slide. I don't know what that is. Okay, I forget the slides, that's okay. Well, we had our final board meeting on May 14th and we discussed all of our projects. We also had a resolution which basically talked about our intent um, to make an amendment or our hope to present an amendment to our, our, our constituents at our in-person annual meeting. We've been talking about this for years, but our board has changed a lot, so we kind of just wanted to codify what we've been trying to do over the years, but we're unable to do it because of COVID. And essentially the resolution is to present an amendment to our um, TYLA members at annual meeting that 
eliminates the age requirement and just um, changes it to you're a member of TYLA if you're within your first 15 or up to your first 15 years of practice. Um, next, we talked about all of our projects, and I'll just go over a few of them. We started a couple podcasts this year, Practice Areas 101, which actually features <coughs> Cara Miller as one of our people. Oh, here we go. Um, is one of our um, interviewees on the podcast. It's basically out there to tell other you know, law students about what types of practice, areas of practice that we have, as well as just inform other people that might be interested in a different area of practice. Because I know I started off as a commercial litigator, but then I found my love of family law. So I wanted people to kind of learn a little bit more about you know, the different areas. We also had season four of Young Gunners, which was a business development podcast um, aimed at teaching young lawyers um, in different areas of practices, as well as just how do you navigate business development in the age of COVID and things like that. You can go to the next one. Vote Texas, pretty self-explanatory. Our goal was to increase voter turnout. We feel that our project actually helped a little bit in Texas, but we created these different push cards in English and in Spanish and disseminated them to people that are often not voting or people that don't know that they can vote. Um, like there might actually be some people in jail that actually still can vote because they haven't been convicted of that felony. Next slide. Slavery Out of the Shadows um, 2.0. We originally created Slavery Out of the Shadows in, about eight years ago, which was a spotlight on human trafficking. Unfortunately, human trafficking is still happening, and especially with COVID, they found really creative ways to continue to target teens and young children. Um, so we've created um, a concise video that talks about um, partnerships and helping survivors, and also featured some survivor stories. All these um, projects and things are gonna be located on our TYLA website. We also created a pamphlet specifically for educators so they can see the signs and kind of notice things with their students if they think something's going on with trafficking, as well as these flyers, which was originally the, I guess the scope of the project. I saw a flyer in a Las Vegas airport that talked about resources for trafficking and I'd never seen anything like that in Texas and with Texas being a big area of trafficking, we decided to develop some flyers that can be disseminated in areas that are frequently um, or frequented by uh, traffickers, and we have it in six different languages. Next slide. We also um, created the consequences of vaping. In this project, we have a general guide about the legal issues as well as the health issues, and then we targeted teens because they're a big you know, group of users of um, vaping, but we wanted to make it kind of in a way that's going to meet them. We're all about meeting people where they are. So we have one that's kind of based on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, I think is what it is. I refuse to use TikTok. Um, but we have something that's kind of like that um, to, to try and reach those children. And also a video that features a young survivor of vaping and some also a doctor on there that talks about what the health consequences are. Next slide. Iconic Women in Legal History. This was our signature project this year that was made possible by a generous grant from the Texas Bar Foundation. And can you go to the next slide? Can we just appreciate real quick the women that have, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. These are all the women that we have featured on the website, um, and it talks about their stories and the ways that they've paved the way, frankly, for me to be standing right here today to speak to y'all. Um, and so we've got some Texas legal legends here. We have you know, Lisa Tatum from the bar, and that is Gloria Allred, and she did participate in this project. And honestly, I don't know if that would have been possible if we weren't doing the Zoom, so that's one really good thing that we got out of COVID. Next slide. Some additional resources. We have um, our Small Affiliates Leadership Toolkit, um, which is gonna be available. It's gonna have a lot of different video series. Joe, I don't know if he's still here, but Joe Escobedo, he's on one of the panels um, that talks about diversity and leadership. We also have um, a personality test with Dean Teague and Stephen Rispoli of, um, of Baylor Law School, and it talks about how personality tests and leadership. And this is basically out there to help smaller affiliates that don't have leadership classes. I was in a leadership class in Austin as well as part of the State Bar Leadership SBOT program. I benefited from that, and so we wanted to have resources available for people in smaller and rural communities because there's leaders all across the state and everyone should be able to rise up amongst the bar leaders. And my slides are a lot prettier. I don't know what happened with the translation, but there was something prettier on top of there, so sorry about that. Um, we have evidence and predicates guides that are based on the Texas rules, but next year we're gonna be expanding that to have fe the federal rules, evidence and predicates guides. And it's really just a small resource that you can put in your trial toolkit. I know for me, I mean, yes, I've been litigated for almost 11 years now, but it's nice to have that concise little thing right there that I can refer to if I'm, you know, once we're back in court in person, it'll be a lot easier. We have our, uh, some guide on transitioning your practice. 
uh, financial literacy materials for law students and young lawyers. And another one I forgot to mention is Seal or Clear, and it's a guide to expunctions and non-disclosure disorders. And finally, next slide please. We have our state moot court going on right now. We're you know, always multitasking with TYLA. Um, but tomorrow the final round begins at 2 p.m. It's a criminal um, law practice, so we'll have the, criminal court of, the Court of Criminal Appeals sitting as our judges to judge our state moot court competition. So um, it's been great being back with y'all all in person this year. Um, I look forward to working y'all again next year. Janine will be giving these reports. Um, oh, there you are. And um, she has a lot of great projects planned. I'm not going to steal her thunder and talk about them. But Mr. Chair, that's my final report. Well. While Steve's making his way to the, the microphone, let me just brag on, on Brittany. She, and Steve, you can make your way up here. You're up next. You've got the floor for your resolution. But uh, Brittany did this um, just like we did. All those projects, her team, Texas Young Lawyers, did that in COVID. And she has been just the epitome of grace and excellence. And Brittany, thank you for, for being a leader in our state. And Janine, we are so fired up for next year. You're going to be incredible. We can't wait to watch what you and your team can do. Steve, the floor is yours. I believe Zoom is the issue that more lawyers talk about than almost anything else that we've done, maybe all of them put together. But I also understand that there's an increasing argument for dinner and drinks, and so I'll, I'll, I'll try to be short. Uh, Charlie and I had a misunderstanding. He was actually trying to help me. Why, why are we doing this? I'm trying to show the lawyers of Texas that we're talking about, discussing, and thinking about issues that matter to them. I didn't really, I don't care about the resolution that much. Just the fact that when lawyers ask about Zoom and it's coming up with the pandemic, new rules, that we're there, that we're thinking about them. So, okay, uh, Tracy, Justice Tracy Christopher, I don't know her personally, is chair of the remote task force. And so since day one, we've been communicating back and forth, and, and she, she didn't beg, but she really wanted our ideas. And I did send a sample of a resolution, and she wrote me at 9.02 this morning, thank you. You know, I think maybe it was Randy, just misunderstanding. I'm, we're not, I, we, are not trying to tell somebody what to do. We're advocating. So uh, there was three parts to that resolution. It was a rough draft that got published. I, I, I'm taking responsibility for that, not, not Charlie. Uh, he was trying to help me, and I didn't need that. The very first thing that I'd like to do, and I'm, I memorized it, but that the State Bar Board of Directors would like to thank Justice Tracy Christopher and the Remote Task Force for their hard work on this issue. I'm not, all, I'm not for awards, but I know they're doing a lot of work and they're unrecognized. Part two, I'm going to drop for a minute because David Sergi wanted to rewrite that. Part three is that the Office of Court Administration, who's ever in charge, develop one website where lawyers like, like me who, who do cases all over the state, we see something in Kimball County, we go to Kimball County, click it, and we get the Zoom credentials and uh, any particular court rules. So that's one and three. And that's what I'm going to move. I'm going to tell you about two. And uh, uh, Diane had, had some part in, in, in the wording. And um, where's David Sergi? But at any rate, uh, oh, OK, there you go. And, and, and Chad said, just leave it the way it is. It's fine. So that's up to you. But part two is the part that says um, that whoever the, the task force consider what attorneys want and give attorneys the right, especially if opposing counsel agree, to conduct Zoom hearings, the hearings by Zoom, in non-contested or non-witness matters. I'm going to leave that to, to, to David or a, any of you. I really want to show the 100,000 lawyers in the state that the state bar is, is thinking about what they're thinking and working on it. The result, I don't care. So I'm going to move approval of uh, number one, that we commend those people. 
because uh, they really did work hard. And number three, that we have a, a, one, a one click site that people can, say, can go uh, to that. And as a member of my own committee, do I need a second? <laughs> you, you, you will need a second, but um, without the, I don't think they know what the language is. I know it's in the materials, but are you, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, uh -huh. are you asking for you and some others to go forward and, and craft a, a new resolution and bring it back, or are you wanting to approve something now? I'd like to approve number one okay, and number the, three now. What's number one and number three? You have it in front of you? I do not. Okay. Right, I know, and that was an original draft. Go ahead and read A. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I got it on my computer. Here, 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 Steve. I got it. Here we oh. go. Number A, that we appreciate and commend the work of the remote task force in addressing the issue of remote hearings. That's number A. So you want to go forward with number A, correct? Yeah, I'll go forward. And, and, and how about number, what, what you have is number three. <laughs> that the Office of Court Administration compile and maintain a website requiring as few clicks as possible, uh, listing the remote login credentials of all Texas court, as well as any rules particular to that court. Okay, so his, the resolution that you're, you're making the motion on is that the resolution read as follows, that we appreciate and commend the work of the remote task force in addressing the issue of remote hearings. Subpart three, which I guess will now be either B or two, that the Office of Court Administration compile and maintain a website requiring as few clicks in quotations as possible, listing the remote login credentials of all Texas courts, as well as any rules particular to that court. Hearing that, do I have a second? Point of order, can we bifurcate that and have two different votes? Sure. I think one of them will go by sure. real fast. That's fine. Number one. Do I have a second on? I second number one. All right. Any discussion on number one? All those in favor of the resolution that says that we appreciate, pardon me. Is, is Mr. Fisher asking to pat somebody on the back with this resolution? Yes, I am. And, and, and we spent like an hour and 10 minutes right at the start patting people on the back. And this person is unrecognized yeah, talking and she's hey, doing hey, so much hey, work. I need, you to, I need you to talk into the mic, sir. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, this is my turn to pat somebody on, my back, okay. on the back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Any other discussion on resolution A? The motion would read that be it resolved by the State Bar Board of Directors that we appreciate and commend the work of the remote task force in addressing the issue of remote hearings. Stop. All those in favor of passing that as a resolution, please respond by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Resolution passes. Resolution two. No, the, I'm, I'm not ready for that. I'm, I, I, Dave Sergi wanted to make an amendment and do that. Okay. The second resolution that's been bifurcated. Okay. That the Office of Court Administration compile and maintain a website requiring as few clicks as possible, listing the remote login credentials of all Texas courts as well as any rules particular to that court. Do I have a second? second. David Sergi seconds. Any discussion? Director Crane. And Santos, would you come up here, please? Santos. Would you come up here, please? Go ahead, Dr. Crane. Dr. Crane. I, I may be missing something, but why are we getting into the business of Office of Court Administration? We've already heard today that David Slayton is, um, I'm not sure, but he's a valued member of our profession and administration of justice, and he's now not here or moving on to other opportunities. This isn't our business unless we've gone through a more formal process. I think Justice Lehrman would appreciate us staying out of their business unless we've done something more formal together. All right, thank you, Director Crane. Director uh, Dawson. Yeah, I don't think we have the authority to tell the Office of Court Administration how they conduct their business. So I think we, th this is a bad idea for a number of reasons, but I don't think we have the authority to proceed with this resolution. I'm gonna see the chair for a moment to uh, Director Dawson, not our Director, Director Santos Vargas, our incoming chair. Thank you, Director Ginn. I've got a comment. Will you recognize me? I will recognize you. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do this. I think that we shouldn't be telling the OCA to, uh, to do this. I think it's a mistake, and I join in with uh, Rob and Alistair. Can I have the thank, chair back? Thank you, Director Thank, thank you chair. very much. Go ahead, Director Fisher. <laughs> um, you know what? That, that's really fine with me. I just wanted, a, I wanted us to have a discussion. I don't believe personally that we're telling them what to do. Um, I think we're... we're I mean, we, we represent lawyers, 
And I think all we're really saying is that as lawyers, and especially people who do cases in more than one county um, or, or practice around the state, that this is something we'd like. But I, I certainly see the other point, and if that, that's the, if you feel like we're telling people what to do, well, there's, I'm there's, good. There's a vote. I mean, you've got a motion and a second. Do you want to call oh. for a vote? Um, do you want to retract okay. your motion, or do you want to call for a vote? Does anybody else want to discuss this? No? Okay. Uh, uh, hold on. Hold on. Honestly, I don't know what it means, what you're asking them to do. And I don't, since I don't understand it, I don't know that we should vote on something that, unless everybody else understands it, and I'm just in the dark. So are you making a motion to the table? Okay, motion to the table. Right, yeah, I'll, I'll actually second that. Got a second. Okay. All those in favor of tabling the motion? <laughs> Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And then the last thing would be if David Sergi has finished and has something on B. He does not. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Director Fisher. All right, let's go to the next one. Director Justice, excuse me, Justice Deborah Learman, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, um, let me just say that we have uh, two huge losses on the court, and that is one uh, with the resignation of uh, the magnificent uh, Supreme Court Justice Eva Guzman, uh, who stepped down last week. Uh, she will be hugely missed. She's certainly a force of nature. And as we've been discussing, yes, David Slayton from OCA has uh, stepped down. He will be going with the National Center for State Courts, uh, and that is a, indeed a huge loss for us. And uh, we hope that we will be able to replace him uh, we will replace him, but but he will be a very there will be very very large shoes to fill. Um, we are continuing to do our work remotely. Uh, we held our first in-person conference two weeks ago on June 8th. It was wonderful, just like this is. Uh, we are trying to get back to normal as much as possible. Uh, as has been said today, we have issued 38 emergency orders. Uh, in uh, uh, the general order that we just issued, uh, we renew, re, uh, which gives courts the authority to modify deadlines and procedures and to continue remote proceedings will continue until August 1st. Uh, with regard to jury trials, our emergency order continues to allow for virtual jury trials. We've now had about 60 and more scheduled in the next few months. From March of 2020 until March of 2021, there were 239 jury trials. We typically have 186 jury trials every week. So you can imagine what kind of backlog we have. We are giving very, very, very serious uh, consideration of this, uh, which can be what can become a terrible, terrible problem. We've asked the legislature for funding for vir for visiting judges to help work through this huge backlog, uh, and the legislature has appro appropriated uh, one million dollars for this. Um, OCA is working with the governor's office to secure federal funding to fill the remaining uh, request of roughly five million. Uh, we, the, it's of course in the criminal courts where the, ba uh, the backlog is so bad, but it also is starting to affect civil courts. So we're, 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 we're going to have to get visiting judges to come in to help us with that. Uh, we have remained a leader with regard to remote proceedings. Uh, since March 24th of 2020, there have been over 1.5 million remote proceedings with more than 4.8 million participate, participants. Um, as Steve just alluded to, the Supreme Court appointed a remote proceeding task force, which is chaired by Chief Justice Tracy Christopher out of Houston and vice chaired by Judge Emily Miskell. Uh, they have really done a superb job of going through all of our Texas statutes and, ad and identifying what helps and what impedes remote proceedings. 
we anticipate that in the months ahead, we'll come up with a more comprehensive procedural framework for remote proceedings, uh, and we're going to take a hard look at both the efficiencies and the difficulties and try to preserve what we've learned over this past uh, really, really difficult 15 months. Um, in response to the February winter storms, the court issued an emergency order permitting out-of-state lawyers to practice temporarily in Texas if they are providing pro bono services to those affected by the storms. Um, I, I, I know we all want to go to dinner and, and to drink, but so I'll try to hurry here. Uh, <laughs> <Second>. <laughs> um, uh, as you all know, uh, we have approved the disciplinary rules, uh, the changes that were uh, uh, were overwhelmingly approved uh, by the lawyers of the state of Texas, and those will now take effect on July 1st. Um, you know what they are, so I'm not going to go over those right now. Um, there's, a, uh, there's more, but we got to go drink. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Learman, uh, very much for a lot of reasons. Judge David Morales, hard act to follow, Judge. So on behalf of the federal judiciary in Texas, I have no report. <laughs> <laughs> judge Les Hatch. Nothing like being upstaged by a federal judge. Um, since we sent David Slayton to Austin from Lubbock, uh, we'll try to identify his successor, so I'll get right on that. And uh, I do want to recognize, oh, I want to say that we apparently survived the legislative session relatively unscathed as a judiciary so far, but the year's not over. And lastly, I want to recognize my successor, Judge Elizabeth Earl, Travis County. She will be your liaison member next year. I've enjoyed my year. It's been very interesting watching y'all operate this year. I have no idea. Uh, going on 12 years as a judge, I think I've gotten a little too removed from the life as a lawyer, but y'all drug me back into it, and I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. To all of our judicial liaisons, thank you so much for taking the time and for being here. We appreciate it, and it's so fun for us to get to know you outside of the courtrooms, and y'all have been so gracious with your time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fisher, Ross, do you have any report? Never heard you give one. Uh, Director Sir John Sermon? <laughs> no, I don't think so either. All right, we have to go into executive session, so listen, if you are, it is now 6.33. PM and the State Bar Board of Directors will now recess the open meeting and reconvene in closed session pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.074 for the purpose of discussing the evaluation of the General Counsel and the evaluation duties and compensation of the Executive Director and the Texas Government Code Section 551.071 for the purpose of consulting with legal counsel including all pending or any contemplated litigation including regarding McDonald v. Sorrells in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, Rosalinda Solis versus Inner End of Sky in the District Court of Harris County, and Law HQ v. Willing in the Western District of Texas, and Texas Government Code Section 551.074 to deliberate regarding personnel matters. With the exception of board liaisons and section representatives, all other individuals, including incoming directors, non-essential staff, and other guests needs to excuse themselves from the closed session. Please don't leave, though, new directors. You're coming back right after, and then we will finish up. So don't leave the room. I, I mean, leave the room, but don't leave the, the hallway. Sorry. That was very clear. That was very clear instructions.
be good to go back on. All right, it is now uh, 6.45 p.m. The open session of the Board of Directors meeting will now reconvene. During the closed session, only matters relating to pending or contemplated litigation, consultation with legal counsel, personnel matters, and the evaluation of the general counsel and the evaluation duties and compensation of the executive director were discussed. I need to cede the uh, chair to Santos, please, to make a motion. Thank you, Director Ritt. Again, do you have uh, a motion? Yes. <laughs> what, what is your motion, Director? <laughs> My motion <Ginn>? is, <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Evaluation Subcommittee, I move approval of the recommendation for Executive Director Trey Atfill to receive a 4% one-time lump sum merit payment for the fiscal year 2020 to 2021 and a 6% merit increase for the fiscal year 21-2022, effective June 1st, 2021. It doesn't require it because it's a committee. Thank you, Director Ritt. So, <laughs> e oh e yeah, sorry. sorry. Echoing Director Ginn, uh, <laughs> coming from a committee, the motion doesn't require a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? The motion carries. Thanks. Thank you, Director Ginn. I Thanks. see the chair. Thank you. He's going to be great. He's a natural. He's going to be so good. Um, all right, so with that, um, before we adjourn, I'm going to ask Alistair to come up, lead us in our State Bar mission statement that we're going to say together, not online. Um, so Alistair, if you'd come up and lead us, and then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Um, while he's walking up here, um, you're going to use that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alistair. So let's all do this together. The mission of the State Bar of Texas is to support the administration of the legal system assure all citizens equal access to justice, foster high standards of ethical conduct for lawyers, enable its members to better serve their clients and the public, educate the public about the rule of law, and promote diversity in the administration of justice and the practice of law. Can I have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Director Naylor, can I get a second? <laughs> Director Sergi. All right, we're done. God bless you all, but don't leave. <laughs>